The doctor coldly inquires about the patient's well-being. Daesun gave an equally brief answer about the pain in his legs, the character's melancholy thoughts on everyday life. Daesun looks at the doctor with an emotionless gaze. The boy sits brokenly, accepting the nurse's slightly mocking offer. He continued the tale of his dark past. The nurse's hand gripped the wheelchair handle starting the movement. The people sitting in the hospital lobby gave Daesun sympathetic looks. The nurse continued to roll the wheelchair, while the protagonist sat motionless, dimming his gaze. His gaze seemed lifeless and empty, as if he had lost any hope. All he could do was sit still and stare at his hardened legs. The guy was fiddling with his smartphone after leaving the supermarket. He had a bag full of groceries hanging on his arm, while he himself was engrossed in his gadget. Daesun caught the bright light, directing a questioning look at him. A bright light distracted the guy from his smartphone, quickly approaching him. With a bang, a bag of groceries flew into the air. The nurse helps the patient move to the bed. There was an IV with a bag of glucose obviously hooked up to the patient. He looked at his hand in which were three different pills. Daesun squeezed the medicine with anger, holding the glass in his hand. The guy sank his gaze coolly into the screen of his smartphone. The screen showed his favorite manga, celebrating the completion of whose 50th chapter he had received a free 50th chapter. The boy looked over the list of chapters, eager to get to reading, for it was his only pleasure. In the story, a powerful elder, being the main character, destroyed the world, creating a new one. It is said that everyone has lost their memory. The woman standing on the edge of the cliff spread her hands to cast a devastating spell. That was the end of Daesun's favorite manga. His hand trembled holding the smartphone, seeing the end with thanks. The guy's tears of grief went out, realizing that this was the end of his favorite story. Once again, he faded his gaze, having lost his last ray of joy in the melancholy of everyday life. Daesun lay in his hospital bed, deciding to end his day on a sad note. An information panel appeared in front of the guy's eyes, causing him to gasp in surprise. The boy sat up sharply in the bed in surprise. The first thing that appeared before his eyes were feet and an unfamiliar interior. Daesun sat on a bed in a medieval-style room. Before his eyes was a very aesthetically pleasing interior. An excited sweat broke over the boy from the strangeness of the situation. He leaned over, looking into the vessel of water. In it, Daesun saw a very familiar reflection, but not his own. The boy was shocked at the reflection of his face he saw. What pleased the guy more was being able to move his legs. The first thing he did was squat down. Daesun saw an information window that said he was now connected by life to Mord Vernar's body, which he was now. The guy got a little nervous when he heard that. The information panel highlighted that he had entered the world of his favorite manga and became Mord Vernar's. He was slightly relieved that he was getting to live the story. The information panel reminds the protagonist that he will die if his character dies, in the Java. After what he saw, he became more alarmed at the possible death in his new form. Still, he stood on the floor barefoot. He stood stone-faced analyzing the situation. Daesun was glad to be able to walk again, and clearly had no desire to go back to his old life. The dashboard notified you that the character's data had been uploaded. All of Mord's thoughts and memories flew into his head at lightning speed, causing a slight migraine. The memoir shows how lonely Mord was and how he trained his body. He felt someone's anger in his head, which caused Daesun to be afraid. A memory of a seated, lonely boy with a slumped gaze is visible. The bloody hand of the now adult Mord can be seen, marking his end. Mord Vernars was a powerful and strong mage warrior with a muscular body, being the son of an Archduke. The story goes that such a powerful man was the illegitimate son of Archduke Verners. Mord was so powerful and skilled a warrior that he could fight any hero on equal footing. It is described that he was struck down during a ritual to control the soul of the hero and his companions. The information panel offers Daeshun a wish in return for preventing the destruction of the world. This suggestion interested the lad, and he contemplated his desire. He wondered if his wish would be granted. As Daesun suggests, the ending is implied by the end of the last chapter of the manga. He stared at his hand, wondering if it was worth burdening himself with a mission to save the world to prevent the main character from destroying it. He thought back to his real life, reasoning or it wasn't a dream. Daesun continued his reasoning by weighing the pros and cons, but he could no longer live his old life with limitations. The lad was not left to reason, for he did not care for God's antics. He clenched his will into a fist, wanting to achieve a return to that life before the accident. Daesun knew everything about this world and was going to use that knowledge. He knew of Mord's abilities and talents from his cognizance. He was going to prevent with Mord's skills the destruction of the world. The guy grinned and clenched his fists. He was sure he would do it. The strong warrior was part of the Vernars family. Mord was the illegitimate son of an archduke, therefore lived a hard life without knowing his mother. 
The boy's mother died in childbirth, and he was nicknamed Bastard Mother Killer. There was no one around to protect the lonely boy. He was broken listening to constant insults against him, resigned to his fate because he simply did not know how to get angry. At the fulfillment of 15 years, a power awakened in him, as it does in every family of Werners. The awakening that he had to go through and was accompanied by unbearable pain, comparable to being folded alive. At the end of the process, the awakened one gained powerful strength. Only, if the awakened person is not a member of the Vernars family, their chances of surviving the new blood awakening are less. About one in five, but Mord could do it. Mord handled the awakening process and gained strength. On the table was a letter stating that upon awakening, Mord must come for initiation to Archduke Vernars at his castle. He needed to arrive at his father's castle and be recognized by a man he had never seen before. Mord was fixing his hair after arriving in the Archduke's domain. Dason knew that Mord was a minor character in the narrative, unlike Archduke Werners. He literally knew everything about their family. Mord's father had quite a few heirs, and so there was virtually no chance of him being welcomed into the family. Only in history did Mord strive to gain his father's recognition, subsequently becoming a tame hound in his father's hands. With the awakening of the blood, Mord had a powerful force that could surpass any of the main characters in the manga. But Dyson wasn't sure how strong he was. Dae-sun was eager to test the power of his new look and was very enthusiastic about it. The boy was torn from his thoughts by someone's voice, to which he turned around slightly. The instructor turned to Mord, asking if he remembered what today's plans were. But Mord was preoccupied with thoughts of the character standing before him. He remembered it was Todd's instructor, but Todd resented his observation to which followed a sharp question. Mord approached Todd asking about the purpose of coming to his room, but noticing the higher up for a guest. Todd noticed the change in the guy's manner of speech, which generated more questions in his mind. He even noticed a difference in Mord's demeanor and look, as if he was more confident. Todd reminds Mord of today's scheduled inspection, but Mord only questions the nature of the inspection. The instructor talks about testing Mord's abilities and remarks that his physique is fairly well equipped for a mere civilian. Mord smiled slightly nervously, assuming he would have to fight. Mord smiled slightly nervously, assuming he would have to fight. He clenched his hand into a fist, encouraging the thought that this would be a simple practice spar. The guy finds a benefit to his situation, as it was a good chance to find out his current limit. Mord follows the instructor along the forest trail. As they traveled, Todd asked Mord if he remembered the conversation from yesterday. The boy decided to clarify what exactly the instructor wanted to ask, to which he heard only another remark about his inattention. Todd reminds him that Mord must not reveal the secret of his lineage, to which he agrees. Mord wasn't worried, for he knew that rumors had long since spread around and all would be known when the lad became a knight. A group of students were waiting for instructor Todd to arrive, to which he remarked on the presence of all the students, Mord intently observing and analyzing the situation. He noticed that the group of people were clearly older for training, assuming something were warriors. The instructor reminds Mordu that his father will be ruthless in battle. Mord reminds us that Vernus warriors only use weapons early in their training. Once trained, they stop relying on guns. He finishes his explanation by pointing out that everyone in the Vernus family relies only on their abilities. Todd agrees with Mord's judgment, but notes that guns are used by those outside the Archduke's family. Mord confirmed the instructor's words. He knew that the Verners family was the best place to train fighters on the entire continent, and it was only through hand-to-hand -hand combat that they had reached such heights. It didn't seem possible, but Mord reasoned that there was nothing capable of countering the power of the Verners clan. Todd continues his dialogue with Mord, explaining the importance of this challenge to further channel the guy's strength. He called out Vins as Mord's sparring partner. Vins came out to fight Mord with a smug grin, agreeing with the instructor. This fight predetermined Mord's future. Therefore, he looked with determination at his smug opponent. Vins stood relaxed with his hand on his belt, believing in his win-win. Vins tries to bitch at Mord by talking about his young looks and specifying his age. The warrior playfully asked the crowd whose son Mord was. He exhaled knowing that he was not the only bastard in this place for many nobles had a mania for mistresses. Mord knew that only strength would give him freedom, but he still caught himself thinking that it would be nice to get to a quiet place without worries. Mord took a fighting stance preparing to show what he was capable of. Literally in an instant he was in front of his opponent's nose swinging his arm. Vins ducked backwards slightly from Mord's surprise punch. The warrior realized that his opponent could be dangerous and became more focused on the battle. Mord was more flexible than Day Sun expected. This allowed him to realize his boxing skills from his childhood in his past life. He delivered a powerful leg kick to his opponent's block, knowing he had put his hobby to good use. 
From a similar impact, Vins rolled backward, leaving behind his footprints in the soil. He took a knee to the side of the body while praising Mord for a good punch. Wing straightened up with trembling hands, picking up on the lie in Mord's words about his lack of combat skills. Mord stands in a boxer's stance to justify that he's not lying, which caused a wave of indignation from Vins, and he swept the stance of a professional fighter. Mord continued to move from side to side, calling himself a wannabe, but Vins only deepened his suspicions by standing silently. The warrior went on the offensive using mana. One of the warriors resented such unsportsmanlike behavior, but the instructor only told him not to interfere. The warrior tried to object to Todd, but he only ordered him not to interfere while watching the fight. Mord notices that his opponent is using mana while standing in a fighting stance. Vins angrily accuses Mord of trying to insult him. Insulting Mord with a bastardization, he hypocritically delivers a loaded mana punch. Vins's punch misses as Mord ducked making a dash in his direction. Vins was surprised at Mord's agility. While the lad himself was already behind the warrior's back, Mord replied coldly to Vins's earlier statement, about to do something comparable. Vins turns around in shock, staring at his opponent, surprised at how easily he can resist mana techniques. Mord charged his fist with mana preparing for his turn to strike, alerting his opponent. His movements were very fast. Vins couldn't believe it was possible. Vins had spent years honing his techniques and wasn't willing to lose like that to a mere teenager put in a defensive stance. The blow pierced through the warrior's defenses and struck the press with incredible force. From the impact, Vins lost consciousness, letting out a wheezing sound. Mord sent his opponent flying into the ground straight towards goal. Everyone was surprised by such a picture, including Instructor Todd. The instructor thought this sparring would be Mord's first. But the way he handled the rank-and-file warrior put everything in doubt. Mord only stoically stood with his back to the men watching him, looking in the direction of his flying opponent. Mord approached the downed opponent. The warrior sat on the ground clenching his fists, having been struck down. The guy stood in front of his opponent, observing the demeanor of the downed man. Mord mused about how it was good that he had been able to dodge Vins, for now he understood how to control his powers. The warrior's hand shook, signaling that he was coming to his senses. Vins rose to which Mord responded with surprise and got into a fighting stance. Finally, Mord realized that the warrior had reflexively risen to his feet still unconscious. Vins, on the other hand, stood without the slightest movement while saliva dripped from his mouth. The warriors watching along with Instructor Todd wondered how Mord managed to slay his opponent in one fell swoop. The guy turned to the Instructor Todd, suggesting to end the sparring, as he is afraid to kill his opponent without containing the power of the blow. Todd reasoned, watching Mord, that the Instructor's goal was to push the subject to the limit, and it couldn't be that the instructor himself had reached the limit without unlocking the student's full potential. The instructor stopped the battle noting that that was enough, while Vins is led out under the arm by another warrior. Todd accused Mord of lying, but the guy stayed true to his word. The instructor reminded Mord of his words as if the guy had never fought before. He only nervously replied to instructor Todd that it was true, and he hadn't done it professionally before, but the instructor wasn't going to let up and began to point out the facts saying that it was necessary to have a technique to control mana, and without battles, it couldn't be perfected. Mord decided to play dumb, and informed Todd that he was able to use mana after a severe illness. But the instructor was still skeptical of his words, Mord in turn telling all about the awakening of the new blood, and how he gained this power at a young age. But the guy withheld the fact that he was able to use mana earlier. That much he was talented. Vernars was comparable to the god of battles in this world. Arita was the goddess of heaven and mana. Mord could be the possessor of the blood of both gods, from which his power could be immeasurable. He went on to reason that Mord, not trained properly until he was 15 years old, could gain godlike power after seven years, which would end up being stronger for Archduke Vernars, who was a direct descendant of a god. Todd listened to the guy's story, trying to digest everything. The instructor asked Morda if he knew about his opponent's history, to which he replied in the negative. According to the instructor's story, Vince was a talented Vernars warrior that he had trained since his youth, and honed his skills. Todd also remarked that the inexperienced Mord had overpowered him, to which the guy was sympathetic. The instructor sighed, and informed the boy of his progress on the test, and that he had passed it perfectly. Mord didn't quite understand the purpose of the test, to which Todd chimed in on the significance of this test in determining a guy's level. The instructor also pointed out that there are three levels of warrior training in total. He explained to Mord that each level was important, and the transition was only made after successfully mastering the past. Todd pointed out that only by passing the final test can a warrior be professional and qualified. The instructor also added that passing the last check is very difficult, and few people succeed. 
Mord pondered taking in all the information. He understood the workings of this training system. Mord told Todd he was going to start with the first stage to which the instructor reacted with surprise. The guy continued his reasoning, pointing out that it is better to start from the base and also clarified, or will be at further stages to teach the basics. Mord had also mentioned that he would not be promoted after passing all the conditions. But Todd tried to argue that it would be unreasonable to have someone who could pass all the tests at once. The guy made a good point about the best way to start at the beginning. Todd agreed, but he also mentioned that he wouldn't get special treatment. The instructor announced the end of the inspection, and that tomorrow, he would find an instructor teaching the first stage. Mord leaned back on the bed thinking how easily the ordeal had gone. The guy reasoned or went through this way in the manga Mord, and noticed that no information was revealed about how the warrior became the puppet of the Archduke. While thinking about it, the guy sat down, talking about logic. Because after all, Mord was a minor character in the manga. Still, it was interesting to the lad how Mord handled the inspection and only mentioned the Archduke's rigorous training to mold the lad into a powerful weapon for his plans. He also suggested that the manga character could have just been beaten up and sent to training, the logic of which he agreed with. Now Daesun realized why exactly Mord had become his character in this world. He swept up that he had a tremendous sense of justice in his past life. Daesun realized that Mord was his opposite. He was going to stop the world from being destroyed, and the only way to do that was to stop the hero Aiden. The guy knew that to get power, you need to collect fragments of the world, because the one who collects them all and will be equal to the god. Daishun also reflected on the sacrifices Aiden had made, and that the confrontation in the manga was for the opportunity to destroy the world. The sun was already beginning to set, hiding behind the horizon of branches. The boy clenched his hand tightly with a confident look. He was determined to stop Aiden at any cost. From that moment on, Daishun decided to be moored and live his life. The Archduke Werner's family rules the Principality under this banner. The castle of the Werner's family was as grand as the castles of the rulers of other nations. On the outskirts of the castle are the family's training facilities. The carriage heads towards the castle. From this day forward Mord will be required to reside in the first level dormitory, near the training complex. Thoughts of the training facility overwhelmed Mord, for it was much larger than other training facilities, which he had quite expected. Mord asked where the strange sound was coming from to which his traveling companion suggested the possibility of the sounds coming from the third level training area. Mord relaxed again, thinking that if it was a level 2 apprentice, it wouldn't be difficult for him to ascend. Especially when the Vernars family makes their soldiers strong enough to be worth a dozen warriors from other countries. Mord is already anticipating his imminent arrival in the third region when the carriage approaches the gate. He thanked his traveling companion for giving him a ride, thinking about how big a figure was waiting for him. Mord was approached by Instructor Hayes to make introductions. The instructor picks up on the fact that if Mord got to him, it means he did poorly on the test despite his stature. But the guy refuted Hayes's hypothesis, saying that he had defeated Vins and had impressed the instructor with it. The instructor wondered why the guy was at level 1 with such success. Mord revealed his cards and explained to the instructor that he had come to train from scratch. Hayes was a bit taken aback by the news of Mord defeating a warrior without any training, but decided to see the guy off. He informed the kid that there was already a practice going on, and it was not a good idea to distract the students. Mord smiled, knowing that even at the first level of training there must be many strong individuals if they wanted to become warriors of the Vernars family. The group of teenagers were surprised by the addition, especially in the form of a big fighter like Mord. Hayes warned the students that it was the rookie's first day, so they wouldn't push him too hard and to keep practicing. Mord was nervous to see such young students and wondered if he should go straight to the third level. The instructor clarified if he really hadn't been trained to use mana before, to which the guy answered in the negative, noting that he had. Hayes only emphasized that it was self-inflicted because he had undergone a new blood awakening. The instructor explained step by step how to master mana using a three basic point plan of find, create, release. Mord asked or whether he needed to learn combat skills. Hayes replied that if he wanted to stay here longer, he could arrange it. Mord became nervous at this prospect and explained that he had not thought of such a thing to which the instructor replied that he understood his wishes. Hayes exhaled and decided to teach Mord a few things. Mord only thanked his instructor. The guy demonstrates his mana to the instructor and the group. Mord radiated mana, asking or enough of it for a demonstration. The instructor congratulated Mord on completing the first level of training. There were a total of two types of physical enhancement. The first involved body control, which helps reduce damage. The second type of reinforcement focuses on increasing physical ability. This strengthening is necessary to push the physical limits of the body and strengthen the muscles. The second type of reinforcement 
Mord learned in less than half an hour. The guy said a little nervously to the instructor that there seemed to be only one training session left, and the instructor himself was shocked at Mord's strength. Hayes has tweaked that there is no need, and he can start the next level of training starting tomorrow. He also reminded that up to the third level everything will be simple. But already on the third level, the same members of the Werner's family are waiting for him. Just because of that alone, finishing third will be the hardest thing for Mord to do. The instructor also pointed out that Mord has no combat skills, making it difficult to pass the third stage. Mord reflected that he had no previous training in any fighting styles and had been sent to the second level of training only because of his latent potential. The instructor also explained that it was possible to reach the second level by brute force, while the third level required a lot of effort. Mord was looking forward to fighting people who had undergone a new blood awakening like himself the next day within the walls of the school. Rumors were spreading around the walls of the establishment that someone had passed two stages in two days and had the same bloodline as Fian Vernars. Fian was in a discussion with his comrade speculating on the thoughts of a talented warrior. Fian was about to give Mord a lesson in the hierarchy in the Vernars family. Mord just walked down the hallway sighing, thinking about the time wasted. Fian walked up to Mord, making introductions to him. Fian introduced himself to Mord, identifying himself as Captain Second Class and his name. Fian said he was also a member of Werner's Ka and Mord, to which Mord replied that he might be moving to the next level in the near future. Mord's reply angered Fan, and he was furious at such belittling. Mord only needed his neck and replied that he wouldn't have come here at all if this training was nothing. Mord remarked that he wasn't in a good mood and shouldn't have gotten so hot, to which Fian replied with a smirk that Mord could handle anything. Mord only coldly replied that he wasn't the least bit afraid of the sight of his ability, and thus belittling Fain even more. Fion's pupils reddened with anger and a nervous smile hinted that the answer didn't satisfy him one bit. Fain was in a blind rage gnashing his teeth, saying he was going to kill Mord. The other students cast sympathetic glances at the newcomer, knowing that no one from the course could stop him. Fain, on the other hand, wasn't going to hold back just because of the bloodline. Fion's hand reached sharply toward Mord's head, trying to grab it. An explosion sounded in the square, a column of dust rising into the air. One of the students sympathized with Mord's bad luck, for he had fallen under the hot hand of Fian, the strongest in the course. The apprentice was hoping that Mord would at least survive Fian's attack when he saw two silhouettes among the smoke, one of which was downed. All the students were amazed at what they saw. Mord looked down at his opponent wanting to see his full potential, clearly slightly disappointed. The guy took a blow to Fan's ego, calling him a mere poser. Fan rose slightly wobbly, not about to accept defeat. Mord in turn called his opponent a weakling with contempt. He had hurt his opponent's feelings, and he was furious and rushed into battle. The first blow missed as Mord dodged the lunge. He recoiled, obviously preparing for a leg kick. Mord lifted his leg from the turn, reinforcing the mana strike. A powerful blow to the back followed, sending Fan screaming to the ground. The impact was so strong that it raised a veil of dirt and dust. Mord was slightly annoyed with his opponent. In the guy's opinion, Fane proved to be too weak an opponent despite his third year of training. He was puzzled by his strength. He drew analogies with Mord from the manga and came to the conclusion that nowadays the guy was weaker for the character. Fane's comrade was worried for his friend's well-being, but he was too stunned after the powerful blow. Fane tried to pretend to the last that he hadn't lost, despite the other warrior's help. Mord reminded his opponent that he'd been out for a while, hinting that this wasn't a good idea. But no arguments were convincing to Fine, and he only excused himself with anger. Mord in turn merely caught his opponent at his words, shaming him for his inattention. Fain was shaking with anger and he resented Mord's words. He clearly didn't want Mord, commenting on his remarks again emitting mana. Everyone around began to swarm seeing that Fine had awakened his power for this fight. Some ran after the instructor. Fellow students advised Mord to flee, but he wasn't going to, wanting to see his opponent summon the power of new blood, except that due to the lack of control, Fane's power was more akin to simple warrior mana. The instructor arrived at the noise to see what was going on. A student informed Instructor Dazzly of the conflict of interest between Fian and the newcomer. The apprentice offered to separate them, but Dazzly wished to watch them fight. Instructor Dazzly pondered how great an opportunity it was to see the full potential of Fine. That used to be comparable in strength to a mere warrior. Likewise, the instructor thought that the death of one of Werner's descendants wouldn't cause much of a fuss, putting a cross on Morda. Fayan unleashed a powerful force emitting sparks all around, preparing to kill the offender. Mord was a little surprised that Fayan had the same technique as him, despite his opponent's low intelligence. Fayan jumped, preparing a powerful attack, using his hands as a vessel for a receptacle of magic to inflict as much damage as possible with the technique. 
Mord sprang into motion seeing the blow coming. The body impulse technique almost caught the guy, forming a funnel from the impact. The damage was comparable to a mortar hit, releasing an inertia of destructive power. Mord realized that hitting him was obviously not going to be pleasant, and he should be more careful. Fayan rushed towards Mord without giving his opponent a chance to escape. Fayan's fist sparked with overflowing power, clearly betting on killing power. Only one right hook was enough to dispel such a powerful blow and stun Fane. The guy's nose was bleeding. You could see on his face how nervous he was from the unexpected blow. Mord has successfully deflected punches from his opponent to cause him some confusion. The idea worked, and he struck again at Fane's jaw again, disorienting him. Gawkers watching the battle assumed that their fight was on equal footing without the slightest hit. Only the instructor's keen eye could see that one punch had hit the target accurately. Fayan's momentum began to wane. His breathing hitched and he was clearly nervous. Mord decided to be more serious and roared for the next attack. The blow struck Fane's abs with killing force, lifting the poor man's body off the ground. Fayan was on his knee, trying to get up, but Mord continued to pound his opponent's ego, fighting with restraint as if he were a child. Fayan, however, continued to snap back, knowing that one more strike would be the final blow. He continued to bully Mord by threatening him, which the guy clearly didn't like. Mord smirked irritably, promising Fane that he wouldn't duck, but he himself would become undeterred. Fayan smirked, seeing that Mord had fallen for his insults. He rushed, charging his fist with momentum, preparing for a mighty blow. Mord stood looking down at his enemy from above, seeing Fan's fist coming towards him. A violent explosion with momentum dispersed in the battle zone. Mord clutched Fan's arm, holding back his strongest blow, hinting that skills wouldn't help against an opponent much stronger. A pulse of blue was gathering in Mord's fist, he swept it up. It was a good lesson. Fan, on the other hand, looked at Mord's momentum with fear, finally realizing its power. The blow struck Fayan's torso again, but this time with much more power and force. The impact of the powerful force formed a huge explosion, kicking up a club of dirt 20 meters above the ground. Fayan was pressed into the tower wall, trembling and pulling his arm impulsively. He bowed his head, having lost consciousness completely after the battle. Instructor Dazzly was shocked at what he saw, for Fawn had been struck down by the Descendant without the use of force. The instructor realized that the potential of the others was not comparable to the power of the direct descendants of Vernars. Mord was clearly not satisfied with the fight, and suggested that the others try their luck in combat. Dazzly only turned around as he left for the castle, ordering Fane to be taken to the infirmary. The instructor was scheming, knowing he could play on Mord's status as a bastard. He planned to make the guy his puppet. Mord was put on probation for four days after his battle with Fayan, as his opponent was still comatose in the infirmary. Studying the theory in the book, that one seemed pretty straightforward to Mord. Also, Mord would have no trouble passing a written test, as he had finished his master's degree in his previous life. He got bored sitting in the dormitory and decided to go practice his mana-based combat techniques. Instructor Todd turned to Mord, informing him that there would be no quiet life with him around, and that the Archduke wanted to see him. Mord was interested in the reason for his summons, but the instructor kept the secret of wanting to guide the lad to his father. Todd only implied that it would be good if Mord kept the bounds of decorum during the meeting. The boy knew that the Archduke was not a particular fan of high etiquette, even in the manga. But he agreed. The instructor was discussing Mord's fame, and it was hard for him to imagine how fast the guy went through the first two stages. Todd picked up on Mord's intellectual qualities and assumed others felt the same way. The instructor asked if the student intended to get his father's attention. Mord modestly replied that for him to get attention, it would be enough for him to finish his studies well. Todd agreed with the guy, but decided to mention that yesterday's battle with Fine hadn't gone unnoticed by the Archduke, and it had clearly piqued the old man's interest. Mord began to stare out the window, saying that defeating one of Vernar's descendants was enough to get attention. The instructor reported that the mighty descendants' wounds were serious, so it impressed the Archduke. Nevertheless, they were already approaching Father Mord's training ground. When Todd and Mord went inside the fortification, they came across an entertaining picture. The boy watched the crowd fight, and a single gray-haired warrior standing in the Force Dome. It was clearly Archduke Werner's with a powerful aura that elevated him above the rest. The crowd rushed at the Archduke, reinforcing their attacks with mana. All five fighters simultaneously struck at the warrior's defenses. The attack was so strong that it made a crack in the old man's defenses and he ordered a retreat. A scarlet sphere of powerful energy began to form in the Archduke's hand. It grew to a large size, creating an energy area around itself. This skill absorbed all the damage on the dome and began to release into a powerful attack. A scarlet beam of power shot out from his hand, unleashing the full force and power of the damage he had received earlier. The power of the attack was so enormous at such a large radius of impact 
The shot was followed by an explosion of the wall, demonstrating the strength of the Archduke's ability. Mord could only assume that the boy's father had only been trained in this ability of reflection. The Archduke was not particularly satisfied with the effectiveness of this ability, but still surprised the audience with the power at such an early level of learning the skill. The Archduke turned his attention to the guests engaged in dialogue. Both knelt before him, saluting the old man. The Archduke told them to rise, as he did not wish such formalities. The old man tried to scare Mord by looming over him, talking about the kid's fame in college. He grabbed Mord's chin with his big hand and asked who his mother was, to which Mord mentioned Reyna's name. The Archduke remarked that Mord resembled his mother more than him, then asked if the young man had undergone an awakening. He could hear the one resisting the impulse with physical strength and wished he could test Mord's limits. The Archduke called out to Kesser, and the blonde man instantly answered his call. The old man wished to see a fight between a teenager and an experienced warrior, which made Kesser clarify the order. The Archduke called the muzzle his son and reminded him that he was new here, so he shouldn't overdo it. Mord noticed that this warrior was strong enough to train with the Archduke while Kesser calls him to the battleground. He also offered Mord his choice of any weapon, but Mord declined, pushing back at the lack of need. Mord took a stand explaining to Kesser that he was not proficient with weapons, so he would be much more effective with his fists. The warrior smirked looking at his opponent. The fight started with Kesser trotting in, while Mord took a defensive stance. The boy dodged the warrior's blow by ducking down. Mord noticed that Kesser was quite fast. At the same time the warrior praised the kid for the way he dodged without using mana. A series of punches began to rain down on Mord from different directions, trying to pierce a gap in his defense. Mord has spotted the difference between his opponent and other opponents by surviving a leg kick. Kesser, on the other hand, was impressed with Mord's attitude and decided not to hold back. Mord noticed that his opponent was using momentum, which meant he was of the Werner's lineage. After he became Mord, Daejun had never had to fight at full strength yet. Mord decided to show all he could do and filled his body with mana as he did so. Mana hovered around Mord, preparing for a powerful confrontation. The manner of both coming in contact with each other forming sparks all around. The sight amused the Archduke and aroused his interest. Kesser was a bit flustered by the newcomer's mana power. Mord realized he had never used full force before because of the accusations of killing his mother. It had been his emotional barrier earlier. After Tasun became Mord, he wished to unleash his full potential preparing for battle. Guy urged his opponent to start the fight by being emotionally ready. Kesser only made a momentary dash towards Mord. The hardest full speed kick of all came at the target. Blessing Mord's reinforcement withstood a direct hit to block. Kesser realized the reason for the Archduke's interest. That alone didn't stop Kesser from striking again with enough force to knock Mord back. Mord wondered how he had managed to get through the guy's breach, assuming the skill doubled the power of the attack. Kesser, on the other hand, wanted to teach Mord a lot of things during the fight and charged in with another punch. That punch went through the defense and hit the kid right in the torso. The force of the impact was tremendous by so much that it formed a column of dust at the point of impact. Kesser, on the other hand, was just getting warmed up, eager to unleash the full potential of his opponent. Kesser walked towards Mord teasing him, expecting to see more. Mord realizes that there is a huge power gap between them and he needs to harness the power of the new blood. The guy also realized that if he uses this power, the opponent will use it. So he was going to fight the same way. Kesser notices in turn that his opponent is thinking too much. Mord wiped the blood from his lips with a chuckle, clearly unwilling to give up. Kesser, on the other hand, was tearing at the kid again, about to unleash his abilities to the fullest. The warrior noticed that Mord was finally becoming more determined, but did not ease up on the pressure. Mord struck with a powerful attack, but only hit the ground. Mord wasn't going to reveal all his cards, but decides to throw at least one punch. A fistfight ensued between them, where each parried the other's blows. Kesser notes that he has too much scope, which clearly doesn't play in his favor. The blow went straight into Mord's mana-charged block. Kesser, on the other hand, reiterated that there was no point in trying to block his punches. Mord now memorized his opponent's moves and began throwing a series of punches trying to get around his block. Kesser was surprised at how Mord was able to amplify his punch. The warrior was shocked at how the newcomer managed to combine his attack and steal a hold. Kesser's hand shook from the blow, which puzzled him more, for clearly his opponent was talented. Kesser decided to use the momentum of the new blood, wanting to find out what else the kid was hiding. The Archduke ordered a halt to the battle, which caused Kesser to freeze in an instant. The old man said Mulvey that was enough and put his hands on his hips. The father praised his son for his talent in approaching him. He wanted to test its power in the same way, so he charged the pulse. The old man released a ball of momentum straight at Mord. Mord tried his best to hold back the powerful attack. 
The guy realized that he would not be able to cope with this power for a long time. It was necessary to use a trump card. Mord knew that the fight with Fine had not been in vain, and assumed he could hold off the attack using momentum. He extended his arm using the momentum, absorbing the blow. The old man was very pleased with the unexpected version of the situation. Todd's jaw nearly dropped from seeing the progress of the newly awakened. Mord's body was enveloped in mana on par with momentum. The Archduke praised the young man for living up to his expectations, boasting that he was his descendant, which clearly made Mord want to punch his father in the face. The old man announced that Mord had passed the test and offered him any reward. Money not mortal or knowledge infinite, it was all Mord's choice. Mord knew what to wish for, and considered it determinedly. He was going to get the fragments of the world before Aiden did. Still, Mord answered his father that he didn't need all this, but the old man only wondered what he needed then. Mord declared a desire to visit the grave of the God of Duels. Places like this were dungeons, crossings between worlds, and paranormal phenomena always occur in them. Only Vernar's grave has nothing to do with other worlds, it is there that fragments of the world lie. Such an inquiry made the Archduke more serious, and his gaze followed the young man closely. The old man pondered whether to grant this wish, Mord nervously considering that he had asked for such a thing too soon. After reasoning for some time, the Archduke inquired as to the purpose of his visit to such a place. Mord began to make up an excuse, saying he wanted to see traces of the ancestor of the family, which clearly interested Kesser. Kesser thought him naive looking at the young man as a fool. The grave of the God of Duels was the ceremonial place of the Vernar's family, and it equaled a summoning of the lineage. Mord was a bastard in Kesser's eyes, and thus an outsider not equal to their kind. The father agreed to his son's request, having heard Kesser's objections, but so dismissed them citing similar incidents earlier. It was before the Archduke was born, so he doesn't know much about it. He asked Kesser if he was just as willing to go inside, but you could tell by his trembling that there was no desire. Kesser realized that Mord had a worse life, only because he was born out of wedlock and understood the boy's desire to know what it was like to be a member of the clan. The father replied next to his son that he would not send the young man there until he was a true warrior. Mord knew it wasn't a big deal, but he had to make a deadline to get ahead of Aiden. He agreed to the Archduke's terms and set about fulfilling them. Mord realized that his brother Kesser might try to get ahead of him, so he was going to become a warrior sooner rather than later. The instructor approached the students, asking about attendance, only Fine was absent. Level 3 instructor Dazzly ordered everyone to get ready for training. Everyone burst out in a flash except Mord himself, Dazzly unleashing a dialogue with him. Dazzly noticed that Mord was new to the course, and he should join the other students and ask the seniors to help after class. Mord asked whether or not the instructor was going to teach him in person, and if so, could recommend someone. Dazzly began to speak with pressure, saying Mord was so tight that on the first day he took out the captain of their course, and now he demands, to which Mord explains that he has already been punished and Fawn's guilt and provocation was revealed. Dazzly, on the other hand, irritably insulted the disrespectful and arrogant youngster by talking about his upbringing. But Mord insisted that it was the instructor's responsibility, and he wasn't interrupting at all, but had asked reasonably. Damley, on the other hand, slammed his palm sharply into Mord's chest. The instructor's hand was quickly at the guy's neck. He grabbed the insolent man by the scruff of the neck, giving orders. Mord was required to run around the training ground for the rest of the class, listening to Dazzly and not slowing down. Afterward, the instructor smirked Maul that if he couldn't answer all the questions at the end of the day, he would be punished. Dazzly also held tightly to Mord's collar, asking if he understood his orders. But the young man was clearly angry, which was evident from the mana in his fist. The instructor noticed how he began to release mana, clearly getting even more annoyed. He punched the guy in the jaw angrily, muttering that he shouldn't be baring his teeth at the instructor. The instructor's words were law in this institution, and he threatened to kick Mord out for disobedience. Mord wiped the blood from his mouth wanting to punch Dazzly. Mord also realized that the conflict would override all his plans. He gathered all the will in his fist holding on for the cherished goal, agreeing with the instructor. The instructor smirked forcing the one, performing the previously assigned tasks. Mord only silently turned around and ran following Dazzly's orders. The instructor glared at the young man plotting intrigue. He wished Mord would pay for the disrespect on his part. After the conflict, Dazzly began to bully Mord in every way possible. Punished the guy for any little misdemeanor. Power clouded the instructor's mind that he realized his impunity. If anyone dared to question his authority, Dazzly punished them mercilessly. He called it training, so no one crossed him. That's how Dazzly ran the place with unlimited power. The instructor was punishing the guy for disobeying orders in training and justifying the torture. Dazzly chastised Mord for slowing down in practice. 
Mord also understood why Dazzly was pushing him. Careless use of mana was to blame. The instructor noticed that Mord again did not answer his question. Dazzly ordered Mord to stand on his toe for the rest of practice and if he moved, he would be penalized again. Mord kept his cool, knowing that this instructor could teach him something useful. Dazzly sat in his room pondering. The instructor's anger at Mord was not coming out of his mind. Dazzly knew that punishments broke anyone but he didn't understand why Mord held on. It seemed to Dazzly as if Mord was tolerating everything showing his protest. He was angry at the thought that an indirect descendant could be so powerful. Dazzly was going to break the young man at any cost. Mord was at the school about to take his final exam. The gawkers around were surprised at what Mord was about to do. Dazzly questioned his intellectual capacity hearing such a statement. Mord was resolute in his intentions. Dazzly, on the other hand, thought his wish was delusional and insisted on unfinished preparations. Mord questioned the instructor's ability to perform his duties and said he was incapable of teaching him anything by looking him straight in the face. Dazzly, on the other hand, didn't want to undermine authority and said that the choice of who should become a warrior lay with him. He threatened to be barred from the exam after such a protest, but the muzzle swept him up in the air. The guy is officially requesting the spirit of the dueling god. The instructor was taken aback by such a statement. The spirit of the god of duels is a secret rite of summoning to a sacred duel known between warriors. Everyone who respects the power must obey and enter the battle because whoever is stronger is right. The instructor got nervous, surprised at the guy's knowledge. Mord cited his license and stated the reason why he was going to fight the instructor. According to legends, God Vernars grew up not knowing the limits of power from the oppressive teacher that bullied him. So Vernars once declared before his descendants, the despots who dictate their rules and can't justify them deserve to die. The guy realized that the god of duels was out of place in the legend. But still because of this, he could benefit. Dasli was angry, grabbing Mord by the scruff of his neck again, saying he was too young for this. Also, Dazzly made the point that he doesn't need to talk about something like this until 10 years from now at the earliest. Mord struck Dazzly again, snapping at him. He argued that Dazzly had no right to refuse to duel. Mord flung Dazzly's hand off Dazzly's scruff, showing his protest. Dazzly was outraged and shocked by such a thing, but didn't stop Mord. Mord stepped closer to face the crowd, then shouted out filling his voice with mana that he was requesting the spirit of the god of battle from instructor Dazzly. Everyone around them was stunned at what they heard and speechless. The instructor fidgeted nervously, angry at such stupidity from his student. Mord said if Dazzly is going to back out, he can do it before it's too late. Mord also said that he didn't consider the students as witnesses and would go tell everyone next. Dazzly, on the other hand, grinned viciously at Mord, threatening consequences. Mord asked Dazzly if he didn't understand the situation. He emphasized that this is the last chance to give a response to Dazzly. Afterward, Mord called all the training time with the instructor a waste of time and voiced his unwillingness to waste it on scum like Dazzly. The guy's mana was intense, making the instructor cough as he realized he hadn't seen everything Mord was capable of. But the instructor couldn't back down convincing himself that his opponent was still inexperienced. Dazzly accepted the challenge, but Mord himself announced a meeting here in an hour. The instructor resented the fact that he wasn't the one who made the decision but the guy pointed out that he knew the rules and that there was no way to cheat. Mord emphasized again that he wasn't going to waste his time on scum, which irritated the nervous instructor even more. The guy walked away, giving the instructor a chance to escape. Dazzly gritted his teeth with an angry nervousness at seeing such a vicious display of disrespect. Meanwhile, Kesser watched from the castle window at what was happening amused by such things. The sight brought a wide smile to his face. He called for his servant, to which his butler responded. Kesser alerted wanting to go to the third level training area now. At a specified place, at a specified time on the training ground, the onlookers watched the yawning Mord discuss his decision to duel. In front of Mord stood a warrior in armor with a metal sword and shield. Mord praised Dazzly for accepting his challenge. Dazzly, on the other hand, threw a vicious grin in Mord's direction, intending to let him live in humiliation. Mord joked about Dazzly's yapping and compared him to a dog. Mord rubbed his hands together as the instructor foamed at his emotional attacks. Kesser, on the other hand, arrived at the dueling site, surprising the duelists. They were puzzled by the presence of a noble warrior of the Vernars clan. Mord asked without subordination, as if with an old friend, what Kesser was forgetting here, shocking Dazzly with such insolence. Dazzly realized that there was a reason for Mord's arrogance for his patron Kesser. Kesser began to read Mordu's morals and that he had come to see what the fun was about. But Mord continued to abuse his grandfather, discounting his dementia and his inability to cope with his responsibilities. Kesser held back a laugh with his hand amused by Mord's answer. 
Kesser pointed out that even though Dazzly was a senior citizen, he shouldn't write him off. But Mord only continued to guffaw, guaranteeing his victory. Dazzly was so angry he wanted to punch Mordu in the face, but held back waiting for a second. Mord and Dazzly looked at Kesser hearing his suggestion. Kesser, on the other hand, offered to witness their duel. Dazzly was startled by such a suggestion, but Sir Kesser did not give up his intentions. The instructor called Kesser a pretty busy guy, but even here the man found something to pick on, driving Dazzly into shock. Kesser began to smother the instructor with his status showing him his place. Dasli, on the other hand, lowered his head guiltily apologizing to the Earl. The instructor was overwhelmed with anger at the humiliation, which made him clench his teeth. Mord warming up leisurely comes to the end of the audience and wishes to get down to business. Kesser clarified or he wishes to get to the battle already. He only stepped aside clearing the battlefield eagerly waiting for the battle to begin. The guy said with a sneer to the instructor or is he ready to fight? Dalsi, on the other hand, was just about to start the fight agreeing. Just like that, Dalsi decided to ask or did Mord only defeat Foyan through physical strength? The instructor bared his sword filling it with mana, preparing Mord for the fact that he would need to work harder. Dalsi began to move preparing for a confrontation. Mord laughed at the instructor, which clearly annoyed the latter. The guy mouthed off to the instructor that many secrets had not yet been revealed. Mord's body was enveloped in a blue glow emitting pulses of energy. Dalsi was startled that the newcomer had already mastered body momentum. Mord sprinted and redirected all his energy into his fist in preparation for the attack. Dalsi, on the other hand, swung around in preparation to repel the boy's attack. Their mana made contact, and an attack full of mana was parried. Only Mord had a small amount of mana to break through the veteran's defenses. This blow knocked the knight back a couple of meters. Dalsi was slightly shocked by such a force, breaking with his sword. Mord didn't give a second's rest preparing to strike again. This time the blow hit the shield, dispelling Dalsi's mana. The instructor recognized Mord's warrior status, but still wasn't about to give up forming new energy to strike. He used the onslaught to pull the muzzle back with his shield alone. Such a jab surprised Mord slightly as Dalsi ranted again about the superiority of experience over strength. The veteran's powerful stabbing blow went straight for Mord's lunge. The guy was lucky to dodge that blow, knowing that a similar blow would have been painful for him. A light scratch appeared on the muzzle's cheek, despite Dalsi's so powerful blow. Dalsi, on the other hand, insisted on his strength being a rather experienced and deadly opponent. Only Dalsi has opened a gap in his technique because of complacency. He continued to blindly follow his pride preparing to strike. Mord jumped up off the ground, dodging the blow. Doing a somersault, he found himself at a distance from his opponent. The guy confirmed he wasn't experienced enough. Kessa realized that Mord's experience and skills were few. Also realized that in the event of Mord's defeat, Dalsi wouldn't give a guy a break. Dalsi, on the other hand, smirked smugly at the young man, riling him up. Mord continued to anger the instructor, saying his actions only lead to a negative reputation for Dalsi's portfolio. The instructor grinned and threatened to teach Mord a lesson. Just then, Mord wrapped himself in mana reassuring the veteran. The young man's body was enveloped by powerful mana enveloping everything around him in a bright flash. Mord's hair turned white and his mana solidly turned into pulses. Mord opened his snow-white eyes, reincarnating into the ultimate form of enhancement. Dalsi couldn't believe that Mord could use a form of awakened blood. Mord warned Dalsi in that this was the first time he was fighting in such a form, and that the veteran should be careful not to die. Word spread among the students about Mord's progress as they watched the battle from the windows of the school. Kesser, on the other hand, was pleasantly surprised at his half-brother's success. He was also slightly nervous, for despite his talent, unlike Mord, it took him four years to harness the power of the new blood. Dasli couldn't believe his eyes seeing his opponent use such skills at such a young age. The instructor understood that silver eyes were a sign of awakening divine blood. Mord suggested that the veteran lay down his weapons, while he had nothing to lose but his pride. Only Dalsi was unwilling to stop in the face of the inexperienced young man about to fight. In an instant, Mord was flush against Dasli, taking his rejection. The veteran put up his shield with no intention of letting his guard down. The shockwave threw Dazzly backward, even though he took the lion's share of the blow on his shield. The instructor fell on his back with a rumble under the weight of his armor. He was practically paralyzed with fear realizing the power of Mord's new blood. Mord reasoned with how strong his weak punch had been, while Dazzly was consumed with thoughts of defeating the kid. Pride allowed the veteran to rise, not about to give up. Dalsi realized that despite his dislocated shoulder, he needed to fight because the stakes were high. He tore towards Mord, filling his sword with mana for the strike. Dazzly delivered a powerful chopping blow, intending to kill his opponent. Mord pounced on the veteran, trying to get at his sanity. 
Dalsy was instantly behind the young man's back, preparing for another strike. Mord only turned his gaze to look at his opponent's exertions. The veteran delivered a chopping blow filled with mana, with the certainty of victory. A powerful explosion of mana raised clouds of dust from the ground. Kesser, on the other hand, literally praised Dalsy for his alertness and ability to look for his opponent's weaknesses. Only Dalsy was dumbfounded, for the bodies of the Vernar's family members were not only strong weapons, but also strong armor. To the new-blooded Mord awakened, the impact of Dasli's sword pulse was comparable to a mosquito bite. Mord continued to trash the instructor's hubris by saying he is unfit. The veteran realized with a shiver that this was the end, but he didn't want to believe it. After decades of training his sword style, he was useless against the young man. Dazzly continued to shake, not believing in the possibility of what was happening. The veteran continued his attempt to chop Mord, but to no avail. The guy was disappointed in the pompous instructor for turning out to be a wimp. Dazzly, on the other hand, couldn't take the criticism and prepared to strike again with anger. Mord stopped the blade of his sword by squeezing it with his hand. The guy was instructing the veteran that there is no better weapon than the body. Mord clarified if Dazzly was serious in trying to hit him with such a weak lunge. He let a pulse run through the sword blade, striking the instructor with the discharge. Mord paused, giving the old man a chance to admit defeat. Also, the guy demonstrated what would happen to Dazzly in the event of a refusal on his own sword. He displayed an intimidating aura as he spoke of killing in a further continuation of the duel. Dazzly bowed his head and admitted defeat in front of Mord and the witnesses to the fight. Delighted shouts spread out, clamoring for a descendant of Vernars to slay the tyrant's instructor, Dazzly. Kesser, on the other hand, speculated about Mord's talent in mastering the power of a new bloodline in just eight days. He smiled seeing how he had broken the instructor's will, and couldn't even imagine what the young man would be capable of in the future. Feeling excited about Mord's battle, Kesser left the training ground. The delighted shouts of the mystery watchers could be heard from the roof of the building. The unknown man marveled at the young man's strength. Dropping her hood, the girl unraveled her long curls, admiring the young man's courage and challenging the instructor to a duel. Erina didn't expect to see such a monster in her family. She knew something interesting was coming. The castle of the Archduke of Vernars looms on the hill. In the throne room stands the muzzle in front of his father's face. The father questioned his son about his academic progress and the rumors about the spirit of the dueling god. Mord took a knee saying he had come for the promised reward. The Archduke praised him for his courage and clarified his reasons for dueling with Dazzly. The guy described an unwillingness to look past the neglect of the instructor's duties. The old man descending reminded of the law of force and the rightness of the victors. He approved of his son's actions in this situation. Only the Archduke was curious as to why Mord was hiding his potential. Mord made the excuse that he was saving mana and using momentum for the first time. The father noticed his son's lie but with a smile decided to accept that answer. The old man asked the young man if his intentions to challenge the grave of the god of duels had changed, to which he said approvingly. One of the soldiers objected to the Archduke. Speaking of the displeasure of others, should such a decision be made earlier than the official soldiers of House Vernars visited the grave? Looking contemptuously at the warrior, pointed with his high-pitched tone to his seat, the warrior bowed his head apologizing for exceeding his authority. The father replied to Mord that the promise would be fulfilled. He smiled allowing the young man to challenge this dungeon. Mord knelt before the Archduke thanking him for the opportunity. Kesser and Mord stood before the huge door to the tomb of the God of Duels. The Count warned Mord, explaining that once he got in there, he would be on his own. The guy was excited by the sight of the huge door, assuming it would be much bigger than in the manga, Kesser said with a sigh. Mulv doesn't believe he'll let him get there first, to which Mord responded with a similar statement. Mulv doesn't believe he can get there so soon. His brother encouraged the young man, asking him to try to come back alive. He merely thanked his brother for his support and headed for the door. The boy stood in front of a huge door radiating dark mana, feeling the discomfort of just being in the proximity itself. According to legend, the god of duels has always been immortal and left this world to become a celestial after accomplishing a mission. The boy realized that the name of the dungeon had nothing to do with the purpose. Mord opened the gate, realizing it was more of a family crypt where the human form of the dueling god rested. The boy was seven years ahead of Aiden, thus decisively entering inside the crypt, beginning the journey of searching for fragments of the world. Mord knew the fragments had to be inside. Unexpectedly, the young man found himself in another world. Mord was shocked to encounter the unknown for the first time. He began to reason logically. Each path has its own seal that a guy would need to find. Behind the brooding boy's back, a silhouette was watching from around the corner. Mord continued walking by the mystical place, which seemed to him like an unfinished computer game project. He noticed someone's presence. 
Behind his back was an infernal hound with flames emanating from its mouth. Mord turned his head the other way, noticing the second hound. The beasts were clearly not friendly to him, which was clearly not in the guy's plans. One of the hounds pounced on Mord, opening a sparking maw full of flame. Mord took the enemy's head off in one blow with a mana boost. The second monster the guy slew with a pulse, hollowing out the enemy. He rubbed the back of his head lazily, musing that the monsters were wearing him down on purpose. Suddenly, Mord's eyes caught something interesting. He assumed it might be a seal. He speculated that this statue captured the god's victory over young Athinas. Clearly such a picture portrayed the young god's ego. Mord was intent on breaking the seal, charging his legs for the jump. The guy jumped using the momentum, pushing off with a shockwave from the ground. He was on top of the statue in an instant, wanting to land on the statue's shoulder. Mord stood, leaning on his knee, his gaze fixed on the seal. The statue of a young man of ten years old made the lad think he understood what made everyone in his lineage large. Mord reincarnated into a form of new blood, charging with momentum. He walked towards the statue, preparing to share his blood with the seal. Blood wet the steely, filling it with its momentum. Mord realized that without clues it would be difficult to find the seal. He stared at the glowing statue, realizing that few would have the foresight to sprinkle blood after the awakening of new blood. Mord jumped to the ground, cushioning the landing with his hand. He grinned at the steely, glad that no one had beaten him to it. The young man headed to the next seal to get the fragment. Where there had been blood earlier, cracks appeared in the statue as it turned its head to look at the departing boy. Mord continued to mop up the dungeon intensely, easily taking out enemies with a single blow. Enemies kept appearing out of nowhere, giving the guy no rest. He was slightly fatigued from the intense fighting, holding a fighting stance. For the young man, this trial by combat was quite evident. He delivered a powerful blow to the monster's torso, destroying it. The vultures were flying over the guy, waiting for prey to try and get over the wall. Mord realized as long as he was on the ground, the monsters wouldn't attack him from the sky. He's only a short time away from getting a piece of the world. The further the young man progressed through the dungeon, the closer he felt the strong mana. He glanced at his trembling hand, realizing that his body was tired from five awakenings of new blood, and mana was running low. Mord stopped lifting his gaze to something large. It was a huge dragon statue that had the sixth seal on it. The statue did not seem easy for Mordom to conquer. He filled his feet with mana. Suddenly he felt a strong presence behind him. The huge orc looked extremely unfriendly towards Mord. This clearly excited the kid. Mord prepared himself for a fight with a strong opponent, knowing it wouldn't be that easy. The orc struck the first blow on the ground, kicking up a column of dust. Mord jumped back in time from the point of impact watching the orc's movement. He could guess that this orc was more for the ordinary. The orc's height is noticeably taller over 4 meters. The monster prepared to repeat the blow by raising his left arm. The crashing blow hit the ground again, more ducking again. He charged his fist with momentum, preparing to strike at the monster. His blow hit the monster's jaw, which clearly wasn't pleasant for the one. Mord continued the onslaught, landing a series of blows to the orc's head. The orc shifted backward, breaking his feet from such blows. A huge hand caught Mord in the monster's cold grip. The behemoth hurled its opponent against the ground with the speed of a bullet, shattering the ground. Such a blow seriously wounded the guy, causing him to spit up blood. Mord realized that it would take more than momentum to win here. He stood up while the huge carcass ran brokenly in his direction. The orc swung for impact, growling furiously. The new blow sealed the guy into the wall with a huge crack. The monster let his guard down, reveling in his victory. Guy summoned the form of new blood once more, throwing the enemy back with a strong pulse. The orc fell to the ground while Mord continued to move towards his direction. The guy barely survived to reincarnate into this form in time. He jumped up charging a powerful punch to attack the orc. The blow was clearly not to his opponent's liking, punching him in the jaw. Mord's fist was drenched in the monster's blood. He pondered how strong his opponent was that he had to awaken a form of new blood. He looked at the decapitated body of the orc, slightly disappointed at his weakness at the moment. He jumped off the huge body onto the ground, kicking up dust. Mord realized that knowledge would help him, so he contemplated starting his training again after leaving the dungeon. But now he jumped up, aiming for the last seal. In front of his nose was a statue in the form of a rather old warrior. But what was more surprising was that he was shorter for an archduke. Mord thought maybe the god of duels would grow up later on. He realized that it didn't matter much, and decided to break the last seal by sprinkling it with his blood. Mord looked in his usual guise at the glowing statue, wondering if or where he had made a mistake. In theory, Mord should have already gotten his hands on the fragment by awakening the statues of the god of duels. But something was wrong. He staggered back to the beginning, thinking he'd made a mistake somewhere. 
Suddenly, someone's voice came from behind Mord's back, causing him to become stunned. He was surprised, wondering how the statue managed to become human. The brutal old man pointed out that it would be a shame if Mord just walked away. Mord speculated on the reason for his journey to the dungeon. It was here that the hero Aiden was able to find a fragment of the world as told in the manga's plot. Only Mord had not expected this turn of events when the god of duels wished to converse with a descendant of his own kind. Mord thought it might have been another test of this particular dungeon. The boy asked the old man who he was, to which he just laughed asking the young man's age. Mord harnesses the power of the new blood, intending to be the first to know the answer. The old man was impressed by the descendant's strength. Mord threw a powerful punch at an unknown opponent. The blow came to the old man's body without doing any damage, to which he asked not to be rushed. He tossed the young man aside like a small sack in the air. Mord slammed into the wall, feeling the pain despite his form. The old man was about to greet his guest with all his might. His blow hit the young man's solar plexus, knocking Mord backward. The young man flew backwards, forming a shockwave behind him. Letting out a chuckle, the guy began to slowly rise. The guy thought it might be a mirage, because a few moments ago that old man was a statue. The old man asked with a smirk, or whether the young man realized who was in front of him. The lad replied dryly, calling the one a stone statue of Vernars, which the old man confirmed. He only added that he was a human body, a remnant from God himself. This news surprised Mord, making him slightly nervous. Mord remembered that the manga had said that there were human remains in the dungeon. He assumed that this place was meant for human, rather than divine incarnation so also remembered that the statue's history described more of his accomplishments. Mord suggested that each statue might have a piece of Vernar's memories, but the old man grinned at the young man's doubts. He's determined to prove to Mordu what's real by getting ready to strike. A powerful blow came on Mord's hand block that was composed in haste. The old man smiled, noticing his weakness, voicing his assumptions. Mord grew angry not wanting to play God's games anymore, preparing to strike back. Vernars, on the other hand, admired his descendant and his will to fight. The old man didn't have time to strike before Mord was behind his back. He charged a powerful pulse, preparing to attack his enemy with a deadly technique. The old man scratched the back of his head laughing, clearly being relaxed, not expecting such moves from his offspring. It detonated with Mord's momentum, dispelling with a fist punch. Mord tried to land a punch to the side of Vernar's head after hearing the banter from him, but the old man caught Mord by the head, stopping him with ease throwing Mord away like a simple ball, calling him a weakling. Mord exhaled as Vernars approached swiftly toward him. The old man was catching fire for his love of fistfights, clearly getting into the swing of things. Mord realized that his opponent was much stronger than him, taking punches. The old man beat the boy, noting that the young man would have a lot to learn. Mord lay on the ground, breathing heavily from a series of such powerful blows. Vernars kicked the young man away like a pebble, sending him into a fast flight to the first wall. The old man was frustrated by the strength of his offspring as he sat against the cracked wall, wiping the blood from his mouth. Vernars remarked that if he had fought seriously, he would have killed his descendant long ago to which Mord snapped at him, asking him to shut up. When he stood up, his form awakened by the new blood disappeared. It scared the guy a lot. The old man continued to remark on how weak and pathetic his descendants were. Vernars decided to pardon the mortal by asking whether or not he now believed in his authenticity, to which Mord replied with a question or if he was indeed part of the god of duels. He did, however, pick up on the fact that the guy might be mistaking him in the tomb for Vernars. The old man noticed that Mord was one of the few who had traveled this far, and had been able to awaken him, then asked if he knew how many years had passed since the last awakening. Mord only remarked that five centuries had passed, which surprised Vernars and put him in a stupor. Vernars, on the other hand, asked if the test was so difficult that it took so long for anyone to pass. Mord revealed the plot backstory from the manga, describing how there was a conflict of interest between the heirs, with the loser eventually taking the artifact with the secret to awakening the stelae. Vernars, however, scratched the back of his head and turned away, frustrated that too much of the belligerence had been passed down through character to his heirs. The old man was slightly nervous showing weakness in front of the descendant. Thoth exhaled and asked if he realized what was coming behind the awakening of the stele. Mord dryly answered the question with his ignorance. The two stood near the huge dragon statue, talking about the significance of Vernar's statue awakening. Vernar suggested coaching the young man by trial and error in a duel. Mord grimaced at such a prospect, expecting at least a little theory. Vernar's reasoned that it was the only way to train for combat, thinking Mord was dead. But the descendant said that such training was more likely to kill than teach, as the pain in his ribs showed. The old man asked if there was any more pain, which Mord noticed, and noticed that the pain was gone. Vernars announced two pieces of news. 
One was good news, that inside the tomb he would have good regeneration. Someone was standing on the dragon statue. Vernars had picked up that the second news was that he wasn't his rival, which made Mord wonder. From the statue, a young warrior landed on the ground, saying that he was old enough already to spar. That smug young man was fixing his strands, clarifying, or so those thought. Mord assumed it was a ten-year-old Vernars. And if the hair wasn't gray, that meant he couldn't use the power of the new blood yet. The old man set aside the formalities and leveled their skills to the same level. The young man objected, hinting that Mord couldn't take a punch either. Young Vernars suggested that Mord run away, hinting that otherwise he'd get the full brunt of it. Mord began to chide the young man, calling him a blabbermouth. Mord unleashed his power rousing the small one to fight. The one only smirked upon hearing that Mord was asking the one to awaken his power with new blood. He just said he doesn't use that kind of power, emphasizing that if young Vernars uses it, Mord will die. Mord tore at Vernars, hoping he wasn't bluffing, launching an attack. But here he was already lying sealed to the ground, listening to the banter of two parts of the dueling god. They were a little disappointed at the prospect of teaching Mord from scratch, making Mord feel ashamed. He was asked by the old man why he did not know how to fight, to which Mord replied that he had not learned such a thing. This surprised the old man, for all descendants of the god of duels should be able to fight. After telling about himself and the Mord's business in the clan, Vernars replied that he was not particularly satisfied with the business in the clan, and if he got out, he'd give everyone a hard time. The old man held out his hand to Mordu, calling after him to reveal the secret to defeating a ten-year-old. Mord was excited about such an opportunity, but was too nervous about his coach. The old man's point was that he'd fall into the same rake, but Mord was glad for the opportunity to learn here what he couldn't at the school. Mord heard the old man's advice that it was worth taking advantage of the young man's emotions. Petty yawned, shaming the adults for their attempts to beat up the child. The question that remained was how to capitalize on the arrogance of a ten-year-old. The eleventh round of the battle was underway, and they were clashing in battle. The first thing that old Verners notices is that Mord rushes into battle head first, so the young man easily dodges the blow. After which he delivers a powerful punch to the face, sending the one into the wall, the old man recommends using carelessness. Round 74, the old man recommends moving the body according to the movements. Mord tried to strike the young man, but he only watched his movements nonchalantly. The old man also added that it would change the trajectory of the impact. The old man assumed that the young man would dodge, for he was not a weak opponent as it happened. Young Verners then sent Mord flying with a leg kick to the jaw. Mord blew out a breath kneeling in front of him. The young Vernars struck aiming for the head, driving it into the ground. As it turned out, the blow went past his head, and the young man let out a chuckle after fraying Mord's nerves. He held his fist like that against the wall, teasing Mord's weakness. Mord knew he was able to touch him despite his taunts. Round 272nd, Mord noted that the change of trajectory does not help, to which old man Vernars remarked that weaknesses are not found, but created. Mord began to realize which way his opponent was going to go. He jumped knowing what kind of retaliation he'd get. Mord did a somersault in the air right above the young man. He delivered a hard kick to the back of the ten-year-old's back, stamping his foot into the ground with his face. The old man chafed at Mord's success as he himself finally struck a blow. Mord had a happy grin on his face as he was able to hit the young Vernars. A hand full of pulse energy extended out of the dust clouds, to which Mord reacted sharply. Mord was nervous seeing the young man's power with momentum. The same one suggested that Mord was able to get the hang of it. He wasn't going to spare the descendant while sparring filling his palm with a ball of momentum. Mord was able to stop the young Verner's ball with his hands. He realized that if he didn't stop the onslaught, he was screwed. The boy shuddered at the thought of his body being ripped to shreds by the momentum. Thoth shivered, wondering why the old man wasn't stopping the young man. A hard hit from young Vernars flew into the kid's block. The block disintegrated clearly from the violent recoil during the battle. The young man prepared to strike again at Mord. A powerful lunge landed on the torso with a series of punches that followed. A punch to the chin sends Mord flying. After which, the young man ducked down to follow him. He loomed over him, clearly planning a powerful attack. Mord kneeled down, unable to move his fingers. A crack of stone was heard above his head. The head of a huge dragon statue was falling on him, clearly threatening the guy's life. The statue collapsed on Mord, watched from above by young Verners. The young man was amused, wondering if the weakling had survived the attack. The top was extended with a fist full of dust around it. Mord was able to survive the fall of the statue by smashing it with his fist. Only part of the statue pressed against Morda's leg, reinforcing the sadness of this situation. The fear from Daesun's life had returned, he couldn't move his legs, but young Vernars wasn't going to stop. 
the young man was going to spare the one from pain forever, charging his fist strike with impulses. Mord was startled, but he needed another eight seconds to recover. The guy started counting down, watching the young man's attack. He decided to stall for time by talking to the young man. Something flew past the young man's eye, clearly not for nothing. Mord wondered if the descendants had the same weak eyes as other humans, clearly throwing a pebble. The young man missed a punch due to a surprise attack to the eye. Mord is had three seconds left. Young Vernars used a form of new blood, going to kill Mord. There was one second left when the young man's fist was near the guy's face. Mord disappeared, and young Vernars wondered where. While the enemy was disoriented, Mord abruptly tore from behind his opponent's back preparing to strike. He swung around in a leap, preparing to attack at the young man, bitching that he Mord was still alive. Just as smugly, he declared that such a fate awaited young Vernars. Mord landed a hard blow on the young man's jaw, amplified by the momentum. The guy was glad the punch hit the young man slightly nervously. The young man's voice was clearly irritated, calling Mord's blow a mosquito bite, which alarmed him. Thoth exhaled standing motionless, telling Mord that it was foolish to hope to crack his skull. He grabbed Mord by the throat, about to show him how to fight. Mord thought or was not overly provocative. The old man suddenly ordered a halt. The impact sealed Mord into the ground with great force. Mord tried to figure out what had happened rubbing his head. The old man stopped the young man's momentum protecting Mord. The young man began to argue with the old man, and the old man remarked that the goal was to educate descendants. So the old man seriously stated that the training is over. The young man asked, or so he said in his place. But after a long strain, the one returned to a simple form of grudging agreement. The old man chapped the young man as a sign of good work, and Mord noticed the younger man's fear of the older man. Mord returned to his original state, exhaling a sigh of relief. Just then, the old man called out to Mord, about to reward him for his efforts in training. The god of duels noticed that within Mord's blood mixes with another god, Vernar's father, Arita, that the two gods' births are quite close. Although the old man was the son of a god, he was curious what would result from mixing the blood of gods. Vernars blessed the young man with the skill of body of the god of combat as a reward. This power will allow you to awaken the power over your own body. Mord noticed that such a skill was not in the plot of the manga. The old man cheerfully said goodbye to Mord, hoping to meet again, and also asking the young man to say goodbye to Mord, but he was apparently too offended. Mord turned to the young man, boosting his ego, saying that before he met young Vernars, there had been only weaklings around Mord, and that even the whole world would not be able to defeat him. Likewise, Mord thanked the young man for the training and hoped to see him again. The young man blushed with pride, telling Mord that other places like this existed and that he should find them all. Mord smiled at being able to make peace and agreed with the young man. He woke up in front of a huge crystal reasoning, or was it a dream? In front of him was one of the divine instruments, a fragment of the world. Mord wished to touch knowing that it was only through the fragment that Aiden had been able to gain the power to change the world. Mord's body absorbed the power of the fragment, absorbing it into itself. He knew now that Aiden couldn't get stronger like in the manga storyline, preventing him from destroying the world. Everything Mord did was just for a happy ending. One of Lady Erna's retainers came running under the tree, saying that Mord had returned from the grave of the God of Duels, but she was already aware of it and was making a plan. The first item on the plan was to be a good sister to Mord. All descendants of the Vernars family can battle for the right to inherit the throne. At the moment there are only five, Erna, Viden, Huran, Dran, and Aran. The news of Mord's success could not pass them all by. Unknown shared that everyone would want to win such a powerful figure over to their side. Viden intended to get Mord at any cost. Meanwhile, in the first region of Castle Verners, the servants showed Mord his room. The castle of the first region was a place for rich people with luxurious apartments. Mord only speculated as to why he was being treated so kindly. They even set aside a practice area, especially for him. The guy even got two servants. Now he could live like a real aristocrat. The unknown man knocked on the door, speaking loudly respectfully to Mord. The servants opened the door and two unknown men appeared before them. Mord threw them a cold glance expecting to hear the purpose of the visit. Two uniformed warriors stood in front of him. There were four ranks of warriors in total. They came with a message from Dran Vernars. Two were second rank warriors. The warrior read out Dran's message, where he invited Mord to join his army. Mord silently assessed Dran's message, thinking over the suggestion. Just then, one of them began to arrogantly prod Mord, saying it was too great an honor for him and let him thank him for such a message. Mord mouthed thoughtfully that he didn't know who Dran was. The warriors were red with anger, offended by their lord's ignorance of Mord. They started to act like Gopniks, but Mord answered honestly that he didn't know who Dran was, 
Suddenly those turned to the unknown participant in the dialogue. From their demeanor, it was obvious that it was one of the second-ranked knights. This guy was Walls. He was clearly strong in appearance. The same one brazenly declared, spitting on the knight's shoulder, that he too had come to recruit Mord, causing the two to clash in a verbal altercation. It was getting to a fight. The evil knight suggested that Walsy come out with him, to talk. Walls, on the other hand, accepted the challenge, but staked his claim to the right to train Mord. As he did, he noticed the knight's trembling, and said that if he was shaken, let him run to his master and tell him of the failure. Those only left with the promise that he would eventually regret it. Mord knew that they would do nothing to this warrior because their skills were at different levels. The warrior exhaled, turning to Mord. He held out his hand to him, introducing himself as Walsh. Mord called him Senior, for he was obviously higher in rank. Still, Walsh wanted Mord to call him simply Sir Walsh, for he thought it was strange when a man should respect someone only for more experience. Mord agreed, and swept up the fact that the man had come here to recruit him into Veden's army. He was curious about the prospect. Walsh, on the other hand, could offer anything, but he didn't see the point. Walls was even willing to beat Mord to a pulp in order to recruit him. He smirked, emphasizing that it was time to come down to Earth and not harbor a victory on Dazzly. Mord was glad for the opportunity to test his newfound skills in a duel. They walked out onto the training ground, preparing for battle. Mord suggested that Walsh take a gun, since he could hardly handle the guy with his bare hands. Waltz, on the other hand, said he doesn't use a gun, but has his trump card. He used the skill Momentum Glove preparing for the fight proud of himself. Walsh began to mock Mord, thinking he couldn't defeat him without the power of new blood. Mord created the same skill as Walls suggesting starting. Walls was greatly surprised by the fact that Mord had managed to learn this skill in four days. Mord swung for a jump attack, hinting that he wasn't going to sit still. They began to have a battle, a very quick battle that was not noticeable to mere eyes. Walls slid backward, breaking surprised at Mord's speed. But Mord's follow-up shot went right by Walsh. Walls sat on the ground, being impressed by his opponent's strength. He stood up, tauntingly saying that he had simply underestimated his opponent. Mord reassured Walsh, explaining that the warm-up was over. The warrior realized that the guy had tremendous mana that was clearly unattainable even to the descendants of Vernars. He asked why Mord didn't put his best foot forward in the fight with Dazzly. Mord only replied that there were his reasons, hiding a truth the warrior was unlikely to believe. Walsh, on the other hand, smirked, realizing the guy wasn't going to reveal all his cards. But Walsh recognized Mord's power and wanted to prove himself by fighting. Mord was surprised to see what he was accomplishing. The warrior began to transform into a werewolf. He was interested in Walsh's strength. The boy remembered the stories of people cursed with the curse of the full moon, and how few could restrain their minds, but only the special ones with great willpower. Walls proudly stood before Mord in his belligerent lycanthrope uniform. Mord noticed the difference in size and strength, but the lad's confidence made him strike first. The werewolf's powerful paws held back Mord's blow. Walls said the kid had better mana, smirking adding that much stronger and bigger for it. The werewolf stabbed at Muzzle, grinning heavily. The blow was so hard it slammed the guy into the wall. Mord wiped his mouth, realizing that they were actually on the same level, but in different force parameters. Guy offered to finish the battle to Walsh. Walsh, on the other hand, scoffed at Mord's possible fear of defeat, suggesting that he use the power of the new blood. Mord kneaded his neck, explaining that the werewolf would probably die if he used it. The guy said he wasn't going to give up. He was going to finish the fight with one punch. But the werewolf was making fun of him for beating him up before. Mord decided to use the fragment of peace by extending his fist. He assured his opponent that he didn't show everything. The guy decided to use the dual god's body, and he had about 20 seconds. He claimed enough strength to take down a werewolf. The werewolf grew nervous, seeing that Mord was a strong straight-up intimidator. Walsh roared, delivering a chopping blow with his fangs, blowing chopping waves. Mord takes a jab, standing up. At the very last moment, he dashed to dodge the blow, shortening the distance. He struck with his strongest pulse ball, stunning his opponent. From such force, the werewolf flew into the castle tower, destroying the walls. Mord realized he had punctured his abode while his subordinates nervously shouted Sir Walsh's name. The guy decided to quickly check if his opponent was alive. Walsh lay on the floor broken by his defeat. He didn't know how he would look into Weedon's eyes after failing. Walls recalls Weedon's request in the gloomy woods. Sir Weedon asked Walls to give his power. Mord was nervous, wondering who would pay for the repairs to his house. The werewolf went into a frenzy returning to his opponent. Mord pondered his opponent's trump cards. The boy dared to use the power, but knew he hadn't learned how to fully control the power, which made him nervous. Suddenly, a third party struck the werewolf. 
Walsh plowed through the ground back to human form lying unconscious. It was Miss Erna, one of the heirs to the throne of Vernars. The subordinates excitedly explained to Erna that there was no need for violence, but she assured them that without intervening in the conflict, one of them would have died and was betting on Walsh. She noticed that he had gone mad because he was not perfectly controlling the second reincarnation. The subordinates confirmed Erna's words and also followed her instructions. The girl turned her attention to the guy, telling me what she'd heard about him. Erna wanted to meet Mord, but Mord noticed an oddity in the girl, the fact that the build was the same. The girl stated so femininely that Mord could call her big sister Erna. The idea of calling her sister clearly made him disgusted and unpleasantly shocked, from which rejection ensued. Erna was in her bedroom embarrassed, clutching her pillow in shame and embarrassment. The butler swept up that it was for this very reason that he protested the friendly sissy plan. The butler had also noticed that Mord was a bastard and would have reacted negatively to the direct descendant's suggestion of friendship. But for that reason, Erna thought her plan would work and he would appreciate it. Erna was surprised that Mord was able to defeat Walls without using the power of the new blood. Butler agreed with Erna's words, continuing the discussions about Mord's skills. The fight for Mord will only grow as rumors spread quickly. Erna wished to get Mord, but didn't know exactly how to go about it. The butler was about to send someone more convincing when a messenger came running in with important news. The warrior only said something about Count Winsel, piquing Erna's interest. He shocked Erna by announcing that Mord would accompany the Count on the mission. Mord noticed how quickly his house was rebuilt after the battle. From the window of the building, Kesser was looking at Mord, waiting for the guy. Sir Kesser remarked that Mord couldn't live a day without adventures, but the lad claimed in his defense that a full-blown war had almost broken out over him. The brother asked the lad to participate in the mission in 10 days. Mord didn't quite understand the significance of the assignment. Kesser, on the other hand, clarified that the goal of the mission was to stop demonetization. Dungeons appear often because of anomalies and natural disasters. In the dungeon itself appear various monsters that do not leave the limits of the dungeon. But there are also demons that purposefully gather troops to destroy humanity from the monsters of the dungeons. There are three stages of demonization. The first causes whirlwinds, the second fixes the rift, the third occurs when demons are strengthened and territory is destroyed for demon armies to appear. If the worlds connect, the rift will become permanent and monsters will start raiding. The third stage is the final stage for mankind, so it is worth stopping everything before the end of the second stage, and only people with the power of Vernars are able to get to the center and stop the destruction. Kesser explained that it's a one-way ticket, and not everyone is destined to return, so he gives a choice. Mord began to reason self-servingly, pondering the risks. It seemed that only Kesser's suggestion was a way for him to get rid of unnecessary suggestions. He was in agreement and suggested that we start preparing with lunch. A group of people were gathered in the courtyard of the castle. The Count notified everyone of his sudden desire to take a new companion on a deadly mission. Kesser introduced Mord to the team members. Mord was certain that the warriors before him were experienced warriors, clearly a step above the ordinary humans he had met. He also thought those would be worried about the new fighter in the collective. Toward Mord, a huge warrior about six feet tall stepped out of the crowd. The warrior appeared extremely friendly and welcoming towards Mord. The team immediately began to press taking him joyfully into the embrace of their society. They were all distracted by Kesser clapping his hands for attention. The man expressed a desire to visit the tomb of the god of fights, so he asked the others to train together. Kesser ordered the friendly Ericsson to help Mord, to which he agreed. Ericsson expressed a desire to meet Mord. They were third-ranked warriors Rack and Ericsson, not of the Werners family. Ericsson hoped to work together and that everyone would get along. Rack, on the other hand, didn't know how to get along with a man without emotion. Ericsson suggested that the guys start practicing in a friendly manner. Ten days later, at the entrance to the dungeon tomb of the dueling god, people welcomed the return of Count Winsel. The servants offered the Count a meal, but he declined, citing important business. The entourage recommended that Vinsel be more cautious. Kesser, for his part, wondered if Mord had adapted to his new team. Meanwhile, practice was in full swing. The two warriors fought in front of Kesser's eyes. The Count marveled at the strength of the fighters he was watching. Kesser also noticed that Mord was fighting much better and stronger than in the last duel. Ericsson ran up to the Count saluting, the man in turn inquiring about Mord's progress. Ericsson reported on Mord's basic training complex, but Kesser was interested in his personal opinion. The warrior shared with the captain about Mord's shocking stamina comparable to Rack who had been trained in the new blood techniques for 12 years. The Count himself couldn't believe the young man's progress, joking that he was a monster as he watched the fight. Mord fought on equal footing with Rack throwing a punch that his opponent dodged. 
he relished the opportunity to learn and practice something new. Kesser, on the other hand, organized a briefing, praising everyone for their success in training and hoping for an equally successful mission. The Count clarified, or not the excitement of those present before the mission, to which he received a negative answer. Kesser cared about every soldier on the mission, but was still equally curious to see or if Mord would be able to co-opt the others. But still the one was pleased with the success of the experiment, and saw that the one was much smarter than his age. The Count decided to reassure himself, clarifying if everything was okay with Mord. Mord was pleased with everything, looking forward to the mission. Kesser set off with a dumbfounded save of his strength. The squad stood on the hill watching the tornado noting that the second stage had already begun. One of the warriors rushed over to the Count, taking a knee. Kesser noticed that the soldier was diligently doing his duty, but he wondered how he had missed the destruction that had begun a day earlier. A scout reported that there was another source of demonetization, which shocked the Count. The warriors realized they would have to work twice as hard to prevent critical destruction. Kesser stated that despite the fatigue, the warriors needed to put forth their best effort and begin the mission. The entire group of warriors immediately headed inside the epicenter following their leader. Mord approached the gothic structure with the group, feeling a sense of deja vu, as if he were looking at a painting from a manga. A huge pack of hellhounds was rushing from the rift site. They were all extremely irritated and angry, ready to sweep away everything in their path. Following the hounds was an army of orcs surprising the fighters. Kesser ordered Rack and Mord to awaken new blood. The three of them and Earl formed a pulse field. The captain began to give his orders. The Count ordered the rest of the men to proceed to the offensive, which they followed. The fighters easily dealt with the crowds of monsters using the power of momentum. Erickson produced a thunder spear aiming at the enemies. In the blink of an eye, a strong shockwave thinned the ranks of the orc troops creating a gap. Kesser realized that the monsters were pretty fast for that many. Rack suggested that the rifts had already begun to connect. Mord added that it was too late to call for reinforcements, and the Count had no choice but to continue the mission as quickly as possible. Kesser ordered Rack and Mord to take on the Cyclops, while the Count himself went for the demons, those taking orders to spread out along the battle line. Mord was coming with a charged punch straight at the huge opponents. He scattered the crowd of monsters in the blink of an eye, destroying their formation. Rack, on the other hand, was pleased with the newcomer's resilience and slightly envious of his fortitude. A huge demon stepped out in front of Rack. The warrior noticed that he was preparing to emit energy from his mouth. At this point, Rack was about to set a trap. From the conflict of energy, the demon's jaw burst open, slashing his opponent. Mord intended to finish off the discouraged enemy. The guy told his buddy to hit the right side. Rack rumbled according to Mord's plan. Both warriors struck the monster in the torso. The monster fell to his knees in pain. When the demon's eye opened, Mord was already there preparing to punch it in the eye. An explosion rang out and a surge of blood with sparks spread out to the sides. Rack, on the other hand, was shocked by Mord's blow. He thought the young man was a monster. The warrior put up a barrier protecting them from the guts and blood of the enemy, for which Mord was grateful. But Rack recommended they hurry to the Count. Five strong demons were circling around Kesser. It looked like the fusion had already completed. There was an explosion as if something heavy had fallen from the sky. Mord ducked, wondering what had happened. The boy was disoriented hearing the demon's voice. The demon sitting on the throne was surprised that the guy survived the fall into the rift. Mord was shocked to see something otherworldly in front of him. It was a gateway leading to the demon world. He suggested that perhaps Mord had gotten in too deep. Mord also assumed that the one sitting on the throne was no ordinary demon. He checked with the demon or the one was the core, to which he received an honest answer and confirmation. The demon in armor was going to take the young man's soul being the chosen root of the monstrous darkness. Rack rushed to Kesser's aid and reported that Mord had disappeared. The Count was dumbfounded by such news. Kesser followed Rack to where his subordinate had disappeared. They both became stunned when they saw the disappearance site. Mord was talking to Baron Ulthus, wondering why he had led that one into the depths. The demon told of another demon that had come here, with whom he had argued and lost, remaining to guard the core. The second demon Baron met Kesser and Rack outside, enjoying the anticipation of the feast. Since Ulthus remained at the core, he decided to devour Mord and announced his wish to the boy. The demon licked his lips describing the flavor of the young meat. Mord grew slightly nervous, not putting in plans to face such a powerful opponent one-on-one. -on -one. There are only four castes of demons. The lowest, the highest, the lords and the monarch. Altus belonged to the lord caste. Meanwhile, Sir Kesser fought one of the lords. But still there is not much strength to stand alone. Rack, on the other hand, stepped to the Count's defense, thus making the demon laugh. Kesser took the form of new blood thinking it was unnecessary, 
The Count was confident he could do it alone. Ultus, on the other hand, advised Mord to be patient for a while, for there was no need to rush into battle. Mord realized his perspective, realizing he would have to fight alone. The demon was amused by the young man's determination and accepted the challenge. Mord started with his crowning kick, hitting a block on Ultus. The demon praised Mord's strength, but decided to call it a day on the games. He casts a shock spell, and a demonic circle appears behind him. Ulthus uses the Fire Spirit Dance spell, releasing dozens of fire arrows. Mord prepared to strike with a fist, charged with momentum. The young man struck with the Mirage Destroyer skill in an instant. A massive explosion erupted in the midst of the hall. The demon chuckled at the thought of Mord being gone so quickly. An extremely unexpected blow to the demon's head came from behind him. The boy charged his arm with momentum for further attack. A powerful thunderclap overtook his opponent. Mord realized that this was the first time he had ever put 100% of himself into a fight. The blow only angered the demon, making it roar. The demon was angry, wondering how the young man could still move. Altus, on the other hand, rushed into battle, not even hoping that Mord would lose quickly. Mord stands looking at the demon that was moving towards him. The guy decided to use the Peace Shard to boost his mana. Their auras made contact in a confrontation. The demon delivers a chopping blow with his sword. Mord in turn dodged the blow by jumping up to strike. He delivered a powerful blow to his opponent's face, piercing his head. A body of dust fell to the ground behind Mord. The demon had no head at all and blood was oozing out of it. A glowing sphere appeared in place of the body. It was the core of this rift that was responsible for demonetization. Meanwhile, Count Kesser was with Rack at the decapitated body of the demon lord, about to go to Mord's aid. Mord appeared in front of the group telling them not to worry, from which Rack called out to the commander. Mord swept up that those had finally arrived. Kesser was shocked to notice the demons were gone. Mord showed the demon lord's weapons as proof that they were. Kesser sank into contemplation of Mord's latent power realizing that he could have easily defeated him in a duel on the day of the Archduke's inspection. He praised Mord for a good job being overwhelmed. After correcting the expression by calling the smirking young man, Sir Mord, Mord asked when the core could be destroyed, to which Kesser replied that there was still time and it was worth exploring the dungeon. Kesser thought a year would be enough for Mord to reach the full potential of his powers. After a month and a half of such missions, they returned to the duchy. Kesser notified Mord that there would be a banquet in five days. Meritorious service awards are handed out to the warriors at this event, and the banquet is held every two months. The Count had ordered Mord to rest before the important meeting and gain strength. Mord realized that there would be many high-ranking officials there, and those who aspire to the Prince's seat. Aiden had constant conflicts with Prince Vernars in the manga multiple times. According to the plot of the story, the place of the prince was to take after the coup Leon Vernars that long ago left the family. Mord also realized that this was the way Aiden would put Lion on the throne of the Vernars family. In this way, Aiden would be able to gain strong allies from the principality. Mord understood the significance of the banquet and wished to pull the prince to his side before Aiden made a move. Mord also assumed that the five candidates for the prince's seat would also attend the banquet. It was a great chance for the young man to get a closer look at the future heirs to the throne. Warrior Erickson at the banquet cheerfully greeted Mord. Erickson had expected Mord knowing he'd come alone, and the kid didn't deny it. Erickson advised Mord to come to the buffet after the awards, where he could make more connections, and also recommended that he come with him next time. The servants greet the warriors as they make their way into the awards hall. Gossip and rumors swirled around Mord about his strength and skills at a young age. Mord was rumored to have every right to begin claiming the throne of the Principality, but due to his status as a bastard, had little loyalty from high society and warriors. One of the warriors approached them saluting Sir Erickson. Erickson bowed being pleased to see a high-ranking figure. Prince Dren himself, the pretender to be the heir to the throne, appeared before them. Prince Dren asked Erickson to leave them alone, but he tried to gently object. Only it was explained to the prince from the sidelines that it was not quite proper. He turned around to ask what it meant, but stopped when he saw a familiar face. In front of them stood another heir to the throne, Biden. Biden made a point of seeing Drain's desire to hire Mord. The prince smirked at the implication that he was wrong. Dran, however, remarked that he was here to apologize for the rudeness of his men. Afterward, the prince clarified to Mord that he had sent his men to invite the lad to dine with him, awaiting a response from him. Prince apologizes to all for the arrogance of his subordinates, and that did not look after them. He held out the box to Mord as an apology. Only the lad realized it was just a PR move by the prince to boost his reputation in the eyes of the other warriors. Mord acknowledged the cunning of Dran's plan, but accepted the prince's apology. The prince smiled falsely at Mord's thanks for the move. Biden, on the other hand, was in a rage holding himself back. 
not intending to let Morda go. Afterward, he turned to Mord coughing. Biden introduced himself to Mord, also telling him that he had heard about his power and wanted to meet him in person, as again their conversation was interrupted by a cheer from the sidelines. Mord bowed in greeting to Erna when the girl remarked that she shouldn't be so formal, but Prince Biden was angry to see her interrupt them unceremoniously. Erna pretended to see nothing else besides Mord and Dran's dialogue. Biden was furious explaining that there are limits to everything, and he wouldn't look at the fact that Erna is his sister. Erna flirtatiously hinted that people might think how caring Big Brother was by breaking her sister's arm. Biden, however, responded that it was a very magnanimous gesture, looking at his broken legs thanks to his little sister's efforts. Dran noticed that once again they were making a circus of themselves in front of an important guest, and apologized to Mord. Mord remembered that there were three pretenders in front of him, and he already had a first impression of them. Dran in Mord's eyes was a conniving strategist not worth trusting. Biden, on the other hand, seemed like a complete idiot to Mord, so he's not a good fit either. Erna seemed like a freak to him, but still he decided to keep her in mind. One of the warriors gets into a family conflict telling both of them to finish the gig. Erna asked her and why he wasn't on a mission, and he pointed out that it had been half an hour since he'd returned. Biden remarked that he didn't know about his brother's passion for banquets, but the latter replied that he didn't come here for a banquet, but for a gossip hero. Huron introduced himself to Mord by extending his hand. He was also a candidate for the throne. Huron has noticed that Mord has a firm grip. Huron has shown a desire to spar with Mord someday, the same one recalling that this challenger was one of the two survivors in the manga. Mord also knew that despite his cuteness, the man before him was a powerful warrior with great potential. Mord noticed that Alan wasn't there today and was eager to learn more about the fifth candidate. Before the awards began, the ruler of the principality wanted to speak. Archduke Werners praised the courage of all the soldiers and declared his pride. Now the award ceremony has begun. Morda was summoned and the young man began to walk toward the steps. The guy kneeled down receiving a trophy and a second-class warrior rank for his accomplishments. Father has noticed that Mord has gotten stronger since the last meeting and would like to see more abilities in action. In the banquet hall, Mord was approached by Kesser asking him for a word. The Count asks Mord not to get too drunk because he wants to send the boy somewhere tomorrow. Kesser, on the other hand, explains to Mord the significance of tomorrow's trip. Count Kesser's teacher wanted to meet with him personally. Mord paced the huge empty hall full of cracks noticing that it was strange to see such emptiness. He noticed a huge door, wondering how to open it. The door opened on its own. An unknown voice greeting Mord, which drew his attention a bit. In front of him, a powerful silhouette stood in the center of the building. The old man remarked that the young man had traveled a hard road. The blind warrior turned to Mord introducing himself as Ildan Vernars. He was a former general of the elite guard, as well as the Archduke's older brother. After being defeated in a battle with his half-brother, he lost his sight and did not appear in public afterward. Ildan wanted to touch Mord's face, to which the boy agreed noticing the similarity between the Archduke's and his half-brother's voices. He remarked that Mord didn't look like his father, which the boy confirmed by saying he was like his mother. Ildan asked if Mord knew why he had called the young man, to which he replied teasingly, that the blind man wanted to see him, and he laughed, appreciating the joke of Kesser's former apprentice. The old man wanted to offer something to the young man, but before he did, he asked, or perhaps assessed the strength. Mord remembered from the manga that the old man was looking for a man who could defeat Archduke Vernars. The guy created his huge mana flow in the form of new blood, which startled Ildan. Mord smirked, answering that he was ready to show whatever was needed. The boy struck the blind man's torso with all his strength. After the impact, he saw an explosive ball of momentum that put the one in a stupor. The powerful explosion threw Mord off at a tremendous speed. Mord braked on the ground, noticing that it was an unusual pulse ball. The old man managed to create a core from the aura and turn it into a pulse of great power that even master-level mages could not manage. The blind man could control a dozen of these, which was impressive. Mord realized that he would not be able to handle the old man's aura easily, for it was beyond the scope of ordinary magic. The guy wasn't going to give up and charged his arm with momentum intending to break through the defense. Mord realized he needed to block the recoil and put all his strength behind it. The old man noticed that Mord's strength had increased as he attacked the blind man. Mord, like a man possessed, began to throw a series of punches in an attempt to break through the breach. The old man noticed how fast the young man was and knew he was capable of making a new defense. Mord expected such a thing from the blind man, so he decided to use a trump card. He created a pulse ball filled with mana. Suddenly everything around it sprouted pulse balls forming a forest. Ilden noticed that Mord had managed to erect his pulse orbs while destroying him. He was curious where he had learned such a thing. 
Mord landed a powerful blow to the old man's back, clearly not even moving him. The young man's fist didn't even pass through Ildan's mana. Mord bounced off preparing for another trick to pierce his opponent's aura. The guy started using the fragment to boost his mana. The old man noticed how the young man's momentum began to wane after hitting his weak spot, wondering. At this moment, Mord delivered a powerful blow to the old man's back, causing him to even fall back. Mord was glad he was able to put a strong opponent to flight. He clenched his fist enjoying the moment of strength as he suddenly heard the old man laugh. The old man explained that there are several stages of awakening new blood. Mord's was now the first. A change in eye and hair color. The old man rose up enveloped in silver lightning, which was the second stage. This indicated an approach to the divine state. Behind Mord's back was an old man ready to strike. Mord tried to hit back, trying to gain enough strength. Their room was illuminated by a large blue flash of powerful energy. Their fists made contact with each other, holding back a powerful blow. Only there was more force in the old man's blow, so Mord flew a bullet into the wall. The old man stood watching the young man. He was pleased with his startling reaction. The old man's hand was slightly shaking, from which the old man smiled, seeing that despite the second stage, the old man's hand was shaking from the recoil. Mord wiped his face as he rose, apparently not tired in the slightest. The old man offered to end the ordeal, explaining that he didn't know what would happen if he broke up. Mord stepped out of his uniform, realizing that his opponent's power was great enough to be a force to be reckoned with. The old man approached Mord, inviting him to join his squad. Mord realized that he was being asked to join an elite squad of guards. Within the Duchy of Vernars, there is a unit called the Guardians. Together with the Defenders unit, they were called the Elite Troops. All members of the troop were veterans of many battles on the battlefields and dungeons. In the south of the continent was the Great Kingdom of the Demon, a land completely controlled by demons and was something like an outpost of the forces of darkness under the jurisdiction of the squad Defenders. In the north was the Kingdom of the White Demon, partially captured. It was there that manifestations of demonization and for the zone were responsible for the squads of guards. The competitor in the northern lands for ownership of the region was the Ordus clan, opposing the Vernars clan. One of the dangers awaiting the Guardian squad was confrontations with the clan in question, which constantly brought casualties. Mord understood now why Sir Kesser's expression was so concerned over this conversation, for it was a dangerous undertaking for a recently awakened force of new blood. Ildan explained to Mord that he had all the qualities of a future successor to the throne, and therefore could not allow him to fall into the hands of an enemy, and that Kesser would not be able to protect the young man forever from the other pretenders, who would obviously use every possible means to get Mord on his side. The old man also noted that the heirs cannot interfere in the affairs of the kingdom of the White Demon, so as long as he will be in his unit, will be able to have some immunity. Mord was agreeable, but only under two conditions. The blind man masked his beard listening to the young man's demands. The first condition was the permanent ability to spar with Ildan. The old man asked if he was referring to training, but he objected, saying that it was a great opportunity for him to fight without fearing for his life with such a strong sparring partner. The old man laughed at Mord's self-assured judgment and agreed to be a dueling partner for him for 20 days. The old man also clarified what the second condition the young man had set for him. Mord stated that he was asking the old man for a year of free wanderings under the pretext of fulfilling the squad's secret mission. Ildan was a little surprised by this request. He asked what he would be doing for the whole year, to which he received an answer about the young man's personal affairs. Mord realized that the request might have seemed impertinent, asking for a leave of absence before the service began, but he couldn't let Aiden's nurturing powers remain dormant. The old man agreed to Mord's condition, but there was a nuance. He was willing to allocate only eight months and no more. Ilden was quite generous to powerful warriors and was even willing to put a powerful descendant on the throne just to overthrow the Archduke. He even put Leon on the throne and trained him for the sake of it. The old man thought that despite his ignorance, this was a great chance for him. Mord thanked Ildan for his mercy with a bow. The old man knew that Mord was superior to many of the Vernar's family, but because he was a bastard he was unlikely to get the throne, but it was also a good chance to make the young man a tool for a future ruler. Mord had already returned to his chambers, where he was met by a servant. The boy strolled through the courtyard noticing the unfamiliar warriors. The servant replied that those were Miss Erna's guards. The servant also added that she was already waiting for Sir Mord inside, which surprised the young man. Mord walked into his chamber seeing Erna sitting there wondering what the purpose of the visit was. She only remarked that he should behave as he pleased. Ms. Erna held out the box to Mord, telling him to take it. The girl smiled, noting that Dran had given a good thing, 
Mord noting that it was an expensive elixir. Erna smiled, telling him to open the gift that had been arranged before his departure. It was a vial with amazing contents. It was one of the rarest artifacts in the world, facilitating a mage to pass the test of death to gain immense power. This artifact was called Dead Man's Tears. Mord recalled that when Aiden gave this treasure to Lion, he became many times stronger than he could ever be, except another character died taking the artifact. Erna informed Mord that the item was a gift to her for a decade, but if he couldn't bear the power of the artifact, it would be poison to him. The girl also noticed that it was worth saving this thing for when she was ready, but still Mord could use a little caution. But when Mord was asked if she had taken something like this before, she assured that she had. A couple of years ago, she had saved a member of the royal family during a demonetization and received a similar artifact as a gift, which she immediately accepted, because that had more importance to her than this one. Mord was surprised because in the story, the three candidates for the throne had never been able to get their hands on the thing. Mord was grateful to Erna for such a valuable gift, and thanked the girl, in return, he heard only warnings to be careful. She smiled broadly and offered to discuss the rest when Mord returned safe and sound. Mord was a little puzzled by such a gesture. He realized that she had no hidden agenda in this visit. He was going to remember that this girl appreciated him so much, even though Mord was not yet her ward. Twenty days later, Mord set out in his cloak. On the way he met a man, it was Sir Kesser obviously waiting for Mord. Kesser asked if Mord was really leaving, to which he replied only that he intended to leave quietly without disturbing anyone. The Count noted that despite his strength, he was still a child who needed the protection of an adult especially in a place as dangerous as the North. Without fully understanding what the young man was thinking, Mord only smiled broadly thanking Kesser for everything. Mord thanked his half-brother for his concern, and knew that unlike the others, he didn't look at pedigree or titles. He was always kind to the young man, and protected him without giving any sign of it. Unlike Fawn, he never treated Mord with priggishness. Unlike Dasley, not slowing his growth and development. Also didn't envy the guy's power like Walls or try to take advantage like Biden. Just looking out for Mord, fighting for him, Mord was going to repay him for his kindness. He claimed he was strong enough to not be ashamed to call himself a warrior. Mord promised to visit Kesser upon his return and bring good wine with him. The Count only exhaled a smile, realizing that he couldn't be dissuaded. He put his hand on the lad's shoulder, walking away wishing him luck, and Mord only reciprocated and advised Kesser to take care of himself. As Mord alone passed through the gate, an unknown man jumped down to him from the wall. Turning around, Mord felt someone's presence, but there was nothing behind but leaves. The old man was telling Mord that one who wielded momentum had to go through several stages to perfect, and that the first one was to control the momentum of the sword, or the momentum of the body. The second stage according to Ildan is designed to control a high-density pulse to cover a limited amount of the body like a glove. The third stage is designed to remotely control objects and create distant pulses. The fourth stage gave to the study of furious force. According to Ildan that is applied by the compression and acceleration of particles of momentum forming a huge initial force. He also mentioned the existence of a fifth stage. Only a few people have reached the fifth stage, because only a sufficiently outstanding mind with great talent can reach this level with great effort and a lot of skills. The fifth stage was called Aura. Those who were able to achieve such mastery were dubbed Master Level Mages. After 20 days of training, Mord remembered that Ildan was not satisfied with simple training for he was not satisfied with just sparring and decided to teach the young man more. But it was not enough to reach the level of a master. However, Mord found a way to overcome his hold by looking at the artifact. He was confident that by taking the tears of the dead man, he could curb the desired power and surpass his limits. Mord thought the duke would want to stop the young man before he got north by sending warriors after him. Suddenly, Mord felt something strange behind his back. He jumped back sharply from the unexpected blow, the guy lifted his gaze looking up, noticing something interesting. A squad of archers stood on the cliff releasing many arrows in Mord's direction. That only elicited a smile. Mord told them to shoot. Dozens of arrows fly towards the lone traveler. Squads of archers watched the huge explosion, assuring themselves that Mord was dead and unable to dodge several thousand arrows. A club of dust mixed with the sparks of the pulse baffled the fighters. In front of them stood a whole and unharmed Mord emitting a powerful aura of mana. A squad of mages stretched out their arms, preparing to attack the young man. Their combined spell formed a magic circle that emitted flames. A powerful beam of flame flew expanding as it covered the distance. The flames were coming straight from Mord's back. The young man turned around and created dozens of momentum balls defending against the enemy's flames. A huge explosion erupted, engulfing a huge area of the forest. 
The forest was enveloped in flames covering the sky. The flames scattered, destroying the trees around Mord all the way to the mountain where no one else was on it. Dozens of bodies lay on the scorched ground and hung unconscious on branches. One mage managed to survive. He couldn't believe that Mord could fend off such a strong attack. The masked mage realized the guy was much stronger than his employers had told him. Mord struck the mage's barrier at full speed. The barrier was so strong that it caused Mord to feel like hitting a solid shield. He knew it was worth the effort to strike harder than the last. A swordsman attacked the young man from the side, causing him to cover up and cancel his attack. The swordsman noticed that the young man had an extremely unusual defense. It was an aura gauntlet, which meant one thing, Mord had reached master level. Mord glared at his opponent getting ready to strike. A powerful punch scattered the two in one fell swoop. Mord approached the swordsman sharply in flight, preparing to strike again. A blow of monstrous force hit the swordsman in the face with his fist sending him into a knockout. The swordsman flew through the forest clearing kicking up walls of dust. He slammed his back against the huge trunk of a charred tree with all his might. The swordsman fell to all fours next to his sword stuck in the ground, breathing heavily. Mord began to approach the frightened warrior saying he knew who he was. He remembered that it was a top grade baron warrior. Mord smirked, answering Baron's question of how he knew him, that he had seen the warrior more than once, once at the Archduke's training and once at a ball, that he remembered the warrior because of his short stature and asked around about him. As it turned out, Mord learned quite a bit from rank to magic skills. I also learned that Baron, despite his appearance, had a bad temper and that it was best not to mess with him. Baron asked who told the man this nonsense, to which Mord offered to exchange information. Mord pondered in the rumor that he was a loyal warrior of the Archduke, which meant they had been sent to eliminate the young man. But he also mentioned that those were the first to attack him. It was because of the fetus that Mord clarified, remembering from the manga that the Archduke was described as a tyrant, that he committed a terrible sin by killing his own son. Baron was greatly shocked by Mord's knowledge, stammering. He only asked the scowling Mord how the man knew about the fruit. According to Mord's memories in the manga, the Archduke didn't just commit a horrifying sin, he demonstrated his affinity for martial arts from childhood. But as the Archduke grew older, he became physically weaker, which undermined the talented warrior. At that moment, the Archduke was visited by a secret community of Silver Blood, who suggested a way for him to regain his youth in exchange for help. It was the eating of one's offspring. As it turned out, there was a tree of darkness that only appeared thanks to the sinister blood of an ancient deity. The tree needed careful care, it needed to be watered with the blood of the descendants of the god of duels, Vernars, in order to produce the youth-giving fruits, the most effective being the awakened new blood. So the Archduke sacrificed all illegitimate children. The only one he left alive was Morda, because the Archduke needed a powerful army and someone who could replace him. This did not imply passing the duchy to the next ruler. For 500 years ago, when the god of duels left the pedestal of the best fighter, assigned his descendants one duty and that was to guard the sealed demon king that could harness the power of other gods. The protector was obliged once a year to fight with the incarnation of the demon king face to face. The fight did not take place in reality, so did not threaten death in case of defeat. But if the power of the seal would weaken, then the right to fight with the incarnation of the demon king would also disappear. This equated to the loss of the throne, which is why the Archduke needed a shadow to fulfill that role in his stead. During a meal of fruit, the Archduke was approached by one of his subordinates offering to meet with Mord before his departure, to which the old man replied in the negative. The Archduke stood with his torso bare, gazing at the fruit, pondering his brother Ildan's scheme, thinking as if something was up if the latter had hired Mord. The old man also repeatedly notes that Ildan too often summoned Mord to his mansion and forced the young man to train daily, realizing that he had big plans for his illegitimate son and then sends him on a secret mission of the Order of Guardians all alone without any protection. Afterwards, the Archduke realized that all these thoughts no longer made any sense. The Archduke looked at the glowing fruit, saying he wished the young man would swear allegiance to him, but the one could not be controlled. The old man bit off part of the fruit, thinking it would be best to eat Mord before it grew to confront him. The old man was enveloped by the momentum developing his snow-white strands. The Archduke ordered Baron to bring Mord to him at any cost that the resources the latter had were unlimited. Just like that, the old man implored his warrior to be careful so that Count Kesser wouldn't suspect or even guess anything. The Archduke's garden can only be visited by those whom the old man himself has personally let in, the most loyal and close ones with whom he can share his dark power. Despite being one of Archduke Werner's closest men, 
Kesser was unaware of the ruler's sinister secret, following him blindly. Baron smirked, realizing that this was a wonderful opportunity for him to prove to the Archduke what he was capable of and show how much better he was than Kesser. He accepted the old man's orders. When Baron heard Mord's question, he was shocked to realize that the secret was somehow known to the young man. Mord looked at the helpless foe still in the same form of new blood. The last few years, if the manga is to be believed, there have been cases of Archduke Werner's illegitimate children disappearing, which means he's already in cahoots with the Silverblood, and now that he's learned that Mord can't be loyal to him, he probably wants to get rid of Mord. Mord said he understood the old fart's motives, and that he wanted to rejuvenate himself at his expense. But the warrior was angry at the young man's words, and Barney asked him to shut his filthy mouth. Mord shut his opponent up, saying he would reveal to him the secret of the future since he would kill the warrior anyway. Mord revealed the secret that his father Hardin would fall a miserable death, and all would remember his shame, for he would do his best for it. The warrior kept snapping back, calling the Archduke the strongest, and that he would not fall at the hands of a puppy. Baron watched Mord's face nervously, wondering if he really had a confident face for so long that the warrior doubted his lord's invincibility. He noticed that Mord's powers were much greater than they had been a month ago and he was learning them too quickly, beginning to think that in a few years he could be much stronger for Hardin. The warrior wasn't going to let that happen, and so decided to engage in a deadly duel. The mage uses the most powerful blade aura spell about to strike such a powerful opponent. Baron realized that now it would be a battle of equals, and only the winner whose aura was stronger would be able to come out alive from the fight. There was blind rage on the warrior's face and he was ready for a deadly fight. He jumped at Mord with his sword surrounded by an aura, shouting for Mord to die. Guy stood recognizing the warrior's loyalty to the Archduke, but also stated that he was unable to defeat Mord. Baron turned his attention to the four orbs flying in his direction. An explosion of enormous size formed in front of Mord. The charred Baron reasoned how it was that Mord had reached such heights not long ago without knowing how to control the new blood. Mord only uttered a final goodbye to the burned Baron, preparing the final blow by calling him Hardin's dog. The Mord pierced the warrior's head, wiping him to dust. A mysterious masked mage watched all this, wondering what kind of monster was in front of him. The cultist also notes that the young man knows about the secret of the Silver Blood and can clearly harm the cult. The cultist rushed off, going to inform the leaders of what had happened and of the young man's knowledge. On the trail, Mord stabs his opponent through the heart with the power of new blood. The guy noticed there was silver blood on his hand. Mord returned to his previous form looking at his palm, realizing that the cultist was a silver blood member. The young man realized that if the cult got wind of the failed assassination attempt, he could be in trouble. He clenched his hand into a fist, knowing that he shouldn't worry so much because he could just smash them all into the wall, but he had more important things to do. Mord stabbed sharply into the void hearing someone's wheeze. Guy stated to the unseen watcher that he had noticed that one following him from the castle itself, and it was worth showing himself. He stood silently waiting for a response from the stranger. Mord began beating the invisible man with simple blows, causing him to ask the young man to stop. The slowly forming silhouette called the guy a brute for starting a fight without even listening. Mord was surprised to notice the stranger's distinctive feature, which were pointed ears. Mord remembered the elves, symbols of longevity, the same ones grew slowly and aged a long time. But Mord could also see that the elf's ears were shorter than other members of the race, suggesting that he was a half-breed. The young man asked the elf who he was. The elf replied, introducing himself as Kyle, a member of the Guardian squad. Mord understood that the one was part of General Ildan's personal squad. Kale reasoned that there were about five people in the squad of guards who were in charge of white magic in the north of the white demon realm. Their purpose was to resist black magic so they were always accompanied by squads of Vernar's guards. The main task of the Shadow Wolf squad was to escort allies and eliminate enemies, because unlike other Guardian squads, they had an exceptional ability. They knew how to hide from the gaze of others, so they were perfectly suited for any task. The Half-Elf thought that his abilities were far superior to the others even in the Shadow Wolf squad, so he was alarmed at how Mord could detect him, because he didn't even emit any aura. Kyle covered his hand in shame, saying that Commander Ildan had sent him here to protect and escort Mord. It seemed like a good idea for him to watch first and then jump to the young man's aid in case of danger. The half-elf was afraid to fight his enemies, worried that Mord might mistake him for an opponent in battle, especially when he saw the monstrous power Mord had asked him to prove his words. Kyle only held out the torn jeweled bracelet, showing Mord, mauling it, according to Ildan's words, it was supposed to serve as proof of the truth of the words. Kale asked what the symbol was, 
to which Mord simply replied that it was Sir Ildan's torn bracelet, which he had torn during training because he had taken off his jewelry before sparring. The half-elf was shocked that he was holding the general's jewel, but Mord finished Kyle off by telling him to go back to the general. Mord said that he didn't need a burden to sit in ambush and watch silently. Kale said that was the general's order, but Mord said that he had no order to carry him around in return because he had failed in his mission without starting. The half-elf fretted in a shaky voice trying to explain but couldn't find the right words, drowning in his own thoughts that he couldn't go back to the general with failure. Kale had promised to pay all of Mord's expenses during the trip, which clearly made the man turn around. The half-elf began to talk about his portfolio, offering to be on duty when he slept, and that he would take care of the master's chores, even cooking almost being recruited as a servant. Mord saw the extremes to which the elf was going, so he began to contemplate the idea of taking him along, but suddenly he remembered Kale's name. He remembered Kale's story, where the elf father had disowned his half-blood son, abandoning him, and when the poor man was on the brink of life and death, he had been rescued by Ildan, after which he had sworn allegiance to the general. He also remembered that during the battle between Aiden's minions and Ildan, the half-elf displayed his stealth and spirit summoning abilities on the battlefield, showing his outstanding skills. Mord realized that although young in appearance, he was an accomplished assassin, which clearly played into the decision to take Kale with him. Kale begged on his knees for Mord to take him with him, but Mord continued to reason, also realizing that there were silver blood cult attacks ahead of him and a capable partner would only be a good thing. Mord agreed to take that one with him. Kale's face lit up with joy from the disbelief even clarified, or if it was true. Mord ordered Kale away as his first task, which clearly put him in a stupor. The lad explained to the half-elf that it was imperative to cover the traces of the battle so that they could not be traced, especially that it was part of an assassin's usual duties, Kale agreed, but didn't understand how he would have time. Mord reassured the one, saying he believed in the half-elf and wanted to make sure of his skills. Some time later, a scout was reporting back to the Archduke's castle that he had discovered the battlefield but found no bodies, assuming Baron had been attacked. Hardin had not expected that Ildan had sent bodyguards with Mord, assuming that they were rather secretive. But the scout assumed that they were members of the Shadow Wolves, and probably more than one man, so he simply waited for the Archduke's order to proceed. Hardin ordered Mord to leave Mord alone, only watching his movements, to which the scout clarified, or it would be enough. The old man surmised that the Silverblood cult might get involved this time, and they were sure to be hurt by the young man. Rumor had it that the cult was quite vindictive. The Archduke hoped they could handle Mord on their own, and not even have to get their hands dirty. Kale was impressed with the find in front of them. He asked Mord if he was looking for this particular stone, to which he replied positively, and the half-elf assured him that it would take him about five days to find such a thing. The half-elf clarified Mord's further intentions, and sat down, leaning against a tree, intending to wait for nightfall. Mord had ordered Kale to go on duty for the time being to make sure no outsiders came in, but in return the half-elf wished to know the reason why, but it was already too late to ask questions, Mord had fallen asleep so quickly. Kale cried at such callousness for not explaining anything. The half-elf realized that the boy was taciturn, but hoped for a chance to communicate normally with the young man. The elf stoked the fire in the millstone, thinking about how he had gotten to this point. He frowned as he warmed himself by the fire, musing about his high position and the respect not only of the Shadow Wolves, but also of the castle itself. Realizing that he was being commanded by a middle-ranked young man and forced to serve himself, Kale felt ashamed, covering his face with his palms as he realized how pathetic it was. He let a tear fall, patting himself lightly on the cheeks, reassuring himself that he was doing it all for the sake of duty, only not understanding why, of all people, he had been sent to such a terrible man, as he suddenly heard his name from Mord. Kael nervously raised his hands, excusing himself that he wasn't talking about Morda, as the young man swept up what had started. The half-elf turned around, asking what exactly had started, and then realized after seeing the strange glow. This stone was the entrance to the dungeon. Mord reasoned that in the manga there were hidden dungeons that were only awakened when certain conditions were met. In this case, there were three. The first condition was when the moon reaches a certain density to shine through the clouds. The second condition was to have cloudless weather so that the moonlight would illuminate the ground. The third condition was to have a person who had inherited divine blood within five meters of the monolith. Mord knew the whole story, and therefore could easily locate this dungeon, but it would be much more difficult with others. Mord knew that this place was of little value, but it was still an important piece of the world to him. 
so he ordered Kyle to stay outside on guard while he went into the dungeon. Kale, on the other hand, worried about Morda asking if he really intended to go into the unknown dungeon alone. Mord assured him not to worry, because he knew what was waiting for him inside, and ordered the half-elf to guard the entrance, and if anyone tried to get inside, to stop him, and also warned him not to go inside, because if he did, he would never be able to go on missions with him again. Kale didn't hear the last part as Mord trailed off. Mord stepped inside the dungeon through a glowing portal. Kale, on the other hand, simply stood silently watching the monolith over which the portal to the dungeon glowed. Mord fell into the Temple of the Moon, where gods were worshipped in ancient times. But the names of those gods have been lost to time, as has the location of the temple. There were many gods in ancient times, but there were few left until these days according to Mord. So it didn't seem strange that the names of the ancient gods had been forgotten. The skeletons were heading towards Mord in droves shouting about the invasion and the coming of the unclean into their temple. These skeletons were once souls, and Mord realized that after dying in battle against another deity, those were left in eternal service to their deity in the form of souls and bones. Mord entered the battle, noticing that there were over a hundred fallen warriors, and they were not slowing down the pace of the onslaught. The young man knew that the number of skeletons didn't matter. All that mattered was that we had to hurry before the portal closed. Upon Mord's reflection, ghosts were dangerous creatures that couldn't be defeated simply like that. But in this world, it was possible. He threw strikes, scattering his opponents into bones, knowing that his weapon against them was magic. Mord also emphasized that even though he can defeat them, they are no less dangerous because in the past, these ghosts were warriors and have power. He charged the pulse ball with his aura for a massive attack. A huge golden flash illuminated the center of the altar emitting blue sparks. Mord was also very strong and could overpower any opponent. The young man kneaded his hand reasoning that the ghosts were finished, realizing that only the dungeon guards remained. Mord saw a huge statue of a werewolf girl, thinking that the core of the dungeon must be there. He notices a silhouette sitting on the floor, assuming the stranger was a guard. Mord was met by a werewolf, asking what kind of fowl had infiltrated the sacred site. The lycanthrope intended to kill the young man by sacrificing him to the moon goddess. Mord thought for a moment, remembering the plot, assuming that this werewolf was a rather powerful guardian. The young man made associations with Aiden's battle with the group, against the lycanthrope, which was very difficult for a hero of high skill in magic, because the guards had protection from magic because of the patronage of the moon goddess. Mord was not a mage and therefore had nothing to worry about. Werewolf craned his neck, noting that the uninvited guest had come all alone. He was loath to recognize Mord as a warrior, but still the man called for reinforcements. The wolves surrounded the young warrior with the werewolf, forming a ring. Werewolf on the other hand wanted to hold a reception, as was proper for warriors, Mord clarified, or he wanted to duel with him. Werewolf, on the other hand, said that he honored the warrior code and it was a sacred thing, so the reception should be proper for a warrior. But in the manga, it was different, maybe it was because Mord came alone. The boy said that he agreed to the offer, and that he would be more comfortable fighting face to face than with the whole group at once, clearly not intending to waste valuable time. But the werewolf wondered what was meant by the expression waste time. According to the story, Mord remembered that each time a guard died at Aiden's hands, he resurrected him, changing form three times until he finally left the world. He strategized around this story, wanting to wait for the third form to defeat him. Mord also ordered the werewolf to give his best effort and to stay down if he defeated him. Werewolf was outraged at such rudeness, he shouted to the young man, or whether he had the right to speak to him in such tones. Mord replied, of course, reincarnating into a new blood form. He stood before them charged with impulses asking, was he still obliged to prove his right to them? Werewolf notices Mord's unprecedented magical power, assuming that divine blood flows in the young man, recognizing the fact that Mord has the right to behave this way. The werewolf agreed to change his form to his final form, but in return asked Mord not to regret his choice. Mord notices that the werewolf is absorbing the power of the comrade standing next to him. He also noticed that the werewolf was much larger than before due to the strength of his allies. The young man cut short his musings, starting to move at the speed of light, declaring that he would put an end to the monster with a single blow. A powerful full-speed kick came at the werewolf's block, which also used the momentum. Mord saw the werewolf's glow and that grin, realizing that the monster's aura showed affiliation with an army serving a god, not even suggesting that the werewolf was capable of fending off Mord's aura gauntlet. Only the guy wasn't discouraged by the realization that he was durable and not immortal charging the aura gauntlet with impulses. 
Mord began throwing erratic blows at the werewolf's defenses that rained down in a hail on the monster's aura. The young man managed to break through the monster's defenses, and a couple of punches started flying towards werewolf. The werewolf recoiled, wiping his cheekbones, reasoning that the divine blood was making itself known. Mord didn't give his opponent even a second to rest, striking again with a gloved aura charged with momentum. The werewolf sharply dodged the Mord's so powerful attack that went over his back. After which, the werewolf delivered a powerful punch to the opponent's abs with a blue aura. The werewolf noticed he was hit, but to no avail. The werewolf couldn't believe that his powerful punch with aura could absorb the young man with just his muscles alone. Not believing it, Mord placed his hand on the werewolf's trembling paw, noticing that after his third conversion, he had the ability to move quickly, which obviously seemed miraculous to the young man. But the werewolf wondered where the young man got such power from. Mord held his opponent by the paw, noticing that just being fast for victory wouldn't be enough. Mord sent the werewolf flying with a single punch with a quick swing. The guy jumped up off the ground with a clatter kicking up dust. Mord makes a dash for his opponent's direction. He flew onto the arm of the moon goddess statue while the werewolf was in free fall. The young man jumped off his hand swooping down on top of the behemoth, charging his leg with momentum for a kick. The werewolf was unconscious when Mord already knew that this blow would finish off his opponent. The young man used his thunderclap ability, hitting his opponent with a powerful pulse discharge using his foot. Mord landed on the ground, looking at the werewolf's body with a huge hole in his chest, realizing he was finished, and the young man didn't even have to use artifacts, the blessing of two souls and the world shard. Mord fluttered his form, wondering why the werewolf was smiling at the end. The wolf heard someone's admiration. The young man turned around looking in the direction of the voice. That was the statue of the moon goddess speaking thanking the warrior for sending her guardian soul to an honorable rest. Mord noticed that the statue spoke, but that wasn't in the story. The young man asked what kind of honorable rest he was talking about as the werewolf spirit spoke to him, explaining that he wanted to die honorably, but had been stabbed in the back by a sneaking enemy. The werewolf also noted that after his death, as a sign of defeat, he had become the guardian of the dungeon where Mord had granted werewolf forgiveness by fighting a fair duel. The boy remembered something similar in the story, and that Aiden, being a mage of dark power, had no right to duel with him. The statue of the moon goddess wanted to thank Mord for fighting her guardian, but she couldn't give much because she herself was a part of the dead god, so she gave him the bracelet. The moon goddess had swept that if he filled this moon bracelet with the light of the moon, he would be able to protect whomever he wished at any given time. Mord wore the bracelet thinking it was a nice reward that in history, Aiden had never been able to get his hands on. Mord didn't have time to thank the goddess before her energy from the statue vanished. The young man jumped on the pedestal intending to follow through. He delivered a powerful blow to the statue forming cracks. The young man's eyes glazed over at the sight of the fragment of the world he had finally found. In front of him stood a huge crystal emitting mana and a pleasant azure glow. Meanwhile, at the entrance to the dungeon, elf spirits were flying around patrolling the area. It was already dawning as Mord walked in Kyle's direction. The half-elf sitting on a rock asked, or he was done, the young man confirmed. Mord smiled seeing the half-elf keep his promises keeping watch over the entrance to the dungeon. The young man liked Kale's obedience, but the half-elf sighed sadly. Kale jumped off the rock, asking or Mord had done all that was necessary, to which Mord replied about the prospect of traveling further afield to other towns and villages. Kale clarified how it could be far away where exactly they were going, to which the young man replied that there was no specific destination and for now they would have to go through the nooks and crannies of the Ruthvon kingdom. The action takes place in the industrial town of Olishin. Kale strolled with Mord through the market square of Olishin, the half-elf throwing a tantrum from the fatigue of the long journey that had lasted twenty days. But thinking about rest, the young man reflected that he had already acquired two fragments of the world in such a short time. After the previous dungeon, Mord managed to clear one more dungeon. But despite the fight with Vampire Jack, he didn't get any additional reward but he was satisfied with the fact that he found a relic full of divine power and another fragment of the world. Mord thought about it, planning to go to the black market in Olishin and look for the special thing and also look in the secret place before Aiden did. Mord settled down on the bunk telling Kale that they could rest for now until nightfall. Kale asked Mord's permission to go somewhere alone. The half-elf, like a father's child, begged Mord to let him go for a while. Mord lay back against the half-elf explaining that he would wait for him after sunset and that he was going to report the situation to Ildan, to which Kale nervously began to try to justify himself. 
but Mord cut the poor man off at the half-word that he was not worried about it, that he would not take him with him if it mattered to the young man. Kale, on the other hand, noted that Mord was right, but he'd still need to go somewhere to resupply. The half-elf cried that six meals a day, and the young man's dreadful rest had emptied Kale's purse. Kale went to the door clarifying, or they had agreed, and Mord replied that he would be here until nothing happened, but the half-elf assured that nothing would happen to Mord. After a while, Kale returned to the burning tavern seeing the destruction and many wounded. Kale cried, thinking that he had guessed that something like this would happen. Fragments of the world. These are puzzles of the ideal world that the gods used at creation, as well as each fragment contained its own element. In some fragments there were fire spirits dancing on lava. In others the searing desert sands in these fragments are like a jigsaw puzzle. Consciousness projects a better world based on the existing one. So the puzzles are assembled in a certain sequence forming an ideal world from the parts of the past. Mord is trained inside the fragments, as time flows differently there than in reality. The first fragment was a huge mountain towering to the heavens. The second fragment formed a dense forest. Unfortunately Mord of the second fragment didn't really fit the first fragment so the worlds didn't connect. But he was surely interested in studying these fragments. Mord sensed that something had happened in the real world. An explosion sounded in the tavern drawing the attention of gawkers. The girl screamed outside that her baby was inside, but three men held her back from letting her inside the fire, forbidding her to enter. She was sobbing, screaming in pain and worry for the baby as suddenly a Mord jumped out of a window full of flames holding a small child. The girl hugged her son thanking Mord for saving her Terchik. Mord paid no attention to the girl's gratitude looking away. Che's men conducted a slow evacuation escorting the wounded to the healer. The son kneeling by his father's dying body, sobbing. Mord clenched his teeth in anger, thinking why innocent people were getting hurt. The young man noticed the stranger running away quickly. This mage by feel is most likely what caused the tavern to explode. Mord lifted the larger stone in his hand, not knowing if anyone was one. Being furious, he was not going to let go of the culprit, crushing the stone tightly in his hand, wanting to punish them. The assassin tried to escape by jumping from rooftop to rooftop. Mord was rapidly catching up with the fleeing man, making the failed assassin anxious. The boy threw a lightning-fast punch which the assassin dodged. Thoth did a somersault breaking, glaring at the young man. The assassin asked Mord who he was, but the young man explained that he didn't need to know. Mord was going to kill the criminal anyway, blazing with anger. The killer said he didn't know who sent the boy, but he couldn't handle him. Mord found himself behind the assassin's back preparing to strike. A powerful blow sent the unknown man flying, crumbling the walls. Mord approached the coughing foe. The assassin was terrified looking at Mord preparing to die. The other says that you should not underestimate the magician, because if you corner him, something terrible will happen. Mord turned around looking at the assassin, ignoring the other's words to run away from him. The huge-sized man thanked his co-worker for taking the time to reincarnate. The big man started to say something about the great man's strength, but Mord cut the remark short. He struck a powerful blow demolishing his opponent's head. Mord ordered the other to come down to him in a rage. The guy was terrified, realizing that he couldn't stand up to the young man and it was time to do the legwork. Mord stalks his opponent with a running back kick. The one collapsed with a crash into the wall, forming puffs of dust. Mord stoically approached the man, ordering the man on his knees to answer his questions. Mord looked at the poor man with an arrogant look, realizing that it would be better to force him to speak. Kyle grabbed the victim from behind, the same in turn grunting that he couldn't breathe. That one's pupils turned white and his gaze narrowed with unconsciousness. But Kyle let go of the one who was greedily gulping air when Mord spoke. The two of them stood over their victim, explaining that he could only speak in response to their words. Mord warned his victim menacingly. If he opened his mouth without answering their question, he would be in a lot of trouble. Kale and Mord asked him why someone was chasing him, but he only remained stubbornly silent. Kale assumed he was the assassin from the second coming of the Lord, to which the captive looked anxiously at his two torturers. The assassin wanted to ask about how he knew about it, but then Mord hit him for opening his mouth for no good reason. Kale wondered what kind of people these people were, and what they did. The captive explained that there were once people who wanted to resurrect Lord Akritsi. Kyle and Mord were very much surprised. The captor continued with the story that there are certain criteria by which a mage's name is determined. There are different levels of circles, but the one who reached the ninth was called a mage of the highest level. Akrichi was able to get that rank when he turned himself into an undead, and he got the title of Lord because he was able to gain power over the undead army. If he disappears, Akrichi has prepared a secret way to resurrect him. He divided his soul into several pieces and sealed them. If you collect all the pieces of his soul, you can resurrect him. 
It looks like the people from the second coming of the Lord Squad were searching for these parts. Mord looked at the captive and said he did not know him, and asked him if he was a member of another secret squad that argued with those seeking some relic, to which the captive countered that his squad was not second-rate, and certainly not that immoral. Mord questioned once more. What kind of squad were they then? He guessed that he was from the Vernars family because of his aura control, and if Mord told the prisoner that he was from the Vernars, the Duke would make him his enemy. The protagonist took a swing at the criminal, and the latter, terrified, called out the squad's name, Grammold. Mord asked what kind of unit they were, to which the captive replied that they were created to thwart the three predictions of collapse that exist in this world. One of them is the second coming of the Lord. Once they show their power, they can turn a whole country upside down. They worship Lord Akrichi, who is like a deity to them. If Akrichi is resurrected, the world will end. According to the story, Akrichi was able to resurrect, but immediately fell into the hands of one of Aiden's men. But for the end of the world, there's no point in hearing about the other two reasons, the protagonist thought, because they're probably some minor annoyances. Mord asked why the killer was being chased, to which the man replied that his squad had stolen something important from them. The protagonist asked if the key in his hand was the reason they were chasing him or not. The captive replied that it was, because it was the key to the door that led to the dungeon where the remains of Lord Akrichi were kept. Mord wondered, for there was no mention of Gramold or the key in the story. The captive wanted to snatch the key from Kale, but he moved it away with a deft movement. The Lord's resurrection was around the second half of the story. He was captured by Aiden's men, but before that he managed to kill several thousand people. For the sake of preventing these casualties, the second coming of the Lord unit must be destroyed. Mord said he would take that key for himself and the prisoner could go. Kyle looked at the protagonist worriedly because his actions were strange to him. Kale asked Mord if it was okay to let him go so easily, to which he replied that it was a weak squad anyway, and they had nothing to worry about. Kale asked the protagonist if he would leave the second coming of the Lord as unpunished, to which the latter replied that he was going to destroy the soul fragments to prevent a creature from resurrecting, and he would start with the remains, for there might be soul particles there. Kale asked if he would go there at once. Mord replied that he would first go to the black market to buy something. At the black market, Mord buy an old dagger and a book for a low price. Kale was wondering where he was going to use it all, since you couldn't even cut meat with a dagger like that. They stood at the door to the dungeon, Mord's companion nearly vomiting from the garbage odor. Is this really where a creature's remains are? There is a secret passage at the bottom, Kale asked in surprise. At the bottom, did he mean the bottom of the ditch? Was he not going to go in there? Mord replied that he was, to which Kale shouted that he didn't want to go there. You can find the shards with spirit summoning, to which Kale replied that he is a summoner of wind, not water. There were spirits hovering in the air in front of the heroes. Kale noticed the peculiar spirit. He shouted happily that he had found it, to which Mord muttered that he first resented it, and then did anyway, perhaps because he was military? They found the entrance! This iron door was locked by magic, and they wanted to open it with a key to which Mord replied that the very rusty dagger would suffice. Kale gave him a strange look, asking if he really wanted to open the door with that rusty iron. Mord stabbed Kale's arm, to which he asked indignantly, What's he up to? The main character explained that there was a war between the deities back in the day, in which one warrior god lost everything he had to another god using magic. So the warrior god sacrificed himself and created this dagger. This is a divine relic that can only be awakened by someone with divine blood. It also acts as a key, and the technology of this relic is simple. It opens the magic field and destroys magic. Mord hurled the dagger at the door with all his might, because of which the magical barrier protecting this door broke down and the door opened. Mord returned the dagger to his hands. Kale was shocked and said that if the seller found out he'd sold it for a penny, he wouldn't be able to sleep, to which Mord countered that the black market was full of such things. Mord said it was time to fulfill Kale's wish, to which he asked in surprise. Mord reminded him of his wish that he would take Kale with him when he went to a secret dungeon. Not some demonic dungeon that he was sick of, but one that was full of adventure, ancient treasures, and unknown monsters. Mord said that when he had destroyed everyone below, that the very secret dungeon he had longed to enter awaited him. Kale wondered how only they could create such a huge secret space. He asked if the second coming of the Lord unit was here. What better way for them to attack them suddenly? to which Mord replied that it wouldn't be necessary because they had already realized that the heroes were already here. 
and it won't be long before they come to attack them. A horde of ghouls fell upon the heroes. A squad of wanderers asked how the heroes got to the secret dungeon. It turned out to be the second coming of the Lord squad. Mord has thrown himself into the fray with a detachment. He scattered them thanks to his incredible strength. The enemy squad was shocked that Mord had aura gloves, meaning he possesses the rank of master. The mage from the enemy squad ordered to stop the heroes at all costs, and he's for now. He wanted to say he'd handle it, but Kale had already scattered them. At this time, Kale used the power of the spirits to deal with the enemy unit. The mage was confused. He ordered the squad to stop them, but only to see that his allies were scattered on different sides. At this time, Kale stood behind him and scattered the squad. The mage lay on the floor and shouted that the hero's power was monstrous. But Kale had already stuck his sword in his back, saying that they were doing pretty good after all, but they weren't even close to Mord. Kale shouted to Mord that he thought he had found the entrance. He figured he was right, but before they did, they needed to destroy the dangerous items first. Anything with dark magic could be dangerous. They put all the items away and Kale asked if it was time to use the key that had been taken from the assassin. Mord said that this was where the real dungeon began and that the key would fit here. He inserted the key into the door chink and turned the lock. As they opened the door, they saw a terrifying aura in front of them. Mord said that Akrichi had created it with the help of demons, but it had nothing to do with their world. They wondered if it looked the same on the inside. The book didn't give any details about this dungeon, and Mord only remembers that it led deep down to a structure that was like a nine-story building and the deeper you go down, the stronger the undead were. The dungeon wasn't easy, it took less than ten minutes to get there. Kale sparkled with happiness and said that there were many good magic items in the dungeon and with them, one could not worry about anything for a few more months. The heroes were surprised, for in front of them was Lord Akrichi himself. The Lord asked if they were invaders. He was surprised that he had not seen living people for a long time. Kale guessed just from his aura alone that he was very strong. But Mord immediately encouraged him not to be afraid, after all. It was just a soul fragment that was much weaker than the main body, and its strength was roughly at the level of a rank 1 mage. The Lord asked if they knew him, to which he was told that they knew the mage Krex, formerly called Lord Akrichi. The Lord was delighted that the uninvited guests had heard of him. Mord replied that he didn't know much, but they didn't necessarily need to know much about him. The Lord asked why he thought so. He replied that he was only a part of an already dead creature, and more, that it will continue to be so. Lord Akrichi saw that he had the divine power of Vernars. He said that they were all very arrogant, but all died by his hand. He aimed a magic beam at the heroes. Lord Akrichi said that Mord is just a remnant of a deity on Earth, and promised to show him real magical power. Mord gathered all his strength into a fist and struck the ice golems. Akrichi wasn't surprised, for he knew it would be too easy a task for Vernars. Mord at this time was already preparing to strike the Lord. He kicked him in the face with all his might, but he used a defense spell. Kale, meanwhile, attacked the Lord from behind with wind spirits. Akrichi was annoyed because to him, a wind spirit attack was just a nasty, empty attack. A dagger flew into the Lord. He didn't expect such an attack. Mord realized that Akrichi was made up of dark magic from head to toe, which meant that the effect on him from the electroshock would be fatal outcome. At that moment, the skeleton's body was struck by lightning. Leech went to his knees. He didn't think it would turn out like this. Underestimating the enemy was a fatal outcome. Mord praised Kale, for his support made the battle quite easy. Kale thought that the dagger was unusual, and that it had broken the mage's spell in no time. Mord argued that if he had used a more powerful spell, the dagger would have failed. But he had relied only on ordinary magic, and so he was easily defeated. They shattered the Lord's core. Just like the book said, this entrance turned into a fake room. Kale was in panic shock because he discovered that all of his trophies were gone. He mumbled pitifully to Mord that he knew it would be like this. But he didn't understand his question. Kale said it was kind of strange, since no one had entered the dungeon in 200 years. But there were too many intelligent undead here. But he thought it was all chaos. A dream of chaos. This is the space that has been created between reality and dream, which means that everything here is an illusion. It's like a virtual world where everything that happens becomes real, but trophies and other things then disappear. Mord thought about Kyle's words. 200 years of confinement in an abandoned dungeon should have impaired their judgment. But if the Lich was an illusion then that was another matter. Mord told Kale that he knew nothing of all this. He had no intention of deceiving his companion, to which the latter pitifully agreed. The protagonist agreed to give his companion another reward, to which the latter looked at him cheerfully. 
In return, he asked that nothing more be asked or resented about the award. Meanwhile, he was gathering all his strength into a fist. They fell out to the next underground floor. Heroes lands a nice shot to the body. Mord originally knew that this place was a secret space that could be reached by solving the riddles of the false room. Kale was surprised. The protagonist knew the location, so they didn't have to bother with extra stress. Kale was ecstatic at what he saw. He assumed the items in front of him were quite expensive. He realized that this was the very real treasure room. Kale asked Mord, what kind of bag was this? After all, it seemed ordinary at first glance, but it was actually a bag with subspace. It could fit five rooms like this. And also the owner could easily find the item he put in it. Mord threw something into Kale's hands. This is a thunder ring. It is charged with the magic power of the host and allows you to use thunder magic. It holds magic up to sixth circle. The thunder ring allows the wearer to apply powerful thunder defense magic. Kyle was delighted with such an expensive item. Mord was in amazement that Kyle could be placated even by such a small thing. He asked the protagonist how the other items in the room were used. For example, the necklace has the power of protection to prevent the invasion of foreign magic and also allows you to recognize hidden magic. The key and the map can lead to the Lord's hidden fragment. Kale asked Mord how many of the Lord's fragments there really were, to which he replied that there were seven. He was going to prevent the Lord from being resurrected, and the seven pieces were also world fragments. Mord said that the skull was the fragment of Lord Akrichi. It is what contains the remnants of his mind that fought them. You can destroy the fragment by smashing his skull. As the story goes, Aiden's supporters didn't know this, so they mistook it for jewelry, resulting in Akrichi being able to fully resurrect. But this time, he couldn't let that happen. A man stood near the tree, plucking an apple. He plucked the last fruit from the tree. He asked his partner if they could bury Mord here, to which the latter asked, wasn't it already determined that Silver Blood had intervened? There are many communities in the world, but one that is more than 500 years old is rare. At that time, the Age of Gods ended and the Age of Mortals began. However, the Silver Bloods have roots much further back, which is why they are the community of the Mage Ruling the World story, in which many members possess divine blood. And after all, last time, many had died despite having Baron, who possessed the rank of Master, with them. It had hurt the Silver Bloods' pride. Two men stood near the broken floor, wondering who had done it and what they were doing there. These tracks had been left a few days ago, so finding along the trail would be easy, and that pleased them. The swordsman was glad that the end of the protagonist would soon come, for he was the reason he was having a hard time. He promised to show him the true hell. Kale asked what had happened. Had Mord decided to surrender? He replied that it would not work that way, that they were wasting time. The story he was reading, there were some gaps in it. There were many places where some events were briefly mentioned. He remembered the content well, but he can't get past a place like the dungeon. The deadline to fulfill the promise to Ildan is eight months. The deadline was already pressing, so do not limit yourself to the route. It is better to decide what is already known for sure. In that case, they need to set out to rescue the cursed witch. After the protagonist frees her from the curse, he will be able to get one ancient sword, Kyle asked. It was a heavenly sword after all. And how did he know all this? Mord replied that he had an excellent source of information. Kyle asked who the source was, to which Mord replied that he would only tell him. He replied that with the help of the divine power within him, he was able to see the prophecy in which the fate of this world was written. Kale looked at him suspiciously in response. Mord did not expect him to believe him, for there was not a single person willing to hear the truth from him. However, he would like to meet the one someday that he can see everything to. After a few days, they reached a mountainous area in the southeast of Ruthvan. The area was chilly, probably because of the witch. Kale asked Mord if the fog was caused by magic. Mord replied that it was a magic spell and they would soon lose their bearings. There are rumors in the village that there is a witch living in the swamp, and it is a horrible creature that devours people who were lost in the mist. In the time of Kale's father and his grandfather, there were many people who went missing. Mord replied that the witch uses magic to cloud the mind and capture and then force her to do what she commands. Kale replied that he felt a force trying to influence the mind, but he had the ability to resist such influence. He wanted to reassure Mord that he wasn't in danger of that happening, but suddenly he disappeared from his sight. He didn't understand where the main character had gone. Is this fog also causing hallucinations? Kale felt a sudden urge to sleep sharply. He couldn't move his arms and legs. Mord stood behind him and sensed that something was amiss with his comrade. 
he placed a wolf goddess bracelet on Kale's arm that was filled with moonlight. The protagonist has cast a spell that is supposed to protect him from evil influences. Moonlight streamed from the bracelet through the fog. Kale saw everything that was happening near him in an instant. He realized now that this was the witch's way of luring and trapping people into her trap. But Mord answered that it was not so. She helps them get out of this fog as safely as possible. Kyle was puzzled, and also instills in the mind the realization that it is dangerous to approach him. Kale wondered why a witch would do such a noble thing. Mord replied that cursing and malice were very different things. After all, in addition to monsters, there's also the risk of finding a healing herb and dying from its magical effects. People disappear in places like this quite often. It's strange that there haven't been any such cases in the last five years. Kale reflected that this witch wasn't the kind of monster that devoured people. She was a beauty in the Ilderba tribe. Her beauty intoxicated not only her own, but also representatives of neighboring tribes. Among them was a foreigner from the Divine Tribe. He confessed his feelings to the beauty, but she refused him. And that was the beginning of disaster for this kid. He had very powerful abilities, and his clan was distinguished by power and strength among his kind, all the more so because he was of high blood. However, he broke the prohibition of his tribe and called the soul of the devil, because of which he fell into a real madness. For this, he was threatened with death at the hands of his own kin, so he hid in the forest, where he met a beautiful maiden. But suddenly the Ilderba tribe intervened to stop him, which made the young man even more angry and destroyed the entire tribe, whereupon the maiden found herself in his arms. At that moment, lightning broke out in the heavens, and the deity Marius appeared. The young man used too much of his power, which attracted the attention of the king of the divine tribe. Thereupon, he began to plead with him for pardon. Marius, having listened to the whole story to the end, gave the lad a punishment he must pay for breaking the ban. He will become an indestructible sword and a cup in which the demonic tribe will be sealed. And the maiden is guilty of encouraging the young man to commit a terrible sin, she will have to guard the souls of the demons until they are gone forever. And only then can she atone for her sin. This is why the witch is not a man-eating monster, and is nothing more than, is the victim of a demented deity. Mord screamed at the top of his voice. He had come to give her back her own name. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a strong stream of wind blew towards the protagonist. Kale didn't understand what the hell this was. Even if he summoned a wind spirit, it would dissipate quickly at this speed. He asked Mord what he was going to do. Mord had already gathered all his strength into his fist, and was preparing to strike in the wake of the raging wind. He hit the side of his opponent's power! The protagonist couldn't see well some silhouette in the fog, but he realized that there was a witch standing there somewhere. The road would only open for a moment. He would create a chain of explosions to quickly advance. Mord hit with a chain of explosions. He got into a fighting stance, preparing for something serious. He said it was time for the witch to wake up. Kyle didn't realize was the witch really standing in front of them? He was confused. Mord said that from the beginning there was no promise the witch had to keep. The protagonist was facing a monster with eyes in the shape of diamonds. It perceived him as an invader, as an enemy. Purple explosions flew towards the heroes! Kale was confused. He asked Mord what kind of attack it was, and asked if he had a plan for it. He answered without hesitation that he had a trump card up his sleeve. He suggested that he strike the monster a few blows first, and then wake the witch with the right words. Kyle didn't know what the hell Mord was talking about. The protagonist left Kale with the hope of getting by without him. He swiftly rushed to attack the behemoth. The monster was protected by a dark barrier that reflects magical attacks. The protagonist used the destruction of the mirage against him. Mord shouted to the witch the name of her clan, Ilderba, the clan that had given their lives fighting the god for her. She thought back to lying unconscious bleeding. Meanwhile, Mord strikes again. This time he prescribes a magic pendle for good encouragement. The monster was instantly emboldened by such a blow. He screamed furiously in pain. The protagonist called out the name of Calvis, who killed the witch's clan. The silhouette of the clan enemy was clearly outlined in her memories. Mord hits the monster with a full swing fist. He reminds her of Marius, Odeti who put a curse on Calvis and her for their sins. He reminded her that there was never a promise she had to keep. It was only the curse of Marius who had deceived her, which she was not to forget for the sake of her own kind, who had died innocent. Mord delivers the final blow that should awaken all of the witch's memories and bring her to her senses. The main character reminds her of her real name, Saidia. It's her real name, given to her by her parents at birth. The whole clan stood and looked at the parents' daughter who had been born. She is a glorious descendant of the Spirits of the Sun. Kale noticed that the attack had stopped and told Mord that he had succeeded. Suddenly, 
The monster began to transform before their eyes. Moore dreamed of seeing such a thing. He dreamed of a great adventure story. The protagonist wanted to save a witch who had been cursed by a god, so he could restore her beautiful appearance. The witch turned to Mord. She thanked him for lifting the curse of the cruel god from her. She asked how she could thank him for his kindness, and she wanted to know his name. Mord introduced himself and said he had the blood of Vernars, the god of battles, running through him, looking at him. She said that judging by him, he must have an outstanding power. Mord explained to her the fact that Vernars got his power when the era came to an end. The witch was surprised that the era had already ended. Mord had said that it had ended 500 years ago, after the end of the Age of Legends an era had begun in which the gods did not rule the world. If this is the Age of Legends, then the protagonist had a fragment of that world in front of him. It was a fragment of the ideal world, a tool used in ancient times by the greatest gods to create the world. When the era of legends came to an end, they spread all over the world. This time the terrain was swampy and foggy. Night sky, high mountain peaks and thick fog that merged with the swamp. Mord wanted to remind the witch of the words of gratitude for his favor. But suddenly, from behind his back someone attacked him. The witch protected the heroes from the attack. The mysterious man called Morda the Archduke's illegitimate child. It was an enemy squad that was chasing the protagonist back in the mysterious dungeon. The man called out to Mord saying he was coming for him. An enemy unit came for Mord. The protagonist asked the man if he was of the Silver Blood, to which the man asked with surprise how he knew that. Wasn't this his first encounter with them? Mord queried. Wasn't it obvious for a bearer of divine blood to know about such a thing? The man was shocked that he recognized his affiliation with Silver Blood only by the fact that he was a bearer of divine blood. The woman from the squad offered to test their hunches when Mord was captured, and the swordsman offered to teach the protagonist the rules of etiquette, for he did not know them. The leader of the enemy gang ordered to awaken his allies' divine blood to use all their powers, to which the swordsman grudgingly asked if it was an urgent task and suggested he have some fun. The man gave him a stern look and told him not to underestimate him, that there might be other people hiding besides Mord and Kyle. The swordsman said that he needed to become a top-level warrior as soon as possible. The female mage agreed with him and said they needed to deal with them quickly. The mutated man ordered his allies not to kill the heroes. Their mission was to capture them alive. Mord thought about the changes that occurred during the awakening of divine blood, depending on the origin. But absolutely everyone's hair color changes to silver. The top-level officer is descended from the god of beasts, the other he doesn't know, and the woman appears in the novel. A middle-class silver blood warrior is a high-ranking mage of the seventh circle. She possesses extraordinary tracking abilities, but during the divine blood awakening, her magical powers reach that of a first-class mage. In order for the mage to use all his powers, he needs someone to protect him. From the looks of it, it will be a swordsman, and they can be helped by the troops that are approaching here. Mord ordered Kale to hide behind Sadaya and then join the fight. Kale said fearfully that all his opponents had divine blood, and that no matter how capable he was, he couldn't do it alone. Mord calmly called out to Kyle. He told him to do what he ordered, and he himself was already taking a fighting stance at this time. The woman from the enemy squad was shocked and asked again, wasn't Mordu 15 years old? Meanwhile, while all eyes were on Mord, it was a chance for Sede and Kyle to take advantage of such an opportunity. The kid told the witch to go where he showed her. Kyle indicated that she should move toward Mord, but they were stopped by a female mage. She smiled wryly, saying that he was too confident in his ability to hide. But as long as she was near him, then the guy wouldn't succeed. Kale was confused. He had no other options but to have to fight an enemy unit. Mord had said that he had his back and he should take his chances, that it was only their problem and they shouldn't drag Sadia into it. The swordsman smiled evilly and promised to show real hell to the protagonist. He's activated the body's pulse. Swordsman rushed in to attack Mord. A violent pulse explosion erupted near the protagonist. Kale and the female mage were shocked. But Mord is not a slacker. He also uses his trademark thunderous hook against his opponent. Meanwhile, Kale uses a whirlwind attack and lifts the female mage into the air. He had a plan to restrain the female mage so Mord would figure something out in the meantime. The protagonist's magic power, height, and physical ability stats were much better than the enemy squad. The man wolfhound was amazed that he could use his aura, so he decided to use another trump card. He hits the main character with a fist that was charged with a dark aura. Mord is trying to hold on to this strong hold from his opponent. He was slammed into the wall. The protagonist did not expect such a strong reception. Suddenly, there was a fiery explosion. 
the enemy praised the protagonist for exceeding their expectations. However, when they formed their squad, they took into account that they might have a few elite warriors with them, so they still outnumber them. Mord really didn't expect that these top-level warriors were stronger than he thought, and in terms of magical power, height, physical ability and speed, they surpassed him in every aspect. It looked like the ringleader had an artifact in his hands. It was the thing of the gods. When the mythical era ended and the gods left the earth, the artifacts also disappeared from this world, and the highest level divine blood bearers could only use the artifacts with the permission of their god. The man Wolfhound was delighted at Mord's amazement and said that he was favored by the one who was the founder of his kind, and he wondered how long the protagonist would be able to last before the power of the god. For Mord, this was a test of strength. Through it he would be able to test his abilities. With the fusion of the three fragments of the world, he will be able to increase the might of his magical powers, and while he doesn't know what his maximum is yet, but if you add the blessing of the god of battles, Mord wondered how long the leader of the enemy squad would be able to hold out now. He scores with a jab to the jaw of his opponent. Wolfhound Man flies off into the air from such a strong attack. He didn't expect the protagonist's strength and movements to be any different. But that wasn't all. Mord swiftly approached his opponent to finish him off with an even more powerful attack. But suddenly, someone cast a heavenly fang spell and stopped the protagonist from finishing off the leader. It was a female mage and she scoffed at the fact that her leader was now losing to a 15-year-old. The man leader recognized that this was indeed a shame. He had prepared for an ambush, but Mord was able to defeat them single-handedly. Mord wondered why the woman was able to strike and where had Kale gone. Kyle was now being pursued by an enemy unit that had come to the aid of his allies. The wolfhound leader called out to Mord that he was able to surprise him, but still that was the limit of his capabilities. Now it was his turn to deliver the fatal blow to the hero. The leader of the enemy squad has promised revenge on the protagonist. Mord gathered his strength. Suddenly, something started happening to the wolfman artifact. The female magician's leg is on fire. It was Sadia's attack. She knew Mord didn't want her to interfere in the duel, but she became enraged and menacingly called out to the enemy squad that they were too arrogant and as if they had become gods themselves, though they were too far from that. Sedi thought this sight was very ridiculous. The opponents only stood and watched to see what would happen next. She could only watch from the sidelines. Sayadia called out to the enemy squad for becoming too arrogant and indulging in divine power, though they were still too far away from that. The female mage was shocked that how could she have forgotten the witch existed, and that she couldn't sense her even with her powers. The witch's clan, Ilderba, shares divine blood amongst themselves, and the more of them gathered in one place the weaker they become. But right now she is the only blood relative of the sun spirit which means she's the strongest of her kind. How suddenly, Sadia felt like she couldn't use her power. She fell to the ground from exhaustion. She didn't understand, so why couldn't she use her power? As the age of legends has come to an end, Sadia has become someone who cannot exist in this world, and to use divine power, she must pay, but she had nothing to repay such a gift with. Mord had told her that there was no need to stress, and that he wanted to focus on them, and let her better help Kyle deal with the others. She didn't understand his plan or his intentions. He smirked and said not to worry about the outcome. If the leader survives one hit, Mord will beat him until he dies. Each bearer of divine blood has a specialty, and it is that whoever carries Vernar's blood can catch a bullet with his bare hands. The wolfhound smirked that Morda only had a ball of momentum, and in that case, he didn't even have any chance of winning. The peculiarity is that its momentum has the properties of lightning, and the advantage of this feature is its immense destructive power. It's good for the Keeper of the Thorn Forest, who can buff the opponent's momentum and block their actions. The Wolfhound's mistake was that he had combined his powers with the Pulse, and now the latter couldn't move. The leader of the enemy squad saw some dots circling near him, Mord stepping up to strike from his opponent. The protagonist lands a crushing blow to Vernars instead of multiple low blows. Mord strikes with a slash of air. The Wolfhound felt a punch being thrown at him, but he felt nothing. But after a second, he saw that all the energy was gathering in one place. The wolfhound was gone. He was torn to shreds. Mord stood and watched as the enemy's pieces flew apart. He realized that would be enough for now, but here's what about. Sadia meanwhile stood and prepared a fire spell against the enemies. She directed a fire pulse at the enemy unit. The mercenaries stood there wondering what kind of power is this? Meanwhile, Kale lay on the ground from exhaustion. He thought he was going to die at the hands of the enemy mercenaries. He questioned why Mord had killed a female mage so easily, to which he received the answer that Silverblood warriors had some sort of 
Prohibition. It's a ban that prevents you from finding out important information from them, after which they turn into monsters, and it only causes trouble. Silverbloods are a dangerous unit, but Kale didn't expect them to have such monstrous power. The protagonist stumbled upon them in the White Demon Realm and they were very dangerous. People in high places are given basic information about them. The Archduchy of Verners is far from powerless, and the informants surely know some information about the Silverbloods. Kale wondered, though, how Mord knew all this. To which he replied that the traces of the god in him revealed the great prophecy of the world. Sadia believed Mord's version, but Kyle looked at her and wondered if she believed such nonsense. She looked at him in surprise and asked him why he was so hesitant. Mord said it was not a common occurrence lately. Sidia questioned that visions of prophecies through divine blood are not a common occurrence. To which the protagonist replied that it is, and prophecies have been the subject of stories for a long time. Mord turned to Kale. He said the sword he was holding was used by the red-haired man and told him to take it back. Kale was happy because this sword looked so much better than the one he was using now. It was good for him to follow Mord and work like a horse. The heroes looked at the huge pile of opponents that were burning with bright flames. Sadia said that if they burned them, they could still trace them. So she set about sealing their souls into spheres. Since the end of the Age of Legends, mortals had helped each other learn magic with the help of government support. But heroes didn't go so far for that. They went so far for the fact that they were very different from gods. Mord knew this. But seeing the power of a god in person was when he truly realized it. Saidi remembered that she still hadn't thanked her rescuers and asked for a reminder of what they had said earlier. Mord said he wanted to take the sword she used to defend herself. But she said that sword was cursed. He knew about it and said he knew how to break the curse. The reason for the danger of this sword is the spirit of a powerful demon that is sealed within it. And isn't it because the weapon has a mind of its own, beckons its master with power, drives him into madness and ultimately leads to death? So he must penetrate this sword with his mind and banish the spirit from it. To which Saidea looked at him with a surprised look and asked if it was possible to do such a thing. He said that when she was cursed, it was an impossible task. But after a long time his mind weakened. It was a proven method. Aiden had broken the curse with his sword the same way. He'd been watching Kessner and Ildan since they'd gotten to this level. But after the battle, things had cleared up. To become a god, a man must achieve something great something that will become legendary. He must prove himself worthy, the only way to enter their world. After all, only a meaningful fight and victory could bring light and glory to his divine blood. Mord had moved closer to their world after today's battle, and had a meaningful victory over three divine blood carriers, and one of the opponents had reached level two, and in the blink of an eye, he destroyed a race of giants. Vykalos, the protagonist pledged to kill him and get one step closer to the second level. Mord asked Sadia once more if she could put his mind into the sword, to which she agreed to his request. The protagonist was already standing in anticipation on moving into the sword. Mord called out to Vykalos that he had come to see him. Vykalos only smirked that he had waited a very long time for their meeting, and he would have a chance to escape from this sword. He saw Mord as a man with the blood of an unknown god, and that he, the demon king, could give him the power to rule the entire world. If he made a deal with him, and with that power, he could fulfill all his desires. The king who rules over countless gods, Marius, sacrificed his own kind to create a sword. A vessel designed to imprison Vykalos, who is so powerful that even Marius had difficulty defeating him. The imprisonment of the Lord was a great feat. Vykalos held out his hand for Mord to take. He wanted to take possession of the protagonist's body to get his own back and to kill Marius, who had imprisoned him in the sword, and after that he would rule the world again. Mord only coldly replied that he was lying about his intentions and had no plans to return the protagonist's body until he found his own, and that Vykalos's body no longer existed in this world. The demon lord was shocked. Mord explained to him that after Marius had imprisoned him in the sword, not only the world but also the demon realm had undergone drastic changes, and other demons had absorbed his empty body without a soul, and now he had a disembodied something. Vykalos was furious after saying that. The protagonist suggested to the Lord to check his oath with magic, and that he was ready to swear on his life, to which Vykalos only smiled and said that lying to a demon is inevitable death. Mord said he knew that and was still willing to swear on his life. Vykalos got angry and said Mord would regret his decision, but he just stood silently and waited. He stood over Mord, holding a huge spear that glowed with a dark aura. 
The Lord had bound the protagonist in magical chains. Mord stood motionless. Vykalos had warned him that he had one last chance to tell him the truth, or he would come to an immediate end. Mord only coldly replied that the Lord's body no longer existed in this world. The Lord saw a flashback where his body was being tormented by a mob of demons. Vykalos stood aghast at the bitter truth. He wanted those memories to stop immediately, but they kept replaying and replaying. The demon lord was in a panic. He was desperate about what had happened. It was amazing that Vykalos had managed to maintain his psyche for thousands of years. But when he found out that his body no longer existed in this world, he lost his mind from shock. Just like this moment, Vykalos didn't realize what was going on. Mord flailed coldly to the overlord to disappear from the face of the earth. Kale, meanwhile, stood ecstatic that he was now holding the legendary Sword of the Demon, and that just as the curse was lifted, and he could call it divine. He asked Mord incredulously what he was going to do with it if he didn't use it. The man replied that there was a man who could be an excellent master for the sword. Kale asked hopefully who might be the master for this sword, to which Mord replied that he didn't know him anyway, and that he had already gotten a new sword an hour ago. Mord asked Sadia what she would do next. She said she was not allowed to be in this world and didn't know when she would go to heaven. She had nowhere else to go, and no way to get revenge. Either way, she has no choice. Mord replied that she has a choice. She can get revenge because Marius is in this world as a member of the Silverbloods. Sadia was shocked to hear that. She didn't understand how that was possible. Mord explained that he looked very different and not as she remembered him, because a lot had happened between her imprisonment and the end of the Age of Legends. Saidiya had been anticipating the opportunity to get revenge on her abuser, and now she had the opportunity to get revenge on him. Saidiya explained that the Age of Legends has come to an end and denies his existence, so there is nothing left for her to do but imprison herself until the time comes for her to awaken. If she walks through the door, she will be imprisoned. She asked that Mord keep the key and open the gate when the time came to do so. The witch has become the strongest mage of her kind, and she's confident she can kill a god. But there's no point in her power if she goes to heaven before she does. She asked Mord that when she fought Marius, he would rescue her from her imprisonment so she could avenge her past. Mord asked if Sayadea was sure of what she was doing. She smiled and replied that she was sure. The protagonist promised that he would do anything so that she could meet Marius. Meanwhile, Marius laughed at feeling his power released after a long time in the swampy and foggy area. Marius's ally asked if he had any remnants of his power left in this world, and if so, why didn't he return them to himself? The one replied that he could die if he tried to get it back. So he planned to get the sword and the fragment after he gained his strength. But someone had already done that instead. He was asked if this meant defeat. To which he replied that on the contrary, he was grateful that he could now avoid seeing someone he didn't want to when he went to return his sword to himself. Marius intends to reward the person who did this for such actions. Kale was surprised that by bypassing all the obstacles, just by destroying a wall, one could reach the center of the ruins. He couldn't figure out how more did it. The heroes looked at the relics in the chest left behind by the great mage of ancient times. Mord handed Kyle something he could use. He didn't know what he was holding, so he asked what kind of bracelet it was. It was a bracelet that could be used to summon fire spirits, and it would be easier for someone with nature spirit magic to control fire spirit magic with this bracelet. Kyle was shocked at how such a thing was possible to which Mord replied that it was a relic of a great mage who wielded divine power, and the power of a god can make the impossible possible. Mord realized that Kale was definitely an important ally to him and needed to be encouraged to do something useful. But considering what the future might hold, he was still inexperienced. And in that case, the most effective way to make Kale strong was to make him even stronger with spirit magic. Meanwhile, Kale was already getting the hang of the bracelet. Mord didn't know what to do with the rest of the goodies, so he decided what he would give away and what he would use himself. He now has a ring that allows him to detect ambushes and other unexpected dangers and can activate the power of defense. The bracelet worn on him could allow the wearer to save up his magical abilities and then use them at the right moment. Kyle was shocked because it was the first time he had seen such powerful ancient relics. On the third day, Mord cleaned out the dungeon hidden behind the waterfall. The heroes decided to stop to rest and regain their strength. Kale could already feel his wallet becoming as light as a feather, but considering the relic he had received, he knew it was worth it. Kyle asked Mord why their next destination was so far away, from the eastern part of the Rutwan Kingdom to the west central part, to which Mord replied that there were two reasons. One, so that the Silverbloods wouldn't track them, and two, there was urgent business there. 
Kale replied that he felt something, and asked the protagonist if he felt some strange atmosphere in this village, that people were making a fuss as if something had happened. And then there's the staring. A village boy approached the heroes asking if they were mercenaries. Mord asked him if he needed mercenaries or why he was asking. The village boy said that about two weeks ago, ogres started appearing near the village, and that after a while, a mysterious mercenary with a sword appeared and killed the ogres. The man described his appearance, and the heroes went to look for him. Kyle asked Mord if he had used a huge sword, to which the protagonist replied that it was not the rule that a descendant of Vernar should fight with his bare hands, and assumed that the mysterious mercenary wanted to hide his origins. Mord remembered what Leon had said to Aiden in the original, that he stumbled upon the ruins, and there got the legacy of the god of battles, trying to fend off danger in the village during his wanderings, and it looks like now is the time to do it. The mysterious man stood there and didn't understand where the skeletons of their ancestors came from. He didn't want to die, but still he realized that he was likely to die, and he said that he would strike more than one blow before he died. The skeleton agreed, and said it would even be more interesting that way, and then threw himself into the fight with the man. Suddenly, the skeleton was torn apart by the pulse. He went all over the place from the impact. It was Mord who destroyed the skeleton with a single blow. The other skeleton was not happy about it and said, How dare that one interfere in their fight? He didn't realize who he was. The protagonist asked a counter question. Who is he really? He realized that the skeleton was not the core of the dungeon and must be doing this remotely from the demon realm using some sort of magic trick. The skeleton didn't understand why he should reveal his cards, and so he chose to remain silent about it. Skeleton was furious because Mord was talking to him too arrogantly. He and his descendants threatened the protagonist that he would not last long in a duel with them and would regret having told on him earlier. Skeleton rushed towards Mord to deliver a crushing blow. The protagonist was ready for this, and so was also preparing to deliver a counter-strike that could destroy the walking bones. Mord lands a crushing blow with a hook to the jaw. He threw himself at the skeleton to deliver the final killing blow. Mord used the destruction of the mirage to put the walking bones to rest once and for all. The remaining skeletons were attacked with mythical magic spheres. Apparently, they did not expect such a turn and were already preparing for the worst outcome. They were struck by a magical lightning that focused on the place of the mythical spheres, and thus finished off the skeletons in one blow. Mord realized he had finished off his opponents and began to walk away from the scene of the battle. The protagonist didn't even have to awaken divine blood to defeat them. Mord turned to the mysterious man, talking about how he was trying to seem cool by playing with these dolls, which the man denied because it would be a waste of his power. The skeleton that Mord defeated introduced himself, calling himself the Count of the Demon Realm, Virgon, and promised that he would take revenge and never forget how he had been humiliated. Mord didn't listen to him any further and cracked his skull with his foot, calling him an arrogant bastard. The mysterious man didn't understand who this Mord was. He couldn't defeat them even by awakening the divine bloodline, and he had defeated them so easily. Kale recognized the man, it was Leon Vernars, and told Mord that he had not misjudged the man's prediction about his lineage. He asked Leon why he was here. The man didn't realize who they were. He thought that he was being chased by his family, and that the heroes were mercenaries who had come to kill him. So he had already adopted a fighting stance to defend himself against them. He thought the heroes had come to bring him back to them. Leon used to be the fifth claimant to be the heir to the Werner's family, but five years ago, he gave up his place as heir and left the Archduchy. In the original story, he met Aiden and became his staunch ally. Mord replied that he had merely been found at the request of the villagers, but Leon didn't believe it, to which Mord replied to him with an unpleasant sludge that the man he had saved was the one who doubted him, so let him get lost if he didn't believe what he said. The protagonist wondered if the man was unable to handle the demonification due to his injury to which he looked at Mord with surprise. Kale replied that he recognized Leon because he had seen him before, and introduced himself to him as a high-ranking warrior. Even though it didn't seem that way at first glance, Leon was shocked by what he heard. He didn't understand how the boy had the same rank as him. Kale introduced himself and replied that he was from a squad of guards under General Ilden, and he also added that the Archduke of Vernars doesn't care about him, so he can breathe easy because no one is after him. Leon blushed, replying that he really did, because no one would look for him like that. Mord looked at him and knew that in the original Leon was sullen and haughty, but this time, he thanked Mord for saving him, and he also apologized for doubting him. From his childhood, Leon was compared to his brothers, who were more capable and also, he himself was never supported by his family. As he grew older, he had less and less opportunity. 
When his mother died of illness, he freed himself from the burden and began to roam the continent. During this time, he acquired the legacy of the God of Battles, and in doing so, he broke down the wall separating him from his abilities. Five years later he met Aiden, the one saw Leon's abilities and convinced him to fight again for the place of heir. Thanks to Aiden's tremendous support, Leon became an Archduke. Mord told Kale to escort Leon outside and give him the cure and to go back himself, to which Leon was scared and asked if they would take him with them to destroy the demonization. The protagonist replied that they didn't know what else might happen, so it was better to do that than to take an injured man with them. Leon was indignant and said that he was still able to fight. Mord only coldly replied that he would be in their way. He said that the one could be an obstacle to the people who saved him, and that the one only wanted to stroke his ego. Leon apologized for his stubbornness. Mord thought he was making concessions, and he wanted to knock him out and leave him outside if he continued to resent him again. Kyle heard his musings and realized that Mord was angrier than the devil himself. Kyle put a wind spirit on the protagonist so he could find him. Mord was walking, thinking Leon had fallen beneath the ruins, trapped, so he could get the legacy of the God of Battles. The protagonist wanted to find something, so he became to think about a further plan of action. He adopted the classic plan for him, smash and break if nothing else is on his mind. He snuck over to the place with the history books that were written by those who lost in the war for power with the Vernars. He picked up a book on researching and developing combat skills. These were all things the Verners had left behind. Mord wasn't sure if they were valuable, but he had a bottomless bag anyway, so he'd take them with him. The protagonist noticed a box that only Verners can open. There were traces of the God of Battles left there. He began to decipher the Vernar's seal. Inside was a fragment of the world. This was already the eighth one. He would combine it with the ones he had now. So he also picked up the stone slab with which Leon met the God of Battles in the original. Mord felt some strange sensation. As he touched the slab, he felt a fierce urge to fight. He realized it was an unusual stone slab. He realized that it was an unusual slab of stone that could be used to gain the same experience as the tomb of the God of Battles. This is the legacy of the God of Battles that helped Leon gain his missing abilities. The dragon is a mythical creature that has long been extinct, and an item made from the skin of the ultimate dragon that the God of Battles was after. Mord held the belt of the God of Battles in his hands. Kyle turned back to the protagonist and saw that he was holding a magical item in his hands. But Mord replied that it wasn't magical. It was an ancient relic made of dragon skin. Usually such items are enchanted, but this one isn't because Vernars used the belt until he ascended to heaven. Mord was thrilled with the belt because it fit him well and held his waist. Kyle asked if he had sent Leon outside so he wouldn't see the belt. Mord only nodded contentedly. Meanwhile, Leon lay under the tree and realized that he was still powerless. He stood up abruptly out of fright. It was the heroes who had jumped over the wall. Kale thought there would be demons, but there were none. Mord asked Leon if he felt better after taking the medicine and he thanked him for asking and said he felt much better because of it. Leon replied that he didn't even know the protagonist's name, so he asked him if he could introduce himself. Mord identified himself as the bastard son of the Vernars family. Leon thought so, since there was no one named Mord among the legitimately born children of the Vernars family of his age. He asked how old the boy was, to which the man replied that he was 15. Leon was shocked at what he heard to which Kale replied that it was really hard to believe. He was stunned at how a 15-year-old kid could use aura. He asked Mord if he was a top-ranked magic martial artist, and if he had been taught the skill since childhood. Mord replied that there was no such thing, and asked why the man should tell him all this. Leon said he was just surprised and apologized if I had offended him. The protagonist replied that they were done here, and was about to leave to calm the residents by telling them the truth and Leon would feel better if he ate and rested before awakening his divine blood. Leon questioned how they were doing. Weren't they tired? Mord said they would stay a couple of days and then move on. Leon asked where they were going, to which the protagonist said coldly that he didn't care. He replied that he did, and asked if they were going to a place that was connected to his family. Mord answered no. Leon still didn't understand why he couldn't go along with them. Mord didn't understand why he was like that. That he was so different from the original. The protagonist questioned why he was so eager to go with them, to which he got the answer that he just was. For company. Mord was perplexed. Leon hastily replied that it was for a reason after all, to which Mord replied that he had one day to think about that decision. He has until tomorrow night to give his reason.
he will hear him out and decide if he will go with them or not. Leon was shocked at what he heard. Kale told Leon to come with them, for the village head had promised them a treat if they made it back safely, and they needed to start there. That night the village head asked what they wanted as a reward for preventing the demonization of the village. Kale asked for money, and Leon wanted a new sword to replace his broken one. But Mord asked for a free space isolated from the outside world. The protagonist saw that the stone slab had been replaced by a banquet hall for the heir of the village head. Mord shifted in his own mind, and realized that there was no likely place to choose this time. Near the cliff the protagonist was met by the god of battles. He laughed and said that here is a beautiful view and a place to beat someone up. He looked happily at Mord and said they hadn't seen each other in a long time. Mord replied that he was the same as last time. The god of battles replied that he was a remnant, but he was not a copy or an illusion. He had the power of the god of battles who was in heaven. He praised the protagonist and said that he had become strong and offered to continue their last lesson. Mord agreed but on the condition that he would answer his two questions. The first was why he was smaller than his descendants, and the second was whether there would be a side effect of unleashing a lot of power at once. The battle god didn't understand why he was asking about it, so Mord told him how the Vernars family had changed since his death, and what the Archduke was doing now to prevent aging. The god of battles did not like this story. Mord replied that the Archduke is strong enough to be called the reincarnation of the god of battles, and as far as he knows, he reached the fourth level of divine blood, but since then he has begun to age rapidly. It's possible that his blood is mixed, judging by the height of his descendants. This family has existed for 400 years, the blood must have been mixed, and besides, there are some very strong among the giants, but in return, they have a short lifespan. That could also have influenced this outcome. The reason for the rapid aging is not revealed in the original, but if there is other blood present, Someone yelped in surprise! The protagonist and god of battles was joined by a mysterious man who had fallen from heaven. He said that he almost died of boredom, and why do they talk to each other for so long? He called Mord a wuss and is excited to meet him because it's been a while. Last time he got a smack from Mord, now he asks if he can hold back or not? Mord replies that of course he can't hold back. He signaled to the protagonist that the fight was starting. Mord had a feeling that the man's divine blood power was different from his. Vernars is a demigod who was born from the union of a woman and the sky god Aerith. He made the divine blood inherited from his father completely his own, and became a god through his own accomplishments. What Mord uses is Vernars' divine blood. But here's this ten-year-old battle god using Aerith's divine blood. It's a different power altogether. But the feeling seemed very familiar to Mord for some reason. Man, you lost. The god of battles was delighted with what he had seen, and said that now the protagonist had made him fight him. He also asked Mord if he had fought him five months ago. He was surprised that Mord had mastered the aura in such a short time, but the god of battles still possessed her at the age of twelve. He promised to show Mord the next level he should aspire to, but... No way, Mord used aura acceleration. Aura acceleration is a skill that harnesses a highly concentrated aura, which is accelerated at the right moment to gain incredible power. The god of battles didn't expect that the protagonist had already studied aura acceleration. Mord had trained countless times in the realm of his mind, but never in the real world, so it was time to rectify that. Mord launched a swift attack against the god of battles. He didn't expect such a powerful reception from his opponent. Mord ripped off the arm of the god of battles. He asked him if he had won? Had it been such an easy fight? Half of the god's body lay beside Mord. He agreed that he had won, and he had not expected such a powerful attack from his opponent. But somehow the god couldn't realize in ability Mord was much weaker than him, however at the same time he was too arrogant and that's his poison. All the heroes of the Age of Legends, the protagonist replied that no matter how talented he was, he couldn't become a hero without luck. To which the white-haired god laughed, saying that he was trying to comfort him, but Mord replied that he just wasn't relieved that he had won. The black-haired man stood up and apologized, promising that the 23-year-old would not disappoint him. He promised to do his best to make amends. His hair is black and his pupils are silver gray, a testament to the fact that he has most of Aerith's blood in him. He hadn't even developed his magic abilities, let alone awakening divine blood. His powers are at the same level as Morda after awakening divine blood. The black-haired man is a monster in the flesh. They're coming in for a tough fight. Mord rushed in for a swift attack, but the man is not shabby and dodges the main character's attack. He swiftly dodges Mord's attack, bouncing backwards. The man praised the protagonist for rapidly growing to an impossible level, 
but Mord called it nonsense, saying that although he had fought him 500 times, he had only hit him once. The man was surprised that the protagonist still managed to get his face in after 500 battles. He didn't take him seriously, so he almost got punched in the face. But even if Mord's physical health is restored, his mental health is not. And the more he fights, the more he realizes what a monster he really is. But he's lost 500 times. But anyway, he promised to punch the black-haired man in the face properly. Mord went into black-haired face-beater mode. The man asked the god of battles how long he had left to fight. He replied that he had a hundred attempts, because the descendant had collected many fragments of the world, so they still have a lot of time. Since the fragments take the bulk of the power, the fee for using the power of the heavens is less. The black-haired man wondered if the man was sure of his words. Mord has grown a lot in the meantime, but he thinks it's his full strength. The god only smiled, questioning if he really felt that way. It was the 5 and 20th attempt to do damage on Mord, but he blocked the flurry of blows like an umbrella of fine raindrops. There were already 559 attempts underway, but the protagonist continued to heroically hold the defense. But something unthinkable happened, causing the god of battles to fly up in the air. It was a 610 attempt from the black-haired man, but the man milled about that he didn't even have to awaken the divine bloodline. Mord was lying on the ground, imprinted into the rock with all his might. The protagonist was pissed off that at one point he forgot how to move. He was eager to punch his opponent in the face. But here's the more he gets mentally tired. The more there's something bubbling up inside him. Some mysterious voice ordered Mord to leave those thoughts behind. A mysterious god was flying over Mord. At the same time, the protagonist lay motionless and watched as it flew toward him. The mysterious god told the protagonist to stop thinking about defeats and to leave all his thoughts to his instincts. The black-haired man had already relaxed, asking the god of battles if they were done fighting, to which he replied that they weren't done yet. It wasn't over yet. Mord stood up abruptly and trusting his instincts, decided to continue the fight in a new breath. The man had a very different feeling already, and this. Mord's fierce spirit drove him. He craved a stuffed face. Mord dashed towards the black-haired man with lightning speed to strike. That one, frightened, became a defensive stance to counter such a powerful attack. The protagonist attacked the enemy with a very powerful attack. The man could barely dodge her. But that didn't stop Mord. He continued to charge at his opponent, attacking more and more powerfully. It attacked him with a thunderous barrage that was rather difficult to dodge. But still, the man managed to dodge the attack. But he realized that if he couldn't do that, he would finish him off. The man stood near the edge and sensed something was wrong. Mord lay on the ground from exhaustion and didn't realize what had just happened. He didn't even remember, as of now, attacking. The god of battles explained with a smile on his face that the divine blood of Aerith, the sky god, had awakened in him. Mord didn't realize that he was using the power of the sky god, so the god of battles explained that it wasn't his mind, but his instincts that realized he had that power in him. He told the protagonist not to forget this feeling, because when he fully awakens it and balances it with the power inherited from him, then he will realize what it feels like to have two divine powers within him. Now Mord realized what balance meant. This power of Aerit is the power of a god. It is very powerful, but it can completely take over a person's mind. He needs to make the power of the god of battles basic, so that he can use it without losing his mind. The god of battles would have liked to talk some more, but unfortunately he ran out of time. He blessed Mord with divine health and said he would look forward to their next meeting for he wondered how he would master Aerith's power by then. Mord asked him to stop keeping it a secret, and asked that someone else be sent to him. Meanwhile, Mord was waiting for Leon. He was ready to give the protagonist an answer to his posed question. Leon said that before he told his reason why he wanted to go with them, Mord should find out why he left home. His father was a descendant of the Vernars family, but fell in battle trying to prevent demonization. His mother's relatives mighty to put their man in his father's place. The people who had been supporting Leon's family began to leave them one by one, restricting and intimidating them. As he trained, he found it much easier to turn to the god of battles in situations where the instructor was pressuring a candidate. But compared to other candidates he lacked talent, he was considered capable, but as soon as he officially became a warrior, he faced the harsh realities of life. Compared to them, he suffered from pressure. But what was much harder to deal with was the reproach from his relatives, especially from his own mother. She kept saying, why can't he do even that? He should try harder, or else he's tarnishing the family's reputation. His mother told the young boy every day that he should be the best, 
but over time she became hysterical. Every time she saw that he wasn't good enough, she was cruel to him. He wanted to run away every time, but for little Erna's sake, he stayed. However, Erna began to show her genius, and people began to compare them more and more. Leon could no longer smile when he saw Erna, so she seemed dangerous to him. He hated himself for it, so he made the decision to leave his family. Even when his mother was dying, she looked at him with eyes like a demon's and started cursing him, saying that he was worse than a small child, and that he was useless, and it was better that he had not been born. Seeing his own mother was hell for him. On the day of her funeral, he left his family. In a world away from the Vernars family, he felt free and strong at last. But he realized that it was all a complete illusion. He had only faced enemies weaker than him and had not tested his own limits for the last five years. He thought he was nothing. He realized it when he was on the verge of death. But that's when Mord came in. He considered it his second chance at the free life the world had given him. Then Leon felt it was fate so he wanted to go on a journey with them to see what it felt like. Mord looked at the boy sternly and asked if he had finished his story, which made Leon speechless. But still, the protagonist was interested to hear his story live. But this time, he talked too much than in the story. So he decided to interrupt the story. Mord warned that the road would be many times more dangerous than he thought, for they were being pursued by the Silverblood organization. He had heard of them, but he wasn't sure of their existence. The protagonist confirmed it, and said that their military power was on the same level as that of the Vernars family. Moore didn't know when they would run into them, so he suggested to Leon that he think hard about whether he wanted to go with them or not, but he just stood there, glad that he hadn't been turned down. He replied that he didn't even have to think about his decision. He had promised that he would help when they fought them, and he didn't know how he could thank the heroes for saving him. But now, he had found a way to repay them. Mord knew that he would not die there, and he was destined to become an Archduke. The protagonist knew that Leon is not a genius, but he is a direct descendant of the Vernars family, and if he raises him well, he will become as strong as in the original, so he decided that he can go with them. Leon stood up sharply from such an unexpected verdict, but Kale asked Morda if he was sure of his decision, because if they took Leon with them, they might have problems, to which the protagonist replied that it was none of his business. Leon replied that Kale shouldn't worry about him. After all, he was just a man who had lost in the war to become heir, and asked that he just call him by his first name, and not with the prefix Mr., and he thought it was strange when he was addressed too formally. This time, they traveled to the west central region of the Rutwan Kingdom, Palace County. As expected, there would be many mercenaries in the town. There are a lot of monsters that come from Mount Limos, so there's always work to be done here. Kale was shocked at why Leon had bought all of this. He was wearing a knight's armor and a huge sword with magic runes. He told him to hide his identity, because people would realize that he was from the Werner's family, and if he fought without equipment, he would be quickly discovered. He's also used to using a sword, because he walked around with it after he left his family. The heroes noticed that on the way here, Leon fought Mord several times and lost all the time, to which the latter was indignant and replied that Mord had high skills, because he was a master. Mord is 15 years old and Leon is 25, so he suggested that Kale test his abilities since he was too literate. But the protagonist replied that they should do it after they went to the black market. He asked Kale to find out how they could get there. His eyes immediately sparkled when he heard that there was something useful here, and he promised to find out as soon as possible. Leon realized how they could get there. They traveled a long way for some pebble, but it wasn't a simple stone and Mord asked to have his blood dripped on it. The one didn't understand why it was necessary, to which Mord said to do it without further question. He took it and dripped his blood there. Pebbles started transforming after that. Now it wasn't a pebble, but an entire cobblestone. It was a relic, stone giant glove, which can only belong to divine blood bearers. They use it, not magical powers. So they need to be fed regularly. Leon was speechless. He didn't expect Mord to give him this relic. The protagonist must make sure that he is strong enough, and if he took what belongs to Leon, he must give him at least this in return. He picked up the warning earrings. The ancient spirit within them would warn the hero of danger, and when they activated during battle, they would heighten his senses. Mord handed these earrings to Kyle. The protagonist said that he needed to get his ears pierced first, to which he only looked at him happily. The main character said that he had to get his ears pierced first, and he just looked at him happily. Kale noticed that he had bought three things and asked where the last one was. 
he pulled it out of his bag and said it was a continuation of what he had found last time. He was holding the book he had bought at the previous black market. The book sparkled in the air, transforming. She fell to the ground. Mord picked it up and noticed that a map had appeared on its pages. He decided to do the rest of the difficult work gradually. The protagonist wanted to ask another question to Leon. The latter listened to him attentively. He asked him if he knew where the informants were, but Kyle interrupted him and told him to leave it to him. He would ask people in the nooks and crannies. Morda was asked who he was looking for. In response, he said he was looking for Aiden, a mercenary mage who was about 50, 60 years old. The comrades asked the protagonist where they were going. He said the dungeon. That's the main reason they're here. Leon interjected that didn't he come here to find Aiden, and who was he? Mord replied that he was a bearer of divine blood whose enemy was silver blood. They are looking for a god who is an old hermit. He helps others find the right path. The divine blood fits perfectly to become a mage. Now it is very difficult for them to find someone who has inherited the divine blood. But among them, Aiden is the only one who could awaken the power of divine blood. That's why he was called the genius magician. His monstrous power was possible because of his older sister's sacrifice. The older Aiden's sister got, the more often she heard the voices in her head. When the silver blood attacked the family, she sacrificed herself and awakened the divine blood to save her brother. She turned the power into a blessing, gave it to Aiden, and died herself. As a result, he felt his divine blood that had not yet awakened until then. Aiden then began working as a mercenary in Palos, gradually earning himself positive karma despite such a young age. Moore didn't have a clear plan, but he realized that the future was changing because of him. So he needed to see if Aiden was living the same life as in the original. Mord was sure they were almost at their destination. He saw that there was a dungeon there. In the near future, Aiden can find his first fragment of the world here, as well as detailed notes about them. So Mord swiftly headed towards the place. E. As always, he had the only plan if he didn't know how to get into a place. Smash break, don't think or guess. Mord thought about the fact that if he took the fragments before he did, how would Aiden's fate change then? Kale would never have thought of the fact that the dungeon could be behind the waterfall. Leon asked how he knew about the place, to which the protagonist made no comment. Leon was outraged that he ignored him, but Kale cheered him up, saying he was always like that. Kale asked Mord what kind of dungeon this was, to which he replied that they were here for the long haul, or he was wrong in his hasty verdict. This dungeon contains both puzzles and traps. Morda's companions were horrified by what they heard, and if they can't solve the puzzles, it means they won't clear the dungeon. To which the protagonist replied that there was a much faster way to solve it all. He awakened the spirits in his armor by stepping on one of the traps. Mord had already acted on the classic method of breaking, before something activated before his rash actions in the future. He was gathering all his energy into a fist to smash the traps that had been set. The protagonist hit the mechanism with all his might. Leon replied that he hadn't often been in dungeons and ruins that didn't have demonization. To which Kale looked at him like he was pathetic. In front of the heroes stood a stone statue of a gargoyle. They were surprised to see her in front of them. Kale wondered which room awaited them this time. To which Leon replied that there was no difference, because Mord destroyed everyone they entered. But the latter countered that such puzzles were a kind of adventure. This puzzle seemed to be about finding identical pictures that could only be seen with magic. But Kyle wasn't sure he could solve it. Because among them, the mages, Mord interrupted him and told them to step aside. An unexpected twist, don't you think? Not really, because Mord doesn't have any hard decisions to make when you have badass power on your shoulders. The gargoyles flew to the sound. Kale was shocked that there were so many of them, about fifty, to which Leon replied that they were just poor winged monsters that posed no danger. The heroes noticed that the door was changing. Kyle asked what it was. It was a stone golem that transformed. Mord took it upon himself, and to his companions, he entrusted the rest of the monsters. With all his might, he hit the golem. The main character saw some sort of glowing pebble inside the golem. The stone golem regenerates his arm thanks to him. The magic here only amplified the power of the stone beast. It had a core within it, and would regenerate indefinitely, until Mord destroyed it. The gargoyle in the air charged a plasma attack. Leon deftly dodges it and gets in closer to his opponent. That one wanted to hit him with his sword, but the monster was able to dodge the attack. Leon was already starting to get annoyed with these monsters, to which Kale replied to drop his sword and start fighting without it. Kale used a spirit spell so that the gargoyles couldn't fly anymore. They were restrained by spiritual magic and could no longer move from their seats. Kale has stepped up his attack! 
He used a multiple magic sword lunge that knocked the monsters dead. Meanwhile, Mord was beating the stone golem until he got to the core. He noticed that if he keeps recovering after so many of his blows, it means that the only thing left to do is to destroy the core. But if he can't get to it, so the protagonist decides to speed up his aura. So he must not leave the monster any chance of victory. He simply decides to destroy it. The golem's core fell out of its stone shell. Mord smashes him into small pieces so he can't recover any further. All that was left of the stone golem was a pile of stones. Leon was shocked that he was able to defeat the stone golem with almost no effort. He had seen many geniuses, but he had never seen the likes of Mordu. The protagonist turned to his thoughtful comrade and asked if he was still not finished. Leon has already forgotten that he has his own task to deal with. He threw down his sword and decided to fight with his bare hands. Leon told the man to wait a bit, he'd be done with this soon. He swiftly rushed to attack the gargoyles. Leon lands a powerful fist punch right into the monster's heart. He throws a flurry of punches to finish the monsters off. Kale thought he would have done that a long time ago and didn't understand why he wanted to use a sword so badly if he wasn't so good at wielding it. The last time he had lost to him in a sword fight, but he fights much better with his bare hands. The heroes finally made it to the last room, but there was nothing there. A mysterious voice congratulated the heroes on reaching the end of the dungeon. They have gone through all the prepared tests and know that only the brave and wise can reach the last room. Leon and Kale were puzzled whether he meant to praise them or to mock them. After all, Mord was none of the above. The mysterious voice said that it despises those who rely only on strength and that those deserve nothing. Only competent men should have the power of a great god, and they have proven themselves to be wise and brave, and now it is time to be rewarded. A mysterious chest and stove appeared before the heroes. Mord didn't know what this slab was. It was the first time he had seen such writing. It was a slab detailing fragments of the world, and it changed Aiden's life, who could read the ancient language. Mord felt that she was unusually dangerous, and he must destroy her. Opening the chest, another fragment came out of it. Leon didn't understand what it was. He felt a tremendous power from it. He was curious as to why Mord was collecting them, to which he replied, to save the world. The protagonist felt his body changing a bit, but this time there is a big change happening. Fragments of the world not only allow you to draw power, but also allow you to change the owner. Over time, the wearer absorbs the power of the fragment and becomes stronger. The three fragments that Mord received last time merged with this one to become one. He was unusually lucky. Leon asked for more details about saving the world, to which Mord replied that the dungeon was about to collapse and they needed to go back. Leon was again indignant at being ignored, to which Kale again encouraged the one that he was always like this, and the one never answers him either. Kale remembered that Mord had said he was saving the world and thought it sounded ridiculous though. The protagonist is a bit of a wordsmith, but he certainly wouldn't lie. He didn't quite understand his intentions, but the man inspires confidence in him. There was a dead squad on the ground. One of the survivors asked who the killers were. He repeated his question again, only in an orderly tone. One of the assassins replied that he had expected more from the silver-blooded one, but he wasn't as special as he had thought. The mercenaries must be from the Shadow Wolves, and they were the top of the squad, naturally. It's strange that three divine bloodbearers were killed. It turned out they were the reason they were killed. The guy realized that he had no chance of winning against the three, so he needed to summon the Supreme One. In a devilish voice he said he would take everyone to hell with him. But the assassin with the katana at that moment cut the kid's head off while he was threatening them. The ninja was disappointed that his last fight turned out to be very easy. His other partner said that these guys were only six and they would be in danger once they got all the soldiers together, so don't underestimate the Silverbloods. The mercenary appealed to his master that they would go faster now, so that when he was tired, that he would let them know it, and they would take turns carrying him on their backs. This gentleman wondered what kind of man this Mord was, since they had to go through all this to meet him. Tom was getting very curious. Meanwhile, Mord was in his repertoire. He broke an entire rock, testing the strength of four fragments. He began to feel stronger after the four fragments reunited, and he can draw energy from the fragments for a longer period of time and even use them for healing. The divine physical data he received from the God of Battles as a blessing. It takes a lot of time, but in the right situation it would be just right. Kale came under Mord's door. He said he got the results of the investigation from the informants and they found Aiden. The protagonist immediately left the room to ask where he was now, to which Kyle replied that he seemed to have left town yesterday. Aiden had come to Palos about five months ago, working as a mercenary before he met a mage named Levan and became his apprentice. 
Levan is an advanced level 6 mage who is quite famous in the Palos underworld, and that's why no one has been able to touch the organization he's affiliated with, even though it's not that big. Last night some unknown group attacked the organization's base and because of that many people died and the guards filed a manhunt for the killers on the Count's orders. Kale said that Aiden had most likely left the castle through the east exit, and that he had said he was heading to the village at the teacher's request, but informants said that the teacher had simply sent him away for his own safety. Mord, meanwhile, stood pensively. He realized that the course of history had changed, and it was going to happen in at least six months. And besides, Levan couldn't have predicted such a thing, and sacrificed himself to save Aiden. Aiden lived in a cushy family in the kingdom of Rutwan, and he had a life like a flower that grew and developed in a garden. He lost his family to the Silverblood attack, and after that, the Sage of Darkness took Aiden's teacher's life. He began to despise himself, feeling responsible for the loss of his loved ones. Things aren't going according to the storyline, is that what led to the massacre at Grimolder? Not only did they consider the returning king their enemy, but also the Sage of Darkness. The future that Mord doesn't know has arrived. This is where the whole story begins. Mord wondered what had happened to the Mage Levan. Kyle replied that he had disappeared after the attack last night, and his body had never been found, but everyone thought he was dead. Mord jumped at that news. Kyle asked if he was going to take up the case and for what. He replied that he would later confront the people behind the whole affair. Kale was shocked, because how could a 15-year-old have so many enemies? He also asked Mord where he was going and if he had a plan. The protagonist replied that he had a plan. In his head he thought that Levan had created several secret places around the city, and they were places he had prepared especially for such situations, and also for his magical research. He is sure that he is hiding in one of them. The mysterious man stood, out of breath. He wanted to say something. He replied that his workplace was now chaos. The mysterious squad leader replied to him that he had quite a few abilities, but the one is just a tavern owner. He realizes that he won't tell where Levan is, so he decides to finish him off. The tavern owner begged them to stop their rampage. Levan stepped out on his own, showing himself to the mysterious group. He asked them not to harm the tavern owner, and he promised to go with them in return. The owner responded by telling him not to bullshit, because those would definitely not leave him alive. Levan apologized for involving him in such grave danger. The tavern owner said he would detain them, and ordered him to hide. The secret ringleader stood laughing as he watched the event. The dark follower got into a fighting stance, preparing his staff for the fight. He called one of them number 29. The tavern owner asked Levan what number 29 was. He replied that those at the top of a secret organization called Mages of Darkness, and called themselves Dark Followers. Many years ago, there lived a great magician who called himself the Sage of Darkness, Erickson. He fell into his enemy's trap and was sealed, and Dark Followers infiltrated Erickson's mind with the seal and took his knowledge and power. The Dark Follower smiled and said that Number 29 was a master of hide-and-seek, and had been able to avoid them for over a century. Levin angrily replied that he was not Number 29. The Dark Follower replied that the one had not changed, and he was meant to be a vessel. He is a previous experiment, and the enemy mage promised not to hurt him if he just obeyed them. Levin went into a rage and ordered him to go back to licking Erickson's fingers. The Dark Follower and his squad stood preparing to attack and the ringleader replied to Levan that he had left them no choice and he had granted his wish, that he go to hell. The Dark Mage was already preparing a death spell to finish off Levan and the tavern owner. He assumed that the Master and Number 29 would try to lure the guards with loud noises. But those are a secret organization with a long history and know how to get their way by avoiding unnecessary actions. The mage attacked Levan with a division of darkness. The one flew aside from such a powerful spell. Levan's defense still didn't help him defend against the onslaught though. The dark mage stood, praising him for his good abilities, and that he had them on par with him. But still, before he could prove it he heard a noise. Could it be the guards arriving? It was Mord. He got there just in time to help. The main character knew that the sage of darkness in front of him was a dark follower, and said that his eyes would be perfect for a horror movie set. The Dark Mage didn't expect the one to know about them. Which means he needs to get rid of the witness. He attacked Mord with a powerful plasma spell. The protagonist is no slouch. He used the Mirage Destruction spell in response. A retaliatory double attack has now flown towards the opponent. It was so powerful that it could even break through the tavern wall. Sealed into the wall, the Dark Mage lay on the ground. This attack was so powerful that it hurt the opponent very badly and tore half of his mask. No one expected such a powerful attack from Mord. 
Even Levon and the tavern owner were shocked. Levon hadn't expected that Mord could overpower a dark follower with such ease. The man he feared the most was lying on the ground seriously wounded. He turned to Mord to introduce himself. The fact that he was fighting with his bare hands gave him the correct assumption that he was of the Vernars family, to which the protagonist replied that he didn't need to know that. He just came to destroy the Sage of Darkness men when he heard they were in this tavern, and just so happened to save them at the same time. Kale and Leon cheerfully called out that those had handled everyone in the vicinity. Leon thought that the dark mage Mord had killed looked like a top-level mage rather than a follower, but not so much his opponent. Mord replied that they shouldn't take too long, because the protective dome was gone and the gawkers would be coming soon, so they should leave as soon as possible. Laven shouted that he did not know who they were and did not know whether they really wanted nothing from him or were deceiving him. Mord replied that he did, lest he be taken captive by the Sages of Darkness as a vessel, and he should not be afraid of his main opponent, because the protagonist is going to eliminate him and all the rest of his minions. Levan was shocked that those were going to go after the Sage of Darkness alone. That's insane. But he changed his mind immediately, because he realized they could do it. Judging by the way Mord was able to easily deal with the Dark Followers, it would be easy for him to deal with the Sage of Darkness. Levin lived all the time in fear of being found and robbed of his life. Can't he escape the shackles of this hell? Levin asked what the main character's name was, to which he responded by introducing himself to him. He thanked his savior and wants to give him something, but he doesn't know if it would be appropriate as a thank you. He suggested that they go together, for company. Mord doesn't want to miss an opportunity when Levin offers to give him something in return. So he has no good reason to refuse, so the protagonist agrees to his offer. Kale gave the tavern owner a healing potion, and also dressed the wounds of the wounded. After that, they moved towards the dungeon. Kale was shocked. Had Levon prepared this place all by himself? He replied that it would take them about an hour to get there. It was confusing, so he ordered to keep up with him, otherwise the heroes might get lost. He heard some strange sound. Could it be that there are people of the Sage of Darkness in this dungeon? The tavern owner replied that it was the sound of the explosives he had set. It would be over quickly, and the tunnel would collapse. Leon asked if everything was going to be alright. His tavern would also be affected, to which he replied that he was not going to trade there anymore. Because of Levin, the store is destroyed, so he has to follow him to compensate him for the damage. Levan was shocked. Was the tavern owner going to leave him here and run away? But in the end he thanked him for not leaving him in distress. The master praised him, but again hinted at his debt and replied that he should continue to be so. The tavern owner was alarmed, because Levan was called number 29 by the followers of darkness. He didn't know what it could mean. This was his name as the object of the Sage of Darkness's experiment. The Sage of Darkness conducted cruel experiments on him, related to medicine to create a vessel from his soul. He was one of his subjects. He didn't remember how he became one because the sage's men had erased his memory. However, they made a fatal error. They failed to completely destroy his self-perception. With Erickson's soul inside Levan and his intact self-perception, he acquired knowledge of magic through implanted memories and was able to escape using that power. After that, he tried to stay out of their sight and so dwelt in Palos. Leon and Kale were shocked to hear this story from him. Mord knew this because he had read the original. It had been 10 years since Levan had escaped, but because most of the test subjects, Erickson died, unable to withstand the onslaught of the experiment. Levan remains a very important test subject for the cult. That's why he had nightmares every night. He was anxious and scared, but today he was lucky. But again, they might come for him at any moment. They came to their destination. Levan pushed back the column behind which the mysterious chest was hidden. Mord remarked that he didn't use magic to hide him. He replied that the cult had many mages that outclassed him, and he thought he would be easier to find if he started using magic. Mord asked, what is this chest? Levan replied that it was information about the Sage of Darkness that he had collected. He wrote down everything in great detail, so it would be the key to finding their underground. These are the materials that Levan prepared just in case, and handed Aiden the original. Thanks to them, Aiden was able to realize their true nature and began to take revenge on them. In the process, he bonded with his original abuser, the Silverblood. Mord replied that he would use this information wisely and asked what Levan planned to do now. Mord said that he would first leave the place and start looking for an acquaintance in Zidon. And if the heroes were there and needed his help, they could come to the Red Dragon Liquor Store on 23rd Street East. That's probably where Levan sent Aiden, Mord thought. The protagonist understood him and reciprocated that if his help was needed, 
Let him ask Mord Vernars from the White Realm's guards unit. But he had no guarantees that he would definitely be there. But at least he could contact him. Levin thanked Mord for his outstretched hand and also wished the heroes good luck. The tavern owner and Levin left. Mord replied to Kale and Leon that the one had a sad story to tell, but it was worth it. Leon replied that he would be angry if those two died after their combined efforts. Mord replied that it was time for them to hit the road as well. Now there are no more options where Aiden would begin his journey to becoming a world-dominating magician. But here's how this event will change the future. History has already begun to change, and now is the time to make every effort to bring the future to the desired end. Next, the story began to unfold in the castle. The prince replied to Russ that he didn't think the latter. So mediocre. The noble guy holding the cup is a top-ranked silver blood warrior of the 24 Hours of White Silver, the fifth prince of the Rutwan Kingdom, Ceylon. Russ replied, his every word as if a knife was being absorbed into his chest. This is the highest-ranked silver blood 24-hour white blood warrior, the aristocrat Russ. Thoth didn't think it would go this badly, and he wondered if a kid named Mord was blessed by the god of luck. Ceylon asked, what about the reason? The one replied that General Ildon was stepping in, and they had approved four of the best soldiers, but he didn't know yet how many more they could bring in. Ceylon asked, Why did he go to such lengths for a blind monster? Was it for the Archduke's bastard child, Mord? Russ replied that he didn't know, but he knew for sure that the main character was very important to him. The fifth prince was annoyed. The aristocrat replied that fighting Ildon for the sake of returning an illegitimate son to his father, was a disadvantageous proposition no matter how much he considered it. Ceylon was angry, calling Russ a peddler, and that the pride of a man of noble blood was not a commodity, and he simply couldn't catch a 15-year-old boy. Even when he was protected by a blind monster, Ceylon was furious, for it wasn't even the blind monster itself. He promised to give him his soldiers as reinforcements, and ordered him to find the asshole and finally deal with him, and to deal with the blind monster dogs from the northern regions as well. Russ realized it was a pretty good deal and accepted, promising to deal with Mord before the old monster helped him. With him as reinforcements are 27 silver-blooded soldiers and all of them are mid-ranked warriors and above. Also, there are five divine bloodlines. Ceylon seemed to have really made up his mind this time. He asked the squad if they knew who he was. He introduced himself to them and said he was in charge of the mission. Russ's men are going after Mord. Meanwhile, the heroes were walking through the dungeon. Leon asked, Were the corpses of the prodigal monarch squad lying there? He thought that Mord would deal with the men of the Sage of Darkness first after he received information about him from Levin, so why did he start with the men of the monarch? The protagonist answered because they were closer to their next destination, and he needs to deal with the Sage of Darkness as well as the prodigal monarch, so there's no need to keep order. And besides, he has one more important thing to do. You think Mord was looking for a secret door? A cipher to puzzle over? The protagonist's methods are much simpler. Don't bother, break the floor, and don't think about the consequences. Leon realized that Mord was a fan of breaking floors to find something. He replied that many people like to hide things that way, or he was simply hiding his fetish for breaking tiles. Kale asked, where are they now? The protagonist replied that they were in the vault of the prodigal monarch. Leon noticed magical healing herbs, high-quality medicines that were created through alchemy, even expensive magical items that could be sold. Mord remembers that that box must lie somewhere in this place. Found it. The bloody box was lying on the table. Mord opened the mysterious box. There was something glowing in it. Is that the tear of a martial arts god? It's a trial by death, an opportunity that a martial artist can only use once and in a short period of time to gain the aura Mord was able to because of this tear. In the original, Aiden gives Leon the tear he found here, due to which the latter's abilities have grown exponentially. It's a secret medicine prepared from a recipe from the far eastern region. It's hard to obtain, Kale asked, wondering if Mord was going to drink it. Such a brutally talented man shouldn't take any chances. But the protagonist didn't listen to him and replied that he had already drunk it. Kyle was in shock. How and where did he do it? So that's why he was able to gain aura at 15 years old. Mord replied that it wouldn't work a second time on the same person anyway. So the protagonist suggested that Kale drink it to make him stronger, if he so desired. But the one realized that there was a risk of paying for such a prank with his life. Kale reflected. The day General Ildan had saved him, then he had not a dream, but a wish. He wanted to become a strong man like him. 
Kale trained day and night to achieve this, and was given the honor of guarding the general's favorite Mord. However, he was reminded of the limitations that hard work alone cannot overcome. Kale envied Mord, who unlike him was a brilliantly talented man. But there's nothing you can do about the spoon in your mouth that you were born with, just as there's nothing you can do about the fact that a minor character will never become a major character. All he could do was recognize that fact and just give up. But here's the thing. What if the way to overcome those limitations is right in front of him? Honestly, he wants to drink it right now and get stronger. But he's a soldier and is performing his duties out of loyalty to the general. Is it worth risking his life for a desire that has nothing to do with his duties? Duties? But does he do them well every time he... Kale was embarrassed to ask, but still. He asked Mord directly, is there any use or is he useless? They've been together for two months now, and in that time Kale has shown the ability to adapt to the changes he's faced. It also helped him a lot with his skills at hiding and communicating with spirits, which he doesn't have. Without Kale, the journey would have been difficult and problematic, and the progress they had now made would have been delayed. But here, the deciding factor to give him this vial was his sense of duty as a warrior, because he is willing to strive towards death for Ildan's sake. In other words, Kale is a comrade Mord can trust. The protagonist replied that there was certainly a benefit to doing so. He said that Kale was a lot of help. He wondered if he was starting to get a little attached to him. But next time Silverblood will send out stronger fighters, and so far it has only been henchmen of high-ranking leaders. But next time, they will come for the heroes themselves. So they should definitely get even stronger. Kale correctly assumed that next time stronger enemies would come after them and last time they fought the Silverbloods. Then he was almost useless. But if he didn't change now, he would be a liability next time. He accepted Mord's offer to drink a tear. Kale ventured to open the bottle, for what could be more wonderful than the feeling that you would not be useless to your comrade. Leon interrupted him and told him that he was making such a dangerous decision too easily. But it was too late. Kale drank a tear. He rose into the air from the saturation of power. He was transformed in front of his comrades. It was as if another person had taken up residence in his mind. Leon asked, so why would Mord put him at such risk? He doesn't know what important work he's doing. But if he's being hunted by dangerous people, that one can just run away and that one can go to his family, to General Ildan. Why all this sacrifice and persecution of targets? Mord replied that his family could not be his refuge. The reason the Silverbloods are after him is to fulfill the Archduke's wish. Leon was shocked that the Archduke was cooperating with a crazy secret squad to catch Mord. The protagonist replied that the Archduke has been collaborating with the Silver Bloods for a long time and doing terrible things. To stop aging, he feeds on the Werner's blood. Leon could not recognize this fact. He was shocked by what he had heard. The Archduke is a living legend, having accomplished numerous feats as a Vernar's warrior, and the people revere him as the patron saint of the duchy. But in reality, he turns out to be a dastardly villain who preserves his youth by sacrificing his own children. Leon didn't believe it, so Mord ordered him to leave. In the original, though he was despondent, he believed Aiden and devoted himself to him more than anyone. But when everything he sacrificed led to the destruction of the world, and he sank into true despair, Mord didn't want Leon to end up like that. But the man wasn't eloquent enough for him to make the right decision. The protagonist hopes to do it on his own, and risking his own life for someone he doesn't trust is very sad, isn't it? He asked Leon. He found Mord's look unpleasant, but it's still hard to believe that an archduke of such substance. But however, he remembered all of Mord's actions and words, and remembered the most important phrase that he wanted to save the world, not harm it. What does Mord expect him to do after saying such ridiculous words, and not even explaining what it all means? Why voice such ridiculous words? Is he comforting him, or why is he doing this? Leon replied that he didn't know the Archduke well, and he hadn't known the protagonist long, but if he had to choose who he trusted more, he would choose Mord. So he trusts the one who saved his life. Meanwhile, Kale was finishing transforming. Mord knew he could handle the onslaught of the bottle. Kyle had become more muscular and virile, and it was clear from the look in his eyes that he was ready to go all the way, no matter what. The mysterious half-skeletons were dialoguing amongst themselves. One of them is the head of the prodigal monarch organization, Derek. He didn't understand how one of the seven fragments was completely destroyed. Seventy years ago, he found the soul of an Archilich monarch and made a deal with him. Forty years later, he too became an Archilich with the help of the fragment map and the power gained from the deal, and founded the prodigal monarch organization. And by today, 
he had successfully expanded the organization. All he had to do was find the soul fragments and resurrect him. But in that case, his complete resurrection is impossible. The Arch Monarch's memories are broken into soul fragments, so he needs them all to get his memory back. So they who have only one fragment, it's hard to find the rest. What an ambush. What kind of scum killed all the Archilich soldiers in Lorraine? The soul fragment told him not to worry. Even if that one is not fully resurrected, he has a way to fix it, especially since he has a way to go beyond the past. Of course, the fewer fragments, the harder it will be to do it. But won't the second fragment soon fall into the hands of the Archilich? The one replied that he was correct. The email came yesterday that the second fragment would be found and the more fragments they found, the faster his memory would clear. And then they would find the rest of the fragments even faster. It's too early to despair. Suddenly, Derek realized something important. The vigor of the army guarding the soul fragment, gone. Is that so? The soul fragment replied that he had thought correctly. Another soul fragment was destroyed. Arkelich didn't understand how a boy like Mord could defeat him. The protagonist replied that he shouldn't be so upset. After all, that one came in second. The second fragment of the Archilic Monarch's soul had just been destroyed. His magical abilities are different from those in Lorraine, but his combat skills are identical. It was even somehow easy this time. He was able to win this time effortlessly without even using his dagger. It's not even two months since that battle in Lorraine. Mord has definitely grown stronger. But someone who could actually go through the process of improving their skills. Kale couldn't understand how Mord was able to finish him off faster than he and Leon together. Leon thought that Kale had become incredibly strong after drinking the tear. Even though he couldn't get an aura yet, but his magical abilities had increased, and he was more capable. Arkelich had summoned the higher powers of the dead beforehand. He was able to summon four death knights, the top of the dead. While Mord fought the Arkelich, they fought the four death knights. But it was Kale who made the significant contribution. Kale said to Leon that if he fought with his bare hands, they would be faster than Mord's. And how would he fight with his sword, which he didn't even know how to use? To which the latter was indignant and replied that he was not in his way. Others won't understand it, but he has a good reason to fight it. The sword means to him freedom from his dark past. It is an expression of his desire to live free. The heroes found four relics. Mord destroyed the golden throne and found the tenth fragment, but it does not match the rest. But it is not terrible, because he did not expect it, but really hoped to find a useful item. Half of them are slags. The book on the table is a grim moir of dark magic that allows you to make a deal with a powerful entity from the demon realm, but he doesn't need it. The marble bones are also unnecessary. As for the silver bracelet, there was no information about it in the original, so he decided to take it to study it. Mord threw a white bottle to Kyle and told him to take a drink, but before he did he asked, What is this bottle? It was nectar. Apparently the Archmonarch had prepared it for his resurrection. According to legend, nectar is the name of a drink that could only be consumed by the gods of the highest level. It is prepared from the core of the world tree. If a man drinks it, he can get the power of a god. Kale was shocked, for this was the nectar that the legend said. Leon asked Mord, why doesn't he drink it himself? Had he already drunk it? Mord denies it, then why does he give it to Kale? The protagonist replied that if he drank it, he would lose more than gain. Leon didn't know what he was talking about, but Mord told him to just accept it as fact. But actually, he thought to drink this nectar. But at the moment when he held it in his hands, the inner voice of the protagonist said that for him it was poison. If he had the divine blood of the Verners, he could drink it. But if Kale drinks it, he will become even stronger. Normally, only divine blood possessors can absorb the power of a peace fragment, though this doesn't only apply to divine blood possessors. Of course, Mord has no desire to share the world fragment, but there is something he is worried about. In the new world were all those Aiden loved, all of them oblivious to the shattered old world that allowed them to live happily ever after. The new world was like a garden that had been created for Aiden. They were the only ones who were real in this world, and the rest were fake copies of the people the hero had created. Aiden hadn't dreamed of this from the beginning. The new world Aiden's enemies wanted to create was a world that would fulfill their fantasies. Aiden rejected this false world, but the more fragments he collected, the more he was drawn to this world. And in the end, he created a horrible world that was more selfish and monstrous than his enemies wanted to create. If receiving all the fragments of the world will make it impossible to resist the temptation of the new world, then it would probably be wise to have a trusted comrade to share fragments with. After leaving Palos, they did two things in 20 days. One, they destroyed the base of the prodigal monarch, and two, 
they found a soul fragment and destroyed it. And now the heroes are heading to the Sage of Darkness underground, according to Levan's information. Leon didn't like that Levan attacked the prodigal monarch knowing it would be dangerous for him. But they were finally attacking the men of the Sage of Darkness. Kale didn't understand why the sky was so ominous. He saw a vortex portal in the sky. Kale told the heroes to pay attention to it. Leon said it was demonization on a large scale. In that case, there must be top-level soldiers. This first demonification that Kessner's unit encountered was a vortex about 500 meters in diameter. But this demonization has consumed half of the city. It's incomparably more dangerous than all the previous ones. Leon asked Mord if there was an underground of the Sage of Darkness people. He replied that it was indeed so, and they were most likely swallowed up in the vortex. Leon then suggested waiting for the soldiers to deal with the demonification. But Mord replied that they were moving toward the disaster right now, for there was a man there to whom he owed a debt. He felt one change since his senses had reached the dimension. The protagonist activated the eye of the seventh sense. If man has six senses, the seventh is the sense of God, and only those who have the power of the heavens can see the true essence of this world through the seventh sense skill. And this seventh sense says that there's Erna Vernars. The affair took place in a broken camp, which was shielded from sudden attack. She stood and looked at her subordinate with a stern look. Erna said that they could not break in so suddenly at the moment. Her subordinate replied that if they didn't, he would. He begged her to save Mr. Biden, for he had stayed there to save them. She replied that they couldn't. They needed to wait for the emergency squad to arrive. Erna sensed something. Is it really divine blood? The people from the squad weren't thrilled when they heard that someone needed to meet with Mrs. Erna. Leon was told to take off his helmet, otherwise they won't let him in because they can't confirm his identity. He had already told them that he couldn't take it off because of the terrible scar on his face. Kale and Mord stood there, realizing he was too stubborn. The protagonist wouldn't have brought him along if he'd known he'd be so annoying, although he understands his feelings. Because Erna is very important to him, and he wants to see her. But he is ashamed to meet her because he has left his family. Then in that case, they have to resort to extreme measures. Mord has awakened his divine blood. The guards didn't understand what he was doing. Was he going to fight them? Kyle didn't understand what he was doing. He was crazy if he was going to fight with the soldiers of the Vernars Duchy. But he denied that he didn't want to fight them. He thought it would be quicker and easier to call Erna here than to wait for the guards to let them in. Kale didn't understand who he wanted to call, did he? Before he could say a word, Erna came running toward them. She had previously felt that she had met this divine blood somewhere. Kale stood stunned with shock. Erna recognized Mord. Mord knelt down, greeting his mistress. She was just as happy to see him. Erna ordered the guards to escort them to her tent. They are very important guests. But the guards poked at Leon and said that he doesn't want to reveal his identity, and he's a very suspicious type, that since he won't take off his helmet. It was as if she sensed a kindred spirit standing before her. Erna replied that everything was normal and to let him pass. They walked to Erna's tent. She asked Mord. Wasn't he heading north and what was his reason for being here? Mord replied that he was on a secret mission under orders from General Ildan and was here to take care of something, and had heard she was here and decided to meet. The guard was furious, because how could he address Erna as you? Erna said that if they were on a secret mission, they should be more discreet and asked why he had come to meet her in a place where there were too many eyes. The protagonist replied that he had come to pay her back. He was saved by the tear of the martial arts god she gave him. He also said that besides drinking, he was able to master the aura. Erna was shocked, because there was no way someone could master it at the age of 15. Even Mrs. Erna, who was known as a genius from her early childhood and received the best education, had not managed to master the aura at the age of 15. But he had succeeded. The guard was shocked. Erna had never imagined that he was so talented. It had only been three months since he left. A lot had changed in that time. She looked at Mord's companions and was glad that he was able to get some company. Kyle introduced himself to her as a top-level warrior under the command of General Ildan. Erna was pleased to meet him. Leon introduced himself as a mercenary named Faden, but it wasn't to be. She figured him out and asked him what he was doing now, since they hadn't seen each other for a long time. Leon was ashamed. Even through his helmet you could see his aura of shame. He asked Mord if he knew who Leon was, and Mord replied that he did. Erna asked if he behaved like that all the time, to which the protagonist replied that he did not often. Erna thought that he didn't want to reveal his identity in front of the guards. He still didn't understand how she recognized him. She replied that they were very close and it would be strange if she didn't recognize him. 
She knew he'd been wandering the continent as a mercenary and was glad to hear he was okay. But she hadn't expected him to be with Mord, though she was glad to see him anyway. Erna is a sweet girl that was like a sister to Leon, but at the same time made him remember his dark past. He was jealous of her and kept his distance, but she always kept an eye on his well-being. Mixed feelings, but Leon was sure of one thing. He was genuinely happy to see Erna. He replied that she had grown a lot since the last time they had met. She smiled and said it had been five years and didn't ask if the man had forgotten she was in her twenties. Mord asked her, how did she know it was him just from the divine blood alone? Could she recognize Vernars this way? Erna replied that it only applied to those she knew and asked a counter question. Could he also only recognize only those Vernars knew? Mord replied that he was aware of this feeling and said that he could also only recognize those he personally knew. Erna was shocked after all, she had only learned it two years ago, and he could already do it after only a year of divine blood awakening. Recognizing divine blood and even the aura, she clearly underestimated him. Now that they met again, then Erna would like to talk without rushing what happened, but unfortunately the situation does not allow to talk without rushing. Erna asked Mord if he knew that demonization was happening now, and if it reached the third level, then the whole city would become a place where there wouldn't be a single soul. And if there is a rift in the dungeon, it will be an event worthy of mentioning in history. They were sent with Biden to prevent this from happening. Biden was the first to arrive and said he would conduct a sweep of the area where the enemies were clustered. The result was a disaster. Half of his squad had died before they got here, and he was the only one who had escaped to tell them. The main problem was this. Biden has stayed there, and he is most likely trapped. Ern has been sent an emergency squad, but they will only be here in three days and they would like to rescue the people who are trapped, but they have nothing to do but wait for the squad. The core of the dungeon. There must be top-level demons among them, and it's possible that the Count of the Demon Realm is also there. Besides, the Count has an army led by other top-level demons, and her squad alone won't be able to handle it. However, if Mord's squad will help them, then it's worth the risk to help those who are trapped. Mord thought about the fact that Biden didn't show up in the original, most likely because he would die here, and he wouldn't help just because Biden would die here. There's something the main character cares about, Erna asked in a more forceful way. Would they help her? Mord reflected that Erna didn't appear in the original either, and if the reason is that she died before Aiden's story began, then there's no guarantee she won't die here. This is a good opportunity to prevent Erna's death and see how good she is as the Archduchess. And if he has more achievements thanks to defeating higher level demons, it will help Mord very much to reach the second stage of Divine Blood Awakening. She reminded him that their goal was to save people and then retreat. Erna's squad has 15 men plus their three, making a total of 18. Her squad has two with Divine Blood, including Erna herself. That's four in total, so it's a manageable task. No, three. Leon doesn't use divine blood to keep his identity secret. They were attacked by monsters, from the front, no, from all sides. They need to open a path in the direction where Biden is, but Erna doesn't sense his presence. Apparently, he is somewhere far away. Mord seems to know where he is. She asked if he was sure, to which Mord said he was sure. Then it was time to awaken the divine blood. All three of them, including Leon, woke her up. They're on the case. Biden didn't want to admit it, but the man was too eager. He blamed himself for it. He also apologized to his partners for screwing up. His allies will have to die because of him, but they weren't going to give up. They asked him to leave his boring jokes for later because they made it hard to concentrate in battle. They encouraged him and told him that there was still hope for survival. For demons, human blood and flesh of unusual blood is a delicacy. Divine blood is a special delicacy. The demon replied that Biden would be served at the Count's table, and by then he had promised to try what he tasted like too. In front of them is a top-ranked demon, the commander of the army that is currently attacking. The situation is getting more and more complicated. The fighter left Biden for Sir Botan, and he himself promised to clear the way. Botan wanted to stop Uls, but he asked Biden to remember how he was a boy when he was once cursed and became a lycanthrope, and the villagers almost burned him as a ten-year-old child at the stake because of it. If he hadn't saved him that day, he wouldn't be with them now. Biden snatched the kid at the last moment from the bonfire. So he's going to pay him back for once saving his life. So he asked for a promise that he would not give up. The demon licked his lips when he heard that the guy was a lycanthrope, and that he was very lucky because he would be able to eat him on the spot. Uls threw himself at the demons! He ripped part of the skin off one of them, clawing at his body. Uls devours his enemy to regain his magical powers. The demon mage was already preparing a spell against the lycanthrope, 
Ols continued to furiously attack his opponents. He swiftly rushed to the attack. The kid was able to take out a mob of demons all by himself. The demon was flattered that he was so strong and asked him if he had any regrets after his actions. After which he attacked Ols with a punishment beam. The beam has seriously injured the lycanthrope. But the guy wasn't gonna give up! He attacked the demon boss! The demon seriously wounded Ols with his spear. Ols was on the verge of death from such a blow. Biden wanted to help him, but Botten stopped him. Biden wanted to help the kid, because he was going to be killed by a high-ranking demon, and it was better to keep his honor and die in battle together. The demon laughed and replied not to worry so much, for he would soon return it to them. Suddenly, the demon was attacked with a hail of powerful momentum strikes. He didn't expect this attack, and also didn't know who was attacking him. No sooner had he recovered from the last attack than another flash of momentum flew towards the demon. It was a mirage destruction spell. Biden and Botan hadn't expected such a powerful spell from someone. Botan yelled for Biden to step back while the others dealt with the demon. He picked up his wounded commander in his arms and jumped aside. Botan didn't expect the pulse ball to rain. Who could that be? They hid behind a rock, waiting for the fight to end. It was Mord. He swiftly pounced on the enemy, shattering the stone surface beneath him. Demon Juga flew aside from the main character's strongest punch. He flew towards Mord to attack him. But no such luck. The protagonist simply stops the insolent opponent with only one hand. The demon was in complete shock at the strength of his opponent. Mord charged in with a final attack and hits his foe with it. It was a total mind blower. Literally, Mord left his opponent headless. Botan and Biden hadn't expected such power. It was telekinesis that only martial arts masters could use. Unexpected! Ols attacked Mord. But the man simply stopped him with one hand. Biden yelled back that he didn't know who he was, but said that Ols was their ally, and he couldn't tell who was who, because of his condition he was in now, and he didn't want to attack him. Mord replied that he knew, and it wasn't the first time he'd seen him. The protagonist addressed the lycanthrope by name. He said the one in battle was much better than he could have imagined. Mord punches Ols right under the breath. He fell to the ground from the hardest blow. Biden and Botten were shocked. Had he ever met Ols before? Had Biden ever met someone with such strong blood before? Both of them recognized Mord. They asked the protagonist for sure if they were mistaken. He replied that no, they were not. Biden replied that he could see that they were different, and therefore they were not alike. If he's a Mord, he's a bastard child who caused a stir in the Archduchy, Botan replied. They didn't know how he'd ended up in this place. Mord replied that he was passing by and had heard about the situation here. The protagonist threw a healing potion to Biden to get Ulz drunk. The protagonist asked Biden why he went underground first. He knew it was a rash move. Was it because of the competition between the heirs? Thoth confirmed his words, but wanted to be more specific about it. He did it for Erna. Right now, the person closest to becoming Archduke is the eldest son of the current Archduke and Biden's older brother Alan. The third contender is Dran, and the fourth is Huron. They entered the race early to replace Archduke and have made some accomplishments. Because Biden was younger and late in the race, he had a hard time catching up. He had no thoughts of giving up, because he believed that if he recognized the difference and worked hard to catch up, he would have a chance. However, Erna took that chance away from him. From her childhood, she stood out strongly and was called a genius, even though she entered in this race two years later than he did. She still caught up with him in no time. Therefore, Biden volunteered to go on missions that were very risky, but would give him the opportunity for achievements. This strategy was initially successful, and with a few achievements, he was able to increase the gap between him and Erna. But he made a mistake. While on a mission on the northern border of the White Kingdom, he suffered great damage due to the interference of the Ortis family. The failure of the mission was a huge blow in itself, but the fact that they were defeated by a sworn enemy, it greatly diminished their reputation. Due to impatience, Biden ended up going on the mission with Erna because he was worried that she would bridge the gap between him, which he in turn widened. This mission was to be his accomplishment. He had come here to clear the way, planning to take it step by step, but most importantly not to overdo it in turn. Because of this greed, he deemed his absurd actions rational, and it eventually led to the deaths of many innocent subordinates. He should have waited. As patient as he was, Mord replied. He figured Erna hadn't appeared in the original, so he didn't know she'd displace Leon and Biden to such an extent. He knew she was the strongest in magic, but still, that must not be all. Biden wondered why Mord had come to help him, to which he replied that Erna had asked him to. He was shocked to hear that. The protagonist also noticed that while he was saving him, 
Her squad was supposed to be a decoy and draw the enemy's attention to themselves. Mord sensed they were getting quite close. The protagonist didn't think it would come so quickly. Erna replied that at first they were attacked by a huge army of monsters, but at some point the attack gradually became weaker, and she thinks they were opened up to lure them deeper inside. Erna was glad that Biden was alive and that he should be grateful to Mord, because if it wasn't for him, he would be dead already. He asked, why did she do that? Why did she order Mord to save him? She didn't get it. What do you mean why? Biden said he'd been told she'd asked Mord to help him. Why is she doing this? After all, they are rivals in the first place. Wouldn't it be better if her rival disappeared from her path forever? She's savvy that they weren't blood-bound strangers. But she also savvy that she didn't need a reason to save someone's life. And besides, saving him wouldn't hurt her in any way. She explicitly stated that she would take the Archduke's place anyway. Biden thanked Erna for saving him and also for keeping Botan and Uls alive, and he promised to pay her back that debt. Erna thought he would say, as usual, that he wouldn't give up and blushed. But she hadn't expected such a red speech from him. Erna was very surprised that Biden said thank you to her. Leon Vogeloshed in thought and apologized for that. Biden wanted to ask him why he wears his helmet while calling him by his first name. When everyone heard Leon's name, they were shocked. Everyone shouted amongst themselves that he was using a two-handed sword in that strange helmet, and didn't understand why the descendants of Vernars would do such a thing? It can't be. Mr. Biden was lying to them. His voice sounded very familiar to them now. Leon took off his helmet and was shocked to be recognized even with his helmet on. Biden was shocked for he did not know that he was trying to hide his identity in this way. Biden was shocked because he did not know that Biden had tried to hide his identity in this way. He asked Biden how he recognized him. In response, he said he was wearing a bracelet on his arm, and that's how he recognized him. Leon thought it was a joke, but it turned out not to be. It was a coming-of-age present from his mother. He was shocked that Biden remembered his accessory. The man responded by saying, how could he forget it since he wore the bracelet all the time? Erna was shocked, for she had not noticed that he wore it all the time. Mord thought she must not have known about it. Mord offered to discuss all of this later, and he feels like they can move around quietly so they better get out of the area first. In response, Biden agreed to his suggestion. Suddenly, the lava whirlwind attacks attacked the heroes. In one of the swirls, someone's silhouette showed up. The mysterious voice from there said that those made a mess of the place and were about to leave without even apologizing to the owner of the place and called the heroes impolite guests. Erna realized that this wasn't just a way to open a path and get them in deeper. It was a trap. The mysterious voice confirmed her hunch and replied that it would be a shame to send the precious guests home without giving them a proper treat. He was preparing dinner for them, but it was over sooner than he thought, and so they were able to meet. It was the demon count, Rotice. He promised to consume their precious blood and flesh. Erna was shocked at the number of monsters. There were over 2,000 of them and several dozen demons. There were even lord-level demons among them. There was some man watching from above. Erna asked Mord if she seemed powerful to him. She seems to be of the Viscount's level and doesn't know what she's waiting for up there but she must be playing some significant role. Mord replied that the monsters were advancing from all sides and suggested they consider a plan of action. Erna responded by asking, which side did he think would be best to break through? The protagonist replied that among the north, south, east, and west are the strongest enemy. On the other hand, the west is noticeably weaker, but the intention to attack the west seems so obvious that it's probably a trap. Therefore, the heroes activated their divine blood Erna and Mord stood at full alert. They had decided to break through to the south. The heroes went on the attack against the enemy. They decided to break through the south. One of the demons is a baronet type of warrior, and the other one's a wizard type baron. Mord replied that he would take the baron and leave the baronet for Erna. She agreed to this arrangement. The baronet grinned and told Erna that it was foolish to deal with him alone. He attacked her with his huge sword. Her allies didn't want to be left out and joined the fight. Everyone had an opponent, and no one was left out. The baronet praised Erna, however. He didn't think she could last long in a fight with him. It was a serious battle between them. But suddenly Erna interrupted him and said that those were all his words before his death. Or did he want to add something else? She struck the baronet with a windy rip. He was squirming in pain. Erna lifted her opponent into the air with a powerful fist strike. But he also had a trump card up his sleeve. He hit her with a frenzy of excitement but it didn't get her. She swiftly rushed at the baronet to finish him off with her left crown and then her right funeral. 
Erna gathered all her power into one punch to finally finish her opponent. She hit it with an acidic destruction. That blow was unrealistically powerful. She was just as strong as Mord. Erna had even learned his trick of breaking and smashing without thinking or hesitation. Erna looked at Mord with a satisfied look. Leon was surprised at how that one had grown so much in that time. It was strong. But why did the thought that this monster was as monstrous as it had been in the past kept him so worried? Meanwhile, Mord was not lagging behind either and struck his opponent with a mighty pulse. Everyone was shocked by the monstrous strength of the protagonist. He punched the Baron through and through with his punch. Mord rushed at his opponent, giving him no chance to recover and to be killed instantly. He looked down at his enemy from the cliff with a menacing stare. Mord couldn't believe that the Baron and Baronet had been defeated so easily. It looked like they had a good chance of winning. Mord and Erna's remaining allies couldn't just rely on them, so they decided to finish off the rest of the undead as well. They rushed into battle against the horde of monsters, but suddenly, they were stopped by enemy barons. They burst in during the fight from different directions. The demon maiden had no idea the heroes would break through so quickly. Must be the younger Vernar's children, they are incredibly strong even if you forget that fact. She suggested that it would be better for them if it ended this way for them. Usually demons who act as cores, remotely supply energy to their subordinates. But if you put consciousness and power into the body of a Viscount demon and raise it to a level comparable to that of a Count, can we say that demons can also progress? The Countess replied that if they obediently obeyed, she would give them a painless death and gave them a choice. Would they refuse the offer or would they humbly accept it? Mord suggested to Erna that they should put this Count together and that it was the only way they had. She asked what about the rest of the comrades, to which the protagonist replied that they should trust them. Erna turned command over to Biden while she fights alongside Mord against the demon Count. Biden asked if it would be okay if the two of them went after the Count. She replied that if she didn't, then they would all die. In her mind she thought that with that level of magical power she wouldn't be able to handle the Count, but Erna replied that they should definitely try and give it their best. The power must be increased to the maximum. She approached the Countess from a loaded punch. Erna used the windbreak against him. The Countess smirked caustically, saying that did she really think such a little trick would work on him? Erna expected her not to even flinch. Meanwhile, she was attacked from behind by Mord with his pulse fist strike. The Countess flew off to the side at the speed of light. She was lying on the ground and was seriously injured. The heroes rushed together to finish her off for sure. The Countess is using a flash spell of annihilation. That dangerous ray hit Erna. She fell to the ground. Erna was hurt by that attack after all. Mord handed her a potion and said she would be fine after it. But she replied that it would be difficult for him to fight the Count alone. So the protagonist needed to last about 30 seconds. Mord replied that she shouldn't worry about him. Because he planned to show his secret skills in practice. Now, since he's going to use them, he'll finish the job with his own hands. The main character took all the initiative. The Countess thought he must have a very useful artifact or blessing. This was the first pain she had felt in a long time, therefore Mord must not think he would die without pain. She was using the battle dance spell of Flaming Swordsman. Mord ordered Erna to stay back and to stay out of the fight. The main character swiftly rushed towards the Count. Mord gets into a defensive guard. The Count crossed two blades blazing with momentum. He promised to finish off the protagonist as soon as possible. But the Count was in for a surprise. He was attacked by an air fist. He flew away at the speed of light! He didn't see that one coming! This was the second blessing received from the God of Duels, the Light Divine Body. Mord has gone into God Mode. The Count didn't understand how he was able to use Vernar's power. Mord replied that he was able to use his power because he was a descendant of the God of Duels. Erna didn't expect such a gimmick from Mord, that he was using a Light Divine Body. She had seen it in the myth of Vernar's and thought the story was just embellished. She couldn't believe that this power actually existed. Before the end of the Legendary Era, there were many races of gigantic size, and to solve the problem of the overwhelming size difference, the god of duels who lived in that era, created the power of a light body, a giant made of light, which is made up of the power of divine blood. Meanwhile, Mord has attacked with a series of light body kicks. The protagonist had the feeling that it was as if he was in a robot and was controlling it. And in addition, with the blessing of the light body, the person easily exceeded his original weight by 30 times, However, this technology has a disadvantage. It is complicated and consumes a lot of magical power. The Count is sealed into the wall from such a powerful blow. But he's not going to give up that easily. He'll use his last strength to finish Mord. 
Mord has no intention of giving up like that, though, and fights back with strikes from Earl. The Count pierces the head of the protagonist's light body with his sword. He thought that the light body didn't change things that much, and as he thought that, since he wasn't a dual god. Mord's mana storage bracelet, which he found in the remains of a great magician. The protagonist decides to test it in action. He says that if the light body takes damage, it will only consume mana, and he will not be harmed as a result. Therefore, even a severed arm or pierced neck can be repaired in an instant by simply using mana. He grabbed the Count with his light hand, the protagonist suggested. To put an end to this battle, he wipes the Count off the face of the earth in an instant with his fierce god-given power. After the fight was over, the heroes headed deep into the dungeon. But at that moment, Rothace used up all his magic power because of the fact that he possessed the Viscount's body. And thanks to this, having coped with him without difficulty, they returned to the village. The Werner's squad has succeeded in stopping the Demon Kingdom. The people have heard that celebrations will be held in honor of this event. A slight delay would result in the death of the heroes, but someone heard that there was a man who single-handedly slew the Demon Count in the dungeon. Mord hoped it would be entirely Ernie's credit and that she would report that he had been moderately helpful. She was surprised at his words. Would he really want to do that? Mord replied that he was on a secret mission at the moment, and there was no use in reporting it to his superiors. And there was one more thing Mord realized. Thanks to this incident, he was able to fully see her skills. She had more than 50% more magical power than him. Having that level of talent, you can catch up with other successors within a few years, so... Mord reached out to Erna, promising that he would make her an Archduchess. But to do so, it is important to increase the quality of her accomplishments. The protagonist replied that if she was uncomfortable, then let her think of it as paying off a debt, because he still owed something. Erna agreed that if there was a debt, it should be repaid. Morta was worried. Whose side would she be on if she found out that he wanted to kill the Archduke? Who would believe that an Archduke, a national hero, had such a secret? Mord replied that if Erna really thought so, will she trust him in the future? She didn't understand what it meant. To which the protagonist replied that when the time came, she would understand everything. He asked that no matter how difficult it would be to do, could she support his choice? Erna responded by agreeing to Mord's proposal. He asked again to be sure it would be all right. She replied that she might naturally regret that decision. But when Rothace appeared, then she realized that even if reinforcements arrived and they entered the dungeon together, they would still be destroyed if Mord wasn't around. So she replied that he was the benefactor who had saved her life and she could not refuse the favor for fear that she might regret her choice in the future. So he shouldn't worry. It wasn't a decision she made lightly. Her mother had taught her thoroughly from a young age. Only those who know the weight of promises can be truly trusted. Mord thanked her for making a serious decision. A man who can smile like that too. Mord also added that she should be sworn to secrecy about what she was going to say next. Not even to her family or her most trusted person would she reveal it. In addition, he added that this secret was worth it. He asked if she had seen him use the techniques of a dueling god. The reason why this was possible was because he had met the god and learned directly from him. And he promised to tell her exactly how he met him. Mord felt bad for sending Biden to the savior and that he had a pretty bad injury. But naturally, as a descendant of the god of duels, he recovers quickly. Biden replied that if it had been an ordinary man, it wouldn't have ended this way. He was really grateful for this deed, because if not for Mord, he would have buried his bones there, so he prepared something in return. But he wasn't sure if the main character would like his gift. Mord asked, what is it? He handed him his stone of divine blood. This is the first time Mord has ever heard of it. Such a thing was never mentioned in The Magician Who Rules the World. Biden guessed that he didn't know and assumed that Mord had recently joined the family. He explained to the protagonist that it is the essence of divine blood that official descendants create after shedding their own blood. It's a rite that only official descendants can use, and it's given through a blessing at the Archduke's temple. Usually the stone is given to their children. He too had created it as one of the things he would pass on to his children, but he couldn't think of what to give to the man who saved his life. Mord asked what was the point of the stone. Biden said to calmly try to get into resonance with the power of his own blood later. It's a kind of catalyst that raises the power of blood to a higher level only once in a lifetime. Biden had another question. Does Mord intend to support Erna in the future? He confirmed his speculation and said he was thinking of making her an archduchess. Biden replied that if he backed her, 
Erna would be an even tougher opponent than she is now. However, looking at Mord, he's even more reluctant to give up. Mord was surprised at his words, because Biden saw that no matter how good Mord was at something, there would always be someone who would surpass him. No matter how talented Erna is, she's not the best in the world, is she? He asked the protagonist. That's why it's worth it. Mord praised him, calling him optimistic about life, and said they would see each other later. Biden replied that they will definitely meet, and that one will surprise him when he returns to the family. Biden looked at Mord with a pleased look. Brother Dron doesn't realize Mord's true worth. The protagonist wonders what Brother Allen will say when he sees this guy. They rested for 24 hours at the Vernar's military camp. Erna replenished the hero's military supplies with various consumables, such as healing potions used in the dungeon, and also, without sparing, loaded them with other useful resources. The heroes were also able to evaluate the silver bracelet obtained by destroying the second fragment of Lord Akrik's soul, and discovered that it increases the speed of thinking and agility for a certain period of time. Kale Hu was in high spirits after receiving this bracelet walked around Darren, who was soaked in the festive atmosphere, running various errands. While Leon had dinner with Erna and recounted the events that had passed before his return, and late that night he found Mord and made a request of him. He wanted the one to lead him as Chief Vernars. He had felt right up to this moment, while he was following him, that his path was worth following at the risk of his own life. And to walk this path together, you need to get rid of your useless obsession. Mord replied that in other words he meant, that he wants to put his sword aside. Leon replied that he really wanted to postpone the use of his sword. Mord realized that Leon's gaze had changed and that he had already made a final decision. He had been waiting for those words from him. Mord replied that since he had decided so, he had to deal with it first. Leon asked, what is it? The protagonist replied that he would soon realize what it was. The god of battle saw Erna and was surprised that people like her were the direct heirs of the current Archduke Vernars. He also took on coaching Leon. The god of battles laughed and said that he had been expecting that. Then, in that case, did he suggest they check to see how thick his own blood was? Erna and Leon stood side by side and waited for the long-awaited fight along with the god of battles. Well, friends, I don't know about you, but I liked this manhua. The plot itself is quite interesting and intriguing. So if you liked the video, then subscribe to the channel and write a comment about what you liked. If new chapters of this title are released, I will definitely make a continuation. All the best. See you soon.